Okay, Chair, you're now live. Thank you. Thank you and good morning everyone, members, officers and any members of the public who are viewing this live stream of this meeting of the South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Pippa Halings and I'd like to welcome you. But before the meeting, um, I would just like to open with a short period of reflection following the sad news that His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh died on Friday. And we'll have that moment's silence for reflection now. And I will let you know when the minute is complete and then we'll introduce everybody and start the agenda. Thank you, everyone. We also have other news just before we go into the meeting proper, and that is that Councillor John Batchelor has resigned as chair of this planning committee and as a member, full member of the planning committee. The good news is this is so he can take up his new responsibility as the lead cabinet member for housing, and we know that that will be in very safe hands with him. But as his vice chair, since May 2018, I really want to thank him for the calm, assured, informed and professional way that he has chaired this committee and especially during the last 12 months, challenge for everyone to take up the technological challenges of that and John really did do that um, and made sure that this was a very fair hearing um, for all given the new technological challenge. And I also want as Vice Chair to acknowledge just how supportive um, and wise advice he gave to me ever since taking up the vice chair role. Um, and I've really, really appreciated that. And it's enabled me to um, be in the position I am, which is, as you'll soon find out, taking the interim chair of this planning committee. Um, and I'm sure that committee members may want to join me in thanking him, acknowledging everything he's given. If anybody would like to say anything now, then we, you know, we can do that before starting the meeting. I have Councillor Anna Bradnam. Thank you, uh, Councillor Halings. Um, I just wanted to say that, as you have said, I thought John did a brilliant job of actually picking up on the technology when we all had to in March mm -hmm. and handling the planning committee with the same aplomb and correctitude that he did when we were in face to face meetings. Uh, and I think that was a, a great credit to him. Uh, and I think he handled the committee at a time when it's been going through considerable um, challenge. And I think he's done it extremely well. And I thank him for that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Um, just to, to echo that we um, wish him every success going forward in his new role. Um, and that uh, he has been chairman of the planning committee in a very difficult time um, and that uh, his his nickname for me was uh, affectionately trouble and that I will continue being trouble for you Councillor Halings as well in true traditional form. I'm sure Henry had the same treatment as well being referred to trouble on more than one occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and um, Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Halings. Um, just to add my thanks um, officially to uh, Councillor Bachelor 
for the uh, great work he did with the uh, with the planning committee to date. And um, I look forward to his participation in the new role in the cabinet. Thank you. Good, thank you. Do I have anybody else? Yeah. Good. Um, so, as I said a moment ago, my name is Councillor Pippa Halings and I'm Vice Chair of the Planning Committee. And until full council appoints a new Planning Committee Chair, which is in two days time, I'll be chairing this committee um, in the capacity of Vice Chair in the chair. I've asked Councillor Henry Batchelor to be Vice Chair for this meeting again until final council confirms his appointment and I would love him to be the vice chair of this committee so that will be put forward to full council. Are members happy to um, confirm that Councillor Henry Batchelor is vice chair to do that by affirmation? Agreed. 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 Against that? No, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, in that case, Councillor Henry Batchelor, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Chairman, and good morning everybody, Councillor Henry Batchelor, and happy to be Vice Chair of this committee. Lovely, thank you. So um, if everybody could turn off their videos, please, just now all members and all guests. <clears throat> and we're supported along the virtual top table, and I ask each of you please to switch on your camera as you introduce yourselves by the following officers. Um, Chris Carter, who is the Delivery Manager of Strategic Sites. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Thank you. Stephen Reid, who is our senior planning lawyer. Good morning, Chair. Morning, members. Morning, yes, members. I hope we don't have to count on you too much in this meeting, Stephen. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Ian Senior from Democratic Services, who does the very, very important task of making sure we have the minutes today. Thank you, Ian. Nice to meet you. And we do have other case officers with us and um, we'll work through the agenda. I'll introduce them as we work through the agenda. Thank you very much, Ian. So just a few housekeeping announcements, everybody. Please make sure, given these technological <laughs> advancements, that your device is fully charged. Switch your cameras and microphones off unless you're invited to do otherwise. And when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. I think everybody knows that the phrase of the last um, year has been you're on mute. So please make sure that your microphone is switched on when you're addressing the meeting. And if you speak slowly and clearly, and please don't talk over or interrupt anyone, and that's especially for those who are viewing this meeting so that they can clearly hear everybody's contributions. Um, and then please ensure that you've switched off or silenced any of the devices so that they don't interrupt proceedings. Um, we do a recorded vote and we're going to continue with that tradition. Um, and so I would like to um, propose that we record each of our votes for each of the agenda items. Would anybody second that proposal? I'll second it, Chairman, if you want. Thank you very much, Councillor Deborah Roberts. Um, can we take that by affirmation? Agreed. 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 Good, thank you. So when we move to vote on any item, um, I will ask if there isn't a clear affirmation, then I'll ask for a roll call to be taken. So each committee member to speak into the microphone so that their vote is very clearly heard both to committee and to anybody watching the webcast. And members should please respond for, against or abstain when their name is called. And I'd just like to remind, as I did when I last chaired, this isn't um, a moment for another um, reference to your opinion on that item. It's just for, against or abstain. Um, committee members, uh, I'd like to now ask each of you to introduce yourselves. After I call your name, can you please turn your camera on and your microphone, say your name and the ward you represent so your presence may be noted and then turn your camera off when you've finished. So I'm Councillor Pippa Halings and I represent Histon, Impington and Orchard Park. Um, we have Councillor Henry Batchelor. Morning Chairman, Councillor Henry Batchelor, one of the members for the Linton Ward and also Vice Chair of the Um, 
Hello, um, I'm Councillor Martin Khan. I represent Houston Impington and Orchard Park Board. Thank you very much. Councillor Peter Fane. Martin, if you turn your... Yeah, thank you. Councillor Peter Fane. Peter Fane, Shelford Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Toomey Hawkins, representing Cordy Court Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Judith Ripeth. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councillor Judith Ripeth and I am one of the members for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Good morning, everybody. I'm Deborah Roberts and I'm the District Councillor for the Foxton Ward. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Heather Williams and I represent the Mordens Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Richard Williams. I represent the Whittlesford Ward. And Councillor Nick Wright, who'd like to be present in, when well, everybody's presenting. <laughs> Councillor Nick Wright. Uh, good morning, uh, Councillor. Uh, Nick Wright representing Caxton and Patworth. And we're there, I think. Thank you very much. As I can confirm, we're all here. The meeting is quiet, yes. Are there any other councillors present, please? No. Thank you. I'm um, going on a little bit with the housekeeping. And so if at any time um, a member leaves the meeting and that could be because of, of a glitch or any reason that they need to leave the meeting, please make that fact known to me as chair so it can be recorded in the minutes. So members of the public are aware if a councillor is absent for any part of the presentation or debate about an agenda item, they may not vote on the item. However, if a member is having technical problems and lets either me or the vice chair or democratic services know immediately, I will adjourn the meeting for a short while so that an attempt can be made to get the member back into the meeting without missing anything material and they can vote if they want to and we make all of that publicly um, known. We have several public speakers today and I just want to confirm how public speaking works. This meeting has been broadcast via the Council's website and public speakers are reminded that by participating in the meeting you're consenting to being broadcast and that the use of images and sound recordings for webcast and training purposes um, they may be used. You will have three minutes to address the committee either individually or together with one um, with one another. I would like to highlight that using um, that three minutes of public speaking we do expect all public speakers to address the application um, and not any individuals, but the application itself and the merits or not of that application. There is a protocol for public speaking um, and I hope we, we don't have to recall or remind anybody about that. When you start speaking, we'll start the timer. So please ensure you switch on your microphone before you speak and we'll, I'll talk to you about that. The and we will remind you if you need to conclude your speech if you're going over the three minutes. Once you finish speaking, we may wish to ask some questions for clarification. Um, so please be concise in your response. And if there are no more questions, you may leave the meeting and continue to watch it um, via the webcast. Committee members, please, just to remind you that any questions are for clarification and that we will leave all discussion then for our debate. And so what I'll do is I'll ask if there are any questions. If you do have a question, then you put it in the chat function saying you have a question or you'd like to speak. The committee can only consider material planning considerations for or against the application. We can't consider general observations about the development site. We can't consider comments from public speakers made outside of their allotted speaking time. So we request that everybody registered, please don't interrupt or try to come in um, after your allotted speaking time. And it's not possible for anybody but members of the planning committee to use the chat function. And the chat function is for requesting to speak only or to let us know that you have a problem with um, technology and connectivity. Once the committee's heard from all speakers and planning officers, 
we then have debate and we form our views on the application and we will then vote. The outcome is decided by majority vote and the event of a tie then chair as chair I would have the casting vote. It may be a long day. We have multiple agenda items, so I just want to let everybody know that we will have some breaks. Um, I intend that we break for about 10 minutes around 11.30, 30 minutes at 1.30 and 10 minutes at about 3.30 if we are still in session at that time. Thank you, everybody. So now we will go to um, the matters of the meeting and the agenda. And we go to item number two of the agenda, which is apologies. Do we have any apologies? Thank you, Chair. I'll turn my mic on this time. Uh, no apologies from, from me for today. Thank you very much. Now we move to declarations of interest. So members, do any members have interest to declare in relation to any items of business on this agenda? If you could put in the chat that you would like to speak, um, that's how we will conduct this and the vice chair will let me know if anybody is requesting to speak. If an interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, please just let me know in the chat and raise it at this point, but we'll try and um, acknowledge all of them at this moment. Vice Chair, do we have anybody who has any declarations of interest? We have several, Chair. We have uh, first two of myself and Councillor Bradnam. Um, my interest is regarding item 10, which is a pecuniary interest because my employer has an ongoing business relationship with the applicant. So under advice, I won't be taking any part in that item and I'll be leaving the meeting for the duration of that item. So um, Councillor Henry Batchelor, you will physically virtually physically leave the meeting at that point as I understand I will um, and therefore we will move to um, put somebody else as vice chair during that time you will then rejoin the meeting for the following agenda item is that right that's right chair thank you next next is councillor Bradnam councillor Bradnam thank you chairman uh, I have a I'd like to make a declaration of non-pecuniary interest uh, for item seven, which is the uh, application at Water Beach. I have had discussions with the uh, one of the uh, residents in that area and um, advised how they might uh, address the matter if they wish to. Uh, but I come to this matter myself afresh. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now have councillors Ripeth and then Wright. Councillor Judith Ripeth. I too have a non-pecuniary um, interest in item seven, just as a local member, and I come to this meeting afresh. Thank you. Councillor Nick Wright. Thank you, Chairman. I have a non-pecuniary interest in item 10. Uh, over the seven years, it's uh, development has been talked about and proceeding. I've met with developers, uh, Alia and Pash Council and planning officers and uh, but I come to this meeting completely afresh not having determined myself at any point. Thank you. We next have councillors Roberts and then councillor Heather Williams. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Um, thank you very much chairman. Uh, Non-pecuniary interest at item eight the Mill Farm Falmere Road Falmere um, I am a member of Falmere Parish Council who have considered this application, but I come to the matter afresh today. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Councillor Heather Williams. Um, so I have a non pecuniary interest in agenda item six. I'm the local member, so have been present at parish council meetings, but I've not taken part and not given any opinion. Um, so have not predetermined myself in any way. Thank you. Next, we have councillors Fane and Hawkins. Councillor Peter Fane. Thank you, Chair. I have a non-pecuniary interest in item five. As the local member, I've taken part in discussions in parish council and with the developers who I know, but I come to this meeting afresh on this matter. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, 
I wish to declare pecuniary interest, non pecuniary interest in item five. Um, I know some members of the uh, development company. I've had meetings with them in the past, but not about this application. And I come to this matter completely afresh. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have two more members that have already spoken, councillors Roberts and myself again. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you again, Chairman. Yes, I will declare a non pecuniary interest again uh, in item nine, which is the Piper's Clonus Balmere application. Again, I'm a member of the Parish Council who have considered it, but I come to the matter afresh today. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And Councillor Henry Batchelor. Yeah, thank you, Chair. One just occurred to me, item 13, as the as the applicant is Cambridgeshire County Council, I'm, I am a member of Cambridgeshire County Council, but that is a non pecuniary interest, so I intend to continue to discuss and vote on that item. Thank you. Good, thank you. And I assume so we have um, items also which are coming back, which we heard at the January committee meeting. Um, so all of the members who were at the January committee meeting, um, I would understand, Ian, therefore, that we're, we, we're all coming to this afresh. We do have another one, sorry, Chair, from Councillor Bradnam. I presume it's the same Bradnam. as one. Exactly, Chair. Sorry, uh, Councillor Bachelor has reminded me, of course, that I ought to also declare a non-pecuniary interest in item 13, the proposed diversion of the public footpath, because I'm also a county councillor. But I've come to this matter afresh. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all, Vice Chair? That's everyone, Chairman. Good. Thank you very much. Um, and now we come to item Agenda item four, which are the minutes of the previous meeting. This um, on page one to 12 of your agenda pack. Do I have any comments on the minutes? No one's showing, Chairman. Can... Oh, sorry, uh, uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Councillor Heather Williams. Um, it's just on page three. Um, it says favour of the notion. I think it's meant to say motion. A notionary motion. Yeah, notion. Not to be confused with the hairspray song. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, is that OK? <laughs> yes, is that noted? Yes, I've got that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Can we take by affirmation that we um, approve the minutes of the previous meeting? Agreed. 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 Anybody against? No. Thank you very much. Chair, forgive me for interrupting. Just to confirm, there are two sets of minutes there to be approved um, from two previous meetings. Thank you. So, can I'll first of all take by affirmation the minutes of the first meeting, which is from the 29th of January. By affirmation, Agreed. please. Agreed. Agreed. And then by affirmation, the minutes of Wednesday, 10th of March, the minutes of that meeting, please. Agreed. 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 Thank you, Thank you Chris, for that. Committee, so we now start with the main items of the agenda, which are the applications that we have. We start with agenda item five, which is on page 13 of your agenda pack. And this is for land between Hill Road and Hinton Way in Stapleford, Cambridge. Application 20 stroke 02929 stroke OUT. The proposal is for outline planning for the development of land for a retirement care village in use class C2, comprising housing with care, communal health, well-being and leisure facilities, public open space, landscaping, car parking, access and associated development and public access countryside park with all matters reserved except for access. The applicant is access land partnerships with DMW Chalk and Trafford and Chalk. Key material considerations would be the principle of development in the green belt, green belt openness and purposes, character and appearance of the area, landscape, biodiversity, trees, highway safety and parking, flood risk and damage, drainage, heritage impact, residential amenity, renewables and climate change, contaminated land, loss of agricultural land, 
other matters and very special circumstances. <clears throat> Given the situation with the pandemic, there has been no site visit. It is a departure um, from policy and there has been an extension of time agreed for a decision on this application to the 20th of April 2021. This application is before committee because um, of the objection from Stableford Parish Council that came through the chair's delegation meeting referring uh, with a request to refer this to planning committee. The officer recommendation is for refusal and the presenting officer is Michael Sexton. Michael. Sorry, Chair, before we start, we do have a declaration of interest from Councillor Heather Williams. Ah, yes, Councillor Heather Williams. Apologies, one I missed on my list was on the next page. Um, I, it's a non-pecuniary interest in that I'm a member of the Greater Cambridge Partnership Assembly and they do have a holding objection in this um, application. But you're coming to this afresh, yep. Yes, it's not been discussed at the, at, um, the Greater Cambridge Partnership. Thank you very much. Um, and as I said, the case officer is Michael Sexton. And Michael, would you like to provide? Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair. Thank you. Good morning, members. Uh, just a few updates before going into my presentation. Since the publication of the committee report, um, I've received four further representations to the application, um, two of which are from local residents who have already commented. No new issues were raised within those comments that haven't already been uh, addressed and considered within the report. Primarily those four late representations talk about Greenbelt and highway safety, which are all within the report. Um, turning to the report, and, and say obviously those public representations have been on the, available on the website since, since receipt. Uh, turning to the report, uh, paragraph seven um, highlights a screening opinion application which was submitted to the council. At the time of publication of the report, that application was pending decision. I can confirm that has now been determined. Um, it's not EIA development, so that would that would be updated, and there would perhaps just be one extra line within the report confirming that this is not EIA development. Uh, paragraph nine refers to a 2006 application being approved so that was in fact withdrawn. Apologies for that error. Paragraph. 22 refers to the comments from the British Horse Society um, and just to clarify because I don't think it is clear in the report there is no loss of route or, or access or public right of way as you'll see when I show some constraints so that that sort of objection is relatively unfounded um, and then jumping all the way to paragraph 314 of the report uh, where it's discussing the planning balance um, paragraph 314 should include reference to the fact that officers are giving limited weight to the release of housing stock. Um, the issue of, of limited weight housing stock is addressed in full in paragraphs 296 to 299. It's just an omission from 314, so apologies for that. There are the updates to the report. There's one further update before I go into my presentation. Um, members will be aware that the agent for the application circulated two documents to members of the committee um, and then to myself on Friday the 9th of April. Um, those documents were published on the council's website yesterday and I sent a copy to the um, objectors who are registered to speak today so that they had sight of that ahead of the committee. Chair, before I go into my presentation, I don't know if there's any need to discuss that point any further. I think um, we received quite a flurry of different representations sort of yesterday and even up until the evening. And, and what we've done with all of them, and as you said earlier, is to make sure that they're available as much as we can to all. And I understand that what you've done, uh, Michael, is you know upload those as well, and um, they have also been circulated. So thank you for those those efforts. Yes, I will move on to my presentation. So, Chair, if you could confirm you could see a uh, PowerPoint presentation, please. Yes, thank you very much. Excellent. OK, so yes, this is um, an outline on the application with all matters reserved apart from access uh, for a retirement care village uh, in use class C2, comprising housing with care, communal health, well-being, leisure facilities, public open space, landscaping, car parking, access and associated development, along with a public access countryside park. Uh, between Haverhill Road and Hinton Way in Stapleford. 
So this is the planning application boundary. Um, and just to put it in context of the village, we have Stapleford here and Greater Shelford over here. So it's on the northeastern edge of the two villages and currently comprises um, open agricultural land. In terms of constraints, it's not a wonderfully, wonderful looking map, but it's just to highlight that the site is outside of the development framework boundary and located entirely within the green belt, which is the green wash across the plan. There's some listed buildings to the north of the site and a few to the southwest of the site within the village framework. The uh, state of the conservation area is denoted by this pink line. There is a scheduled ancient monument at Little Trees to the northeast of the site, uh, beyond which you've got Wandlebury Countryside uh, County Wildlife Site further to the northeast. Uh, public rights of way are denoted by these blue lines. So just returning to the comments of the British Thor Society, there are no public rights of way within the site. The site is not accessible to the public in its current form. And the site is located entirely within flood zone one, low risk. So you can see there's no blue washing across the, the site. Um, it's quite a difficult one to put into context in photos, um, but I will try my best. Um, this is a view looking north along Haverhill Road. Uh, with properties on the eastern side, Stableford Recreation Ground on the left, and development along Gogmagog Way and Chalk Hills to the north. The application site is, is in here beyond these, these properties, which is shown slightly clearer in this photo taken from the junction of Gogmagog Way and uh, Haverhill Road. Again, application site in behind these houses and the countryside park beyond in front of those trees. Moving to the northeast corner of the site, this is a view looking down towards the village, so you can see those properties we just saw in the previous image um, down there to the southern boundary of the site and the countryside park element to the uh, north site. And you can see the topography rises as you, uh, north out of the village and, and particularly to the northwest of the site. This bottom image is taken from the landscape and visual appraisal that uh, accompanied the application and is a view from little trees Hill, the scheduled ancient monument you saw in the constraints map, looking down towards the site. Uh, you can just about make up some houses um, there. So the application site is in this field here. Um, this is a view from the northwestern corner of the site from Hinton Way, looking across the site. Um, so you'd have the time care village over beyond this. You can't really perceive it from here. And again, just the, the, the rising land levels to the north of the site. This is a site, a photo again from the LVA that is taken from within the site, um, looking east across the area on which the uh, retirement village, care village would be sited, just to give context of the existing open agricultural nature of the site, which is bound by hedgerows along uh, Haverhill Road and then also along Hinton Way. And again, two further photos within the site. This is from the western edge of the retirement care village element, looking back towards Stableford Village, where you can see those, those properties on the northern edge of the village, um, Chalk Hill and, and Gog. And, um, and then this is a view from, I suppose, a central point within the proposed countryside park, again, looking down back towards the village, and you have those properties. This is Haver Hill Road running along here, and then Chalk Hill property to Gog and Gog Way again. Um, just a very brief bit of context on the retirement care village, and I'm sure if members have any particular questions or clarification on this, then the applicant would be very well suited to answer those. Um, it is used class C2 uh, residential institution as set out in the report and the description, um, and that is for the use for the provision of residential accommodation and care to people in need. The model proposed within this application comprises the combination of a full care facility, which is sort of your, your standard care home, which we're probably all fairly familiar with. Um, and retirement accommodation with care link packages, which is often referred to as assisted living or extra care. Um, and those elements can provide a range of services to meet individual care needs um, and cater for the level of dependence required, which can be adapted as the needs of the occupants change. Um, retirement care villages also include um, several on-site facilities, some of which are available to members of the public and can include dining, leisure, gym, swimming, hairdressers, activity rooms and, and gardens. Um, but those aren't fully known at this stage because it is an outline application. These, uh, there are four, three or four parameter plans that have been submitted with the application, which we, we would have seen in the plans pack. Um, again, you have the application boundary, a single point of vehicular access from Haverhill Road into the, where will be the proposed retirement care village, 
three pub for pedestrian points of access, one to the southwestern site, one to the east and one to the uh, northwest. And this does show in grey the uh, CAM autonomous metro in, uh, routes um, indicatively, and I'm sure we will come on to that in a bit more detail. The parameter plan for land use and building heights gives a sense um, of likely division of the land. So you have the retirement care village in the southern portion of this L-shaped site and then the countryside park filling sort of a 19 hectare space along here. Um, again, it's outline only, but this is a parameter plan that gives an indication that does talk about heights of buildings, but that's sort of set out in the report in terms of how much we can consider that particular element. And again, a landscape plan which just emphasises that you have a, a large 19 hectare countryside park to the north of the site and then some structural planting and landscaping around the retirement care village element. Um, and then that is all drawn together in what is a, an illustrative master plan. It has to be stressed that this is illustrative, um, but nonetheless it provides a sense of how the development may well be accommodated on the site. Um, going back to the sort of central care home building and then the retirement living spaces in, in different forms. But again, this is an illustrative plan. Uh, key materials considerations, as, as Chair has re already read out, there, there's quite a lot uh, to consider, hence the long reports. So um, I won't dwell on those too much. The, the key um, is obviously the principle of development in the Green Belt. Um, and the MPPF is clear that the government attaches great importance to the Green Belts. The fundamental aim of Green Belt uh, policy is to prevent urban sprawl by keeping land permanently open. Um, the essential characteristics of the Green Belt are their openness and permanence. Uh, the Green Belt serves five purposes uh, to check unrestricted sprawl of large built up areas, prevent towns from merging into one another, to safeguard the countryside from encroachment, preserve the setting and special character of historic towns, and to assist in urban generation by encouraging recycling of derelict or other urban land. So, in the context of this application, uh, paragraph 143 of the MPPF states that inappropriate development is by definition harmful to the Green Belt and should not be improved except in very special circumstances. Paragraphs 145 and 146 of the MPPF clearly define development that should not be regarded as inappropriate. There are two elements of this application and quite clearly the retirement care village would not align with any of the provisions of paragraphs 145 and 146 of the MPPF and is therefore inappropriate development. The countryside park, however, would represent appropriate development, but nonetheless, the proposal as a whole constitutes inappropriate development. It's therefore necessary to consider whether the development of retirement care really results in further harm beyond that caused by inappropriateness, and to consider the justification put forward in support of the proposal and the extent to which those matters constitute very special circumstances. And the final slide um, is my attempt to summarise a 54 page report in one diagram. Uh, so the paragraph 144 of the MPPF states that when considering any planning application, local or planning authority should ensure that substantial weight is given to any harm to the green belt. Very special circumstances will not exist unless potential harm to the green belt by reason of inappropriateness and any other harm is clearly outweighed by other considerations. Uh, in the report, officers have identified obviously substantial harm through by virtue of inappropriate development to the green belt. There's also significant harm to the openness of the green belt, given the, the amount of built form that would be introduced and encroachment into the countryside conflicting with the purposes of the green belt. Officers also consider there to be significant harm to the character of the area and to the landscape. Turning to very special circumstances that have been advanced, um, officers do accept that there is an unmet need and that does carry significant weight in favour of the proposal. Clearly the countryside park has significant benefits and that has been given significant weight. There's the environmental benefits, um, the biodiversity net gain and the landscape enhancements that would go hand in hand with that element. And clearly the social benefits of having uh, a 19 hectare countryside park accessible to the public, an area which is not currently accessible. Um, that fits with national and local policies about making green belt accessible where appropriate. So again, significant weight is given to the, that element. Um, the development would result in about 70 jobs. And um, while obviously officers fully acknowledge the importance of job creation in the context of, of green belt and the size of the site, officers have given limited weight to the economic benefits. 
um, who also given limited weight to the release of housing stock. Um, the occupants are not necessarily going to be from Stapleford or Great Shelford, which is, or indeed the district, which is acknowledged within the, the documents that have been supported by the applicant. Um, so even if you took a, a cautious one to three ratio, it would be perhaps 70 to 100 dwellings freed up within the district. But again, in the context of Greenbelt officers, give limited weight to that as a benefit. Um, there, another benefit put forward, which isn't listed because officers aren't giving it any weight, um, the planning statement did list social well-being and cohesion as a separate uh, very special circumstance, but officers consider that clearly Countryside Park has delivered the social the social element of that and the unmet need as well addresses well-being. So that hasn't been taken as a separate um, very special circumstance. Uh, it is clearly for the decision maker to attach weight that they see fit to the to the arguments. This is the conclusion of officers that the uh, the very special circumstances advanced do not clearly outweigh the harm and therefore the application is recommended for refusal. It is obviously for members to debate the weight that they may wish to attribute, which may be the same as officers, it may be different. Um, if uh, members were minded to approve the application, then there would need to be a, a, a fairly lengthy list of planning conditions, a section 106 agreement, and the application would also need to be referred to the Secretary of State being a major inappropriate development within the Green Belt. Um, that is it from me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I'm sure all of us will have um, the seesaw balance now as a, as, a, as a useful image for all types of, you know, the, the balance and the judgment that we have on all of these types of applications. Um, Vice Chair, I'm opening this up now for any questions of clarification for the case officer for Michael Sexton. I do note that at the beginning he said if there's anything specific around retirement care home provision and the description of that, that would be perhaps directed at the applicant. But for anything else given in his presentation, do we have any other do you have any questions for clarification from members? We have one request, Chair, from Councillor Fain. Councillor Peter Fain. Thank you. <clears throat> Two points of clarification, if I may. The first was uh, there was a reference on the plan to the proposed route of the Cambridge to South East Transport busway, referred to as being the CAM, probably CAM compliant. To what extent is that a consideration? bearing in mind that that is just a proposal. It would, of course, make it more accessible if it were to go ahead. Uh, the second question relates to, and I think Mr Sexton covered this, but I'd still like to ask confirmation, uh, referred to paragraph 145 of the NPPF. Um, and I just wondered to what extent the proposed uh, retirement village would meet um, condition F of that, um, which is relation to uh, limited affordable housing for local community needs. Uh, can you confirm this does not meet that criteria? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Three, you Chair. Um, in respect of the CAM, it's a bit of a difficult one to answer because it's, it's not at a significantly advanced stage where we can attribute it a significant weight. I think that's set out in paragraphs 233 and 234 of the report. Clearly, the developer has acknowledged that there is potential for this to come forward. Should it come forward, clearly it would have benefits you know, in terms of uh, public accessibility to and from the site from public transport, but that's not known at this stage. The developer has done their best to accommodate that that may come forward. The route on their uh, illustrative plans doesn't entirely match the route that's been suggested by Greater Cambridge uh, partnerships, hence the holding objection. And I think it is a holding objection because they themselves don't know at this stage fully what, you know, the, the, whether that's going to come forward or not, and therefore officers can't really give that weight at this time. The second point, paragraph 145 of the MPPF, where it talks about what are exceptions and what could be appropriate for them in Greenbelt. Paragraph F, uh, or section F, talks about limited affordable housing for local community needs. Um, this is not uh, a rural exception site. It's not an affordable um, housing site that's being brought forward. So no, it wouldn't it wouldn't fit within that category um, provision of one paragraph one four five at all. Thank you, Michael. Vice Chair. We don't have any other questions of clarity, Chair. No. 
OK, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Michael. And I'm sure we may come back to you during the debate if there's there's any other need. We'll now go on to the section for public speakers. Um, and the first public speaker we have um, is Jenny Flynn. Are you with us, Jenny? I Lovely. am. Can you hear me OK? Can hear you perfectly, see you very well too. If you'd just like to introduce yourself, um, and then the, you have three moments. OK, yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, Jenny Flynn, I am a resident of Stapleford um, and uh, hopefully here today to reflect some of the 42 objections that you've received from um, local people. Thank okay. you, Jen. Yeah, we'll start now with your three minutes. Thank you. OK, thank you. Today, parish councillors and your own case officers will be more eloquent and informed than me in telling you how this application contravenes policies intended to protect Greenbelt, how 80% of the site would be built or parked on, how 12 metre high roof lines would overshadow existing homes and be out of keeping with Stapleford's village design, how retirement community residents' quality of life would be eroded by poor light, overcrowding and reliance on cars, how development would remove valuable grade two arable land from productivity and how the proposals do not meet the special circumstances required to unlock land from the Greenbelt. I'll say it again. These are the findings of your own case officers. What your officers can't tell you, though, is what it will be like as a Stapleford resident to have such a significant development in the proposed location. It will shift our village boundary towards the east, further away from local shops and transport links. The nearest shopping, health and care services are in Great Shelford, about two and a half kilometres from the site. Without direct public transport, retirement village residents will use private cars and further increase pressure on local roads and parking areas. Access heralds the site's close proximity to existing community facilities and to Shelford Railway and claims the site is well connected and sits in a sustainable location. This is patently untrue. For other reasons too, the siting of the development is incredibly ill-considered. Stapleford is very proud of its connection to Magog Down. The retirement village would be the closest, tallest and densest development in any direction to this local landmark and newly approved county wildlife site. This is not a badge that Stapleford residents would wear with honour. One of the special features of Magog Down is its status as a local high point with uninterrupted views for many kilometres. And the retirement village would significantly diminish public views across open land, be visible from Stapleford's conservation area and set a precedent for further incursion into the Greenbelt. In return for development, our access has offered two sweeteners, access to a swimming pool and access to a country park. Let me knock these both on the head. First, no elderly person of financial means will want in a post-COVID world to share a swimming pool with lots of local people. Secondly, gaining access to our countryside by giving up Greenbelt is not a trade-off we should have to make. If you know the area, then you'll know that the site proposed for the country park is too steep for development. That's why it's not also been earmarked for housing. It's also exactly where the GCP's busway plans to pass through. This needs a minimum width of 14 metres and will run through a cutting along the full length of the country park. Add to this way barriers to prevent people and animals from falling into it and landscaping to obscure it from view. What then will be left for a country park? By all means, rewild it, but don't pretend it's anything more than a narrow strip of unusable and developable land with many buses passing right through it every hour. To summarise then, this is not about being anti-change or nimbyish. This is about respecting the value of the green belt and providing the right development in the right place for the right people. On all of these counts, Access's plans fall far short of the mark. Please do the right thing and reject their application. My time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny, and, and indeed perfectly timed. Very, very eloquent. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from members of the committee? Any questions of clarification for, for Jenny Flynn? No one's indicating, Chair. Thank you very much for your contribution today, Jenny. You can turn your camera off and you can then watch the um, proceedings by the webcast if you'd like to. Thank you Thank very, you much. very much. And I'd like to now call um, the applicant. And I understand that we have Phil Grant who will be speaking for the applicant. Uh, good morning, Chair. Thank you very Hello, much. Hello, good morning. Can, can, and can you, you hear have me OK? Matt with you as well? Or? 
Um, he is in the meeting. Uh, I'll be doing the talking, but uh, Matt is available um, to assist with any questions of clarification if needed. Thank you. Would you <coughs> like to introduce yourself first and then we'll start the three minutes? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm Phil Grant. I'm a director of Axis Land Partnerships and I'm the applicant along with the Chalk family who live in Stapleford. Thank you very much. Your three minutes stick in now. Thank you. I think it's important uh, to explain the intentions behind our application. Together with the Chalk family, we want to provide something special, that being much needed specialist housing for older people, but also environmental benefits for the local community in the form of a countryside park. There is no provision or allocation for such accommodation within the council's adopted local plan, and officers have confirmed no schemes of this type are being considered elsewhere in the Greater Cambridge area. I'm sure the main question is, but why in the Greenbelt? Well, for a range of factors and the nature of a retirement village, it needs to be located close to a rural centre. Except for Camborne, there are no rural centres outside the Greenbelt. We found no suitable or available alternative sites outside the Greenbelt for a retirement village, let alone accommodating the wider benefits of a countryside park. It is accepted both locally and nationally that for decades we have been under providing for older generations. Many people as they get older need support but do not wish or need to live full time in a care home. Most existing, existing commissioned care schemes have strict eligibility criteria, often excluding those that own their own home, which is most older people. In the whole of South Cams, there are only 76 units of extra care accommodation available for self-funders. Due to the shortage of proper accommodation, often older people live in suitable large family homes and rely on external or family help to support their care needs. The alternative is, to, alternative is to uproot themselves from their homes and communities in which they have lived and move to new care settings away from partners or loved ones. In many cases, this can be very isolating and upsetting for couples. Our scheme would provide a range of homes for individuals and couples with services that adapt as people's needs change, allowing them to live independently as long as possible, even with their pets. From the outset, we included a 50 acre countryside park as part of the proposals. We have an agreement to transfer this park to the Magog Trust for public use in perpetuity, along with funding. In my view, in the light of COVID and the demand for open space, the significant benefits of a vast new public park should not even be questioned. The intention is to restore the proposed parkland to predominantly chalk grassland habitat, bringing more than a doubling of the biodiversity of the site. Chalk grassland is one of the most threatened but highly rich habitat types in the district. Linking with existing rural stewardship schemes in the area means that the biodiversity benefits are manifestly multiplied through the strengthening of the ecological resilience of the area. This is a special environmental opportunity not to be missed. Enhancing the quality and access to inaccessible greenbelt land for all to enjoy and delivering the council's doubling nature strategy. We strongly believe the significant benefits of our proposals and its unique environmental factors clearly outweigh the harm and do constitute very special circumstances. Therefore, it's entirely appropriate for you to reach a different conclusion to your officers who found it a difficult balancing uh, uh, consideration themselves and grant planning permission. We do hope you will do so and thank you for listening and I'm happy for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for sticking to the time um, and clearly elucidating, you know, the issues around uh, from your point, which are um, the benefits that outweigh the harms. Do we have any questions for clarification from members? Not yet, Chair. I'll hold on a couple of seconds in case one comes up. There we go, Councillor Hawkins. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, for you. Um, thank you, Mr Grant. Um, you have focused a lot on the uh, countryside park and the environmental um, benefits that uh, this proposal is intending to bring, which is a good thing. However, um, as you've seen from the officer's presentation, there are uh, a few issues which I think you did mention on, which is you say that this is the only place you have found uh, in the whole of South Cams that could be suitable for this. I'm afraid I find that difficult to believe. How far did you look? Uh, so we did, we, 
uh, sorry, we, we looked at, we looked across the whole district, including in the city. Uh, we undertook an alternative sites assessment, which was part of the application, which identified 109 sites, which we then had to work through to see whether they were suitable or available. Um, as I said, most of the so those that were outside the green belts were either identified or either unavailable because they were identified to developments. And you will probably appreciate that most edge of settlement sites outside the green belts are preferred to the more lucrative general housing schemes and be being put forward in the call for sites and the new plan or being developed already. So sites within the green belt would often have to demonstrate this very significant, very special circumstances that we would have to demonstrate here. And combining that with trying to provide the ecological benefits and, off, and so coming from a, a genuine place of trying to balance the harm and the uh, uh, again and the benefits to try and find a site that could accommodate um, the retirement village and uh, vast open space as we have done. There were very there were there were no other sites. There was a site one site in Camborne that we looked at, which is next to your your council offices, which is part of the West Camborne strategic site. So that was unavailable and also unsuitable for um, retirement living because of the business park location. Uh, there are other retirement living schemes uh, coming forward, which are not retirement villages, and um, uh, these were these were sent through to us. And these are actually C3 retirement, just basically limited by age housing and do not offer the same care benefits. So it's so we did have an extensive site search and by way of trying to demonstrate um, uh, that this is the suitable location. And this is the problem you've got because the makeup of the district and, the, and all the rural centres which have the key services which can support such a scheme, none of those rural services, sorry, rural centres are outside the green belt. So you will face the same the same problems. So the question being, if, you, if you're not in this location, where is the right location? Thank you. Do you have a supplementary uh, question? Um, I do. And I think this is one of the things I tend to um, you know, ask developers is this. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how well or how much uh, of um, engagement you had with the local community, because looking at the comments that have come back from them, there's a lot of <laughs> um, comments that actually don't support you. So did you actually engage and engage properly, not just go, this is what we want to do, you know, like it or not? Uh Yes, so we started engaging with the, the local community back in 2017 and the first thing we did was attend uh, a meeting with members of the parish council and also neighbourhood planning forums with a blank piece of paper to say look we'd like to we'd like to look at bringing development forward in this area and we'd like to work with you. Uh, for 18 months um, the the parish council wouldn't let us talk to the steering group uh, and eventually after some time of persuasion we were able to sp uh, speak to the steering group but unfortunately the steering group has, uh, has has discontinued but we have we have met with uh, with them on a number of occasions and we attended lots of the consultation events and our starting point was to look at some of the aspirations of the neighborhood plan to try and work with them and those aspirations were to get better connectivity to the countryside and to provide the right type of housing um, Unfortunately, Shelford and Great State and Great Shelford and Stateford are completely surrounded by green belt, um, and they have um, and anything they bring forward, unless it's going to be within the village framework, which is very tightly drawn, is going to have the same pressures, whether it be uh, C3 general housing, retirement housing, or any other type of development. Um, we have we and I think you've got the parish councils, and I think they will confirm along with the ward member that we have spent an extensive time. Um, trying to consult with them, a number of consultations and follow up. So we've had a very open, I would say, generally uh, positive, although you know people don't support it. So it's something which is dear to our hearts, and also the family members live in the village, and are keen to make sure that this was done properly. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. No more. Thank you very much. Vice Chair. Oh. Next question, Chair, is from Councillor Khan. Councillor <coughs> You talk about for the country park uh, restoring chalk grassland on, on the country park area. The area that you have, a uh, chalk grassland is uh, developed over many, many years. It's normally uh, developed a renzina soil, uh, shallow renzina soil. What you seem to have there is rather more clay with flint type uh, chalky soil. H how do you propose to create a biolog uh, biologically valuable chalk grassland on such a heavily farmed farm land? Uh, so at the earliest opportunity, if we were to be consented uh, permission, we would look to. Oh, is Councillor Khan still there? I don't it's know okay, he's, he's still there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so we have been in discussion with the Magog Trust, 
and who are the experts at restoring this and as uh, as you all know have just been awarded county wildlife status so um they are the experts and the aim uh, and we have uh, a draft agreement in place to transfer the land to the ownership of the Magog Trust at the earliest opportunity, along with funding uh, to pay for the setup and then maintenance ongoing um, to, to return this. So we, we appreciate that it will take a number of years uh, to restore the land from the high intensity agricultural use. Phil, Phil, just one moment, sorry. Yeah. I, I said that Martin Khan was still with us. Councillor Khan, can you confirm you're still with us? Uh, yes, I'm still here. Okay. You, <laughs> sorry, that's I don't know why. You that's think right. I'm not. Continue. Sorry, yeah. Phil. Sorry, can you hear me, Councillor Khan? Is that all right? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. I, yes, I hear everything you're saying. Uh, OK, yeah. So um, in, in talking with the Mughal Trust, we expect it would take around four years to try and restore uh, to its, its its former habitat. And it's uh, it's quite critical that, um, you know, that we take the time and, and we, as, we as the developers are not the experts to do that, which is why we went to spoke to the most appropriate organisation to do that. And they are um, we, we walk to walk the site with them and they are very confident that they can return and, and enhance the area back to uh, its original habitat and supports also the wide ec ecological resilience of the Magog down and then linking into the, the further areas of the Hobson's Park. So trying to create a necklace of green spaces all the way out from Cambridge, all the way to the Magogs and to Wanderbury. Thank you very much. You have a follow on question, Councillor Khan. No, no, thank you. That's very much. Thank you very much. And can you lower your hand, Councillor Khan, as well, as, as you turn off as well? Vice yes. Chair. Councillor Wright, next. Councillor Nick Wright. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my question is to do with sites that are available. And I appreciate from what you said that you've been looking at sites over quite a long period of time. And during that time, there's been a, a brownfield site at a minor rural centre i.e. Patworth Everard, the Royal Hospital Patworth site has come available and been sold, perhaps for a scheme similar to what you're looking at building. Uh, did you consider that site because that was available and for sale during the time that you've been looking at the present site you're on? Um, uh, we, I'm aware of the site. Uh, it's, been, it's come to me in a different capacity, but not actually as uh, as a retirement village as we're proposing, uh, with quite a significant uh, price tag. So it would uh, make it it was un unsuitable in terms of the cost available to it, uh, and it's, a, it's quite a different scheme. Um, so um, again, um, it, it's not one that was we we at the time of the application, bearing in mind where you know we've been working on this for a number of years, that was available. However, you know, in my view, we need to be looking at looking at the need that's available. We need to be looking at multiple sites for retirement living, not just a single site. And I think we need to be looking at providing accommodation throughout the district. Um, I know that's a slight departure from this particular application, but I think we've got to be careful that we don't just um, we don't just look at put, putting retirement living in one particular place because then you're asking people to move. We need to be catering for the, the amount of old, the ageing generation we've got around the around the district and around the, the county. So um, that, at that's the time, that's all right. Do you have a follow up sorry. question to that? No, that's fine. Thank you very much. And then finally, Chair, we have Councillor Bradnam. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Thank you, Chairman. Um, through you to Mr Grant. Um, Thank you for your explanation of uh, your assessment of need. Um, it seems your those your assessment doesn't meet with agreement from the residents who've said on our page 17 in the agenda, as summarised by the case officer, that several similar schemes in nearby villages are struggling to fill vacancies and that the provision doesn't match any perceived local need which hasn't been established. Have you actually done a local needs assessment in Stapleford and the nearby villages? Um, we have, well, we've done a, a district, a market catchment area, and we've done a district wide need area. And uh, some, I think I think the percentage, if you look at the research, 37% like come within a three kilometer distance of, of, where the, um, of the location of the retirement village. Um, it's uh, it's not like a housing needs survey in terms of an affordable housing needs survey because of the weather eligibility criteria. And as I, as I say again, if, if so, if you have assets of twenty three thousand pounds or above, you are not eligible 
for social care. So it therefore is saying if you own your own home, you will then have to be a self funder. And the issue we've got here is that we're not providing accommodation for self funding and co commissioned care that dealt with by the county council and commission care has strict eligibility criteria. Um, so it's the difficulty we've got here is we're not providing for self funders. So the only way we could do a need survey is to go around every single residence and say, you know, do you require, do you require accommodation now? And their situation isn't that they might not need it now, but in the future they may need it. Um, and then it also requires a situation. It, what you can't do is move as a couple. So then you're looking at a separating couples where one will need to go into accommodation for care and then you leave somebody at home and that can be very distressing. So this type of accommodation, which isn't actually accounted for in any of the county council assessments and, and even the CRESA model um, that, that the county and the city council have, and South Council have done, they've purely been looking at shelter accommodation and extra care. And they've acknowledged that they need to re, amend this and review this to take into account the new models that are coming forward. But if you wait, the need is going to get even critically worse and, and the need hasn't been questioned by your officers. They acknowledge that as an under provision now and we haven't got the um, and uh, and we haven't got uh, we're not bringing the right accommodation forward. And whilst all that's coming forward at the moment in C2 accommodation is care homes, which doesn't accommodate for the mass majority that need it. So we Thank need you. to move away yeah. from the care, to, the care home model. Thanks. Thanks very much, Phil. Do you have a supplementary question, Councillor Renan? No, thank you. Vice Chair. We have one final speaker, Chair, which is Councillor Fane. Councillor Peter Fane. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, my, my question was largely uh, just been dealt with, but I also wanted to ask um, in relation to alternative sites, whether Axis had considered uh, an adjacent site which is available and not for the country park, but for the uh, retirement village, uh, just at, uh, just adjacent to the car park, uh, to the com proposed country park, the other side of Hinton Way. Thank you. And Councillor Braddon, if you could turn your video off, please, your camera. Thanks. All right, follow to us. Thank you, Phil. Um, I'm not sure. Are you able to be more specific, Councillor Fane, about the site? Yes, I'm talking about the Waverley Park care home site, which is currently redundant and has not been put forward for the uh, local plan at this stage. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not aware of it. I, I've, I fear if it's just a care home site, then the size won't. The size won't be suitable. Uh, so the retirement, a retirement for a full retirement village for the full package of care, including the assisted extra care, and then um, the full the full care home suite, the nursing and dementia care, would need to be at least really. It needs to be a minimum of seven acres or seven to ten acres. So if it's just a care home site that's available, it would would only be available to provide one type of accommodation, primarily a, a care home site. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any further questions? No one's indicated, Chair. OK, thank you. And thank you very much Phil, for answering those questions as well so fully. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Um, and now I'd like to um, invite the Parish Council. Um, we have Stapleford Parish Council and Councillor Howard Kettle. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? I can hear you, um, but not see you. Mr. Kettle. OK, is that better? Yes, perfect. And yes. Um, if you can speak up a little bit so we can hear you. And am I pronouncing your surname correctly? Uh, my name is Howard Cattell, Councillor Howard Cattell. Cattell. Thank, Thank you very you much. Me now. Um, Cattell, so we have Councillor Howard Cattell for Stapleford Parish Council. Could I ask you to confirm that you have um, the authority of the Parish Council to speak for them today? Yes, I'm fully authorised by the Parish Council to speak on their behalf. Thank you very much. Um, and you know the rules. You have three minutes to speak now. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is an application for a significant development located outside of the development framework of the boundary of Stapleford. Furthermore, this is an application for development in the Green Belt, and we have not been able to identify any exceptional circumstances to justify this development. Stapleford Parish Council, supported by a local firm of solicitors, prepared a statement in 2015 regarding its position relating to the Green Belt. It recognised it is, quote, tasked with preserving Stapleford's Green Belt for the pleasure and benefit of its current residents and as a custodian for future residents. 
the parish council as its duty will consider afresh any planning applications and paragraphs 81 and 87 of the national planning policy framework will be taken into account in its objective consideration of the application and its merits." Unquote. Stapled Parish Council does not consider that this application complies with this policy statement. This is a proposal for a high class residential and care facility and there is no evidence of this need in Stapleford. Furthermore, as a care facility, there is no opportunity or requirement for affordable housing to be provided, which is a need that has been identified in our village. Care homes notoriously command high values and high annual service charge costs which would not generally make the development accessible to people in our village of retirement age. It cannot therefore be justified as an exception site. Again, the dubious advantages suggested of public amenities such as hairdressers or restaurants are already well represented in the village centre. And again, there's a question mark over affordability and accessibility for what would be on offer. If permitted, this development would remove land around the village which is regarded as its green lung and would be detrimental to the special landscape and the semi-rural setting for the village itself, all of which would be eroded by a permission for this development. This development, we believe, is harmful to the green belt. Furthermore, the proposal is disproportionate in both height and mass of buildings. The existing buildings of seven to eight metres in height would be overshadowed by buildings up to 12 metres in height and a wholly inappropriate dense development would be imposed onto the edge of the village where densities are currently extremely low. It is the parish council's view that if permitted, this would be a car on the edge of the village and the proposed additional tree planting and landscaping would be wholly ineffective in mitigating the overall impact on either on the views, either from the village or from the Mogog Down. It's an extraordinary proposal for a location for a retirement village with virtually no public transport access and a good 30 minute walk to the nearest shops with an uphill return journey. This development Mr. Cattell, if you could bring your comments to a close. And does not resent represent a sustainable location and indeed the arrangements with the Magog Trust would appear to be at this stage highly opaque. In conclusion, we believe this is a, the wrong development in the wrong location. It's overbearing, it doesn't serve the needs of the village and it's certainly not presenting any circumstances to justify it as a green belt exception and should be refused. Thank you very much, Councillor Cattell. Um, do we have any questions for clarification? We have two so far, Chair. The first being from Councillor Ripoth. Councillor Judith Ripoth. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for that clear explanation. I've just got one question. In your point of view, um, how accessible is this area of green belt um, within this red line boundary? and um, on the edge of Stapleford from your very local point of view. Do you mean for local people? Yes, yeah, for local people. I think it's already been pointed out there are no public rights of way over the land, mm -hmm. but uh, I am a frequent walker on the Magog Down and mm -hmm. I would walk past this field regularly as I walk up the Haverhill Road. So it has to be taken within the context not only of the village setting as a semi-rural setting, but also in terms of the setting of the Magog Down and the Magog Hill. Okay. Um, Do you have a follow up question, Councillor Ripp? I think you're trying to get at whether or not this is opening up for new access. Um, how accessible it is, but so from your point of view, it's the openness of it, the views, which are probably the most important aspect of it. Yes, indeed. Um, it, is, it, is, it is really a question of we've got the Magog Down, which is open to the general public for mm -hmm. rambling, 
Um, and, and in any event, if Axis really do want to make this available or the family wish to make it available, they could gift this or in some way open up Access Ways. Uh, it doesn't just have to be part of a property speculative deal to open up Access. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next chair, we have Councillor Hawkins. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and through you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cattell. That was quite um, that was quite clear. Um, but what I want to pursue really is uh, uh, the issue of how ha of housing need within the village, because you referred to it that there were, you know, it, this proposal um, doesn't actually provide for any needs within the village. Did you discuss with the developers, um, you know? affordable housing or any other type of housing that you might require as a need within the village? And if so, what was their response? Uh, my understanding is that the uh, developer has been proposing a C2 user, so there is no opportunity there for um, affordable housing. Um, we've, we've been very concerned in terms of um, consultation with the developer uh, because uh, we basically just need to, needed to stand on our statement that we would not encourage in any way development in the green belt and certainly not in this location. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And then we have Councillor Bradham. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, my question is rather similar to that of Councillor Hawkins, um, but it relates to given that you're on the parish council i wonder whether you could characterize the sort of um accommodation that you think would be suitable for um the elderly population in your area i appreciate the catchment of this sort of development tends to be wider than that but what is the sort of need for elderly people that you would recognize i think um it, it's obviously been um shared that uh, just picking out uh, a piece of development land in the green belt, which arguably is cheaper than going elsewhere. I don't, I don't think there has been sufficient evidence of research in that area. And um, in, so, in sorry, some, my my uh, question was, what has the? Do, are you aware of what the parish council has identified that might be the character of the sort of accommodation that you think might be suitable? For, for Stapleford, for example? I, I think you're asking a very focused question in, in terms of the fact that uh, the, the, the presenter of the proposal has explained that this is not a care home facility, it's not housing as such, it is a very, um, um, it, it's a different type of user and, um, and at this moment of time, the parish council has not uh, deemed it necessary to do any surveying of that nature, it doesn't have the resource to do that. We simply rely upon the local knowledge we have and the responses that we get from the 40 or 50 people that have written in to say that this is not appropriate in the village. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your time um, and responses there, Howard. Thank you very much. And we would also now like to hear from Great Shelford Parish Council and we have Councillor Barbara Cattell. Hello. Can Hello, you hear Barbara. Me and see me? Can see you, we can hear you. That's and wonderful. I think you, you now know, don't you, the, the rules about the three minutes? Absolutely. Could you also <laughs> just confirm for us, please, that you have full authority from the Parish Council to represent them today? I do have full authority from Great Shelford Parish Council and along with the other things that have been mentioned, I am chair of the Neighbourhood Plan Steering Group for Great Shelford and Stapleford, which is combined village neighbourhood plan, which is in the process of being produced. Thank you very much, Barbara. So if you'd like to start now, your three minutes. OK, there's been a lot of talk about um, the fact that this country park is going to be an amazing facility for the two villages. As you're probably aware, Hinton Way, um, although the part of Hinton Way where the access would be is in Stapleford, Hinton Way is mainly in Great Shelford. And so the, the country park aspect would link from Hinton Way across to Haverhill Road. 
Um, the question really is that that is a site that um, we don't believe is act actually necessary, but would be valued if it was put in place, the country park. But it doesn't seem to be being offered as a country park in its own right. And it comes with the condition that a large development is put on the other part of the land, which, again, I can only talk from Great Shelford's point of view as to the views across to the Magog down and over to Waddlebury. And the, um, the, the retirement village would be just obscuring so many different views and so many rights of way across because um, that is a whole area that would be blocked out. Uh, in terms of, of privacy. It's, it's proposed that we do have access to it. We have hairdressers. We have a swimming pool at Sawston Village College, which is open to the public. Um, we, we have all the facilities that are being offered. We have umpteen restaurants and pubs, which are really ideal and have um, recognition around the country. So I don't see that the, the um, from Shelford's point of view, the residential village is of no value whatsoever, is, is obscures the views and the country park, although it might be useful, we don't really see that that is the appropriate place to do it, especially with the fact that there may be a busway disconnecting it from the village anyway and therefore not, um, not allowing access across in the normal idea of things. As regards the steering group of the neighbourhood plan, we were approached way back in time by AXIS about this. The reason I believe they're planning to do this on this site is because they own this site through the Chalk family. Um, and that is probably why they haven't looked at other sites in quite the same depth. Um, I don't know that for a fact, but that would be my view on this. Um, and as regards the steering group for the neighbourhood plan, they have brought several presentations to us. And on most occasions, if not all, we have said this is not the appropriate use of this land. We do believe that there is going to be a need in the future, possibly already for affordable housing. The houses that were shown on the very edge of the development were built as affordable housing. Unfortunately, when uh, they were ready for sale, uh, the affordability didn't continue. So we do need somewhere, some protected affordable housing um, for local children, elderly, whoever it may be. But that is not what is being offered here. And the fact that there is absolutely no transport link of any sort, or even maybe with the busway, because the busway will be full when it reaches that, 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 that stop. So, you just like to conclude. Yeah. so that what we're really saying is that we, we don't think it's an appropriate place. Thank you very much. Okay. Do we have any questions for clarification for you? No one's showing German. Thank you very much for your time and for speaking so brilliantly without noticing the voice. Sorry, can I? Uh... Oh, okay. actually, there are a couple. I see. Just one moment just before you go. Yeah. Sorry, it take, takes a minute to come in. Um, in. In my village, there is a assisted living care home, uh, which is being closed down because it's uneconomic. Are there any such care homes already in uh, Shelford and, uh, and Stapleford? On the, since you're doing the neighbourhood plan, you should be aware of them. Uh, uh, and, and have they shown to be, if there are, are they being economic or, or what, what's the position of this particular form of uh, development, which is what I understand they propose, uh, where you, you don't have a full care home, you have just a, a, these people are able to live on their own, but just with a little additional help. Um, as far as I'm aware, there is the development in Great Shelford, which was the old BMW site on London Road. Um, which uh, my understanding is that it is very expensive and that it is not full because people can't afford to be there. There is another development that is about to start on the old Shelford oil site next to Shelford station, um, which is to be more of a, a care home than a residential home. Um, 
in the terms of it is going to provide full medical facilities, I understand. And that is very much on the, the beginning of, of uh, planning at the moment. Um, and uh, I mean, other than that, I'm not aware of anything in the two villages. Thank you. And, and I think, members, we, we have heard from officers as well that there is an agreement of an, of an unmet need that's um, not been questioned. Do I have any other questions? We have one chair from Councillor Hawkins. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair, through you, and I'll be very brief. Uh, thank you, Mrs Kettle. Um, you mentioned your neighbourhood plan that you're working on. Is this jointly with um, Stapleford? And do you have or do you have in there any proposal for the land that we're talking about here? Right. Um, yes, it is a combined neighbourhood plan, Great Shelford and Stapleford together. Um, it, uh, it, did, it, it has sort of paused at the moment due to the fact that um, the previous chair of Stapleford Parish Council died and he was very much masterminding it. Um, I am the chair of it, um, but it has not met due to um, lack of, of personnel to take part in it oh, for probably 12 months or so. Um, we're about to re reinstate it and to get going on it. So far, we have done a landscape survey and have recorded the fact that the views from both villages up and across towards the north, towards the, um, the east, all over this site here are the, the vital views from both ways, both directions, from the Gog Hill and from the villages across. They are the main views that uh, we consider um, define the, the landscape of the villages. Okay. I don't know if that Thank answers you. you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any further questions, Vice Chair? No further questions, Jen. OK, thank you very much, um, Barbara, for that as well. Um, in terms of public speaking, we also now have the possibility for local members to speak. Um, Councillor Peter Fame, would you like to speak now or at the end of the debate? Chairman, I'll speak at the end of the debate, if I may. OK, good. So, members, we'll now move to debate uh, on the application. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to point yes, out. Anna if, Bradlam, if you do, you, are you putting to speak in the chat through the vote? No, it was just I wanted to point out it's 11.30 and you said you thought you might have a break then. That's all. Do you want to turn your video off, Councillor Anna Bradnam? Sure. Thank you. I was just about to say that we would be going into the debate now based on um, the full information that we have in the report back and what we've heard just now from the public speakers as well. And we're looking at the balance in terms of the harm and benefits of this and whether it meets the special circumstances um, that would be needed. Um, and yes, I am going to announce that we have the 10 minute break um, and that while everybody is making a cup of tea, stretching or whatever, they consider what they've heard and what they've read in the report pack. And we will be back at 11.40 to have the debate on this application. Um, Lee, um, Liam, I think you are in charge of the meeting itself. How will we conduct this part of the um, break? Uh, as it's only 10 minutes, I just suggest that everybody turns off their cameras and mutes their microphones. Um, and yeah, I don't think I'll put up a slide for the 10 minutes, but for the longer break later, I will. I think I think that's the best way to do it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So, yeah, so um, if everybody turns off their camera and their microphone, we don't necessarily need to hear the chatter <laughs> while you're having your break. And we will be back in, at 10.40, please. Thank you.
All right, just to confirm, we're still live uh, when you resume in a moment. Thanks. Liam, thank you. So and it's 9.40 now. Um, yeah. Members, what I'd just like to do is a quick roll call to make sure that you're all here. You don't need to turn your video on, just um, respond to me, please, by audio. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Present, Chair. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Present. Councillor Dr Martin Khan. Councillor Peter Fain. Present. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Present, Chair. Councillor Judith Rippeth. Present, Chair. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Present, Chairman. Councillor Heather Williams. Present. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Present. Councillor Nick Wright. Present. Councillor Dr. Martin Kahn. Pre present. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, so as I said, we'll open now for the debate and the debate is around exactly this seesaw that Michael Sexton's case officer showed us, which is looking at the harm and benefits um, of this particular application and whether or not it meets those very special circumstances um, for an application that's a departure in the green belt. Do we have any speakers, Vice Chair? Uh, we did have Councillor Wright just before the break. I'm not sure if that was to speak in the debate or not. It was chairman. So Thanks. may I start? Or? Of course you may, thank you. <laughs> Thanks chairman. Uh, I, I've been on the planning committee for many years and to be honest, this application, I cannot remember an application that does more harm than this application. Um, it is in not just, you know, in the green belt, it's in one of the best bits of the green belt, for goodness sake. And it, it is so important to the setting of those villages around it. The area is well served by country parks already. Um, and, and, you know, in these days we, you know, we need to be thinking about producing food, just not, not just country parks. So I believe there's real harm in this application in the country park and the care home. I don't accept that the um, this is the only site available, as I pointed out, there were other sites available, but at a price. This may be the most available site at the price the developer wants to pay for it, but there are other sites in South Cams. There is a need, but not here, absolutely not here. And it has so little going for it, Chairman. You know, you might consider asking councillors who wish to speak in favour of it to do so, because I I just cannot see, I don't see there's a balance. There is real harm here. And I'll leave much. that to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Vice Chair? We have Councillor Rippeth next, Chair. Councillor Judith Rippeth. Um, Councillor Wright has just summarised what I wanted to say. I, I'm not finding the balance difficult on this application. I really think it's severe harm and very little that I can think of in favour of this application. So unless somebody really changes my mind, I will be voting against. Vice Chair, do we have others who have um, asked to speak? Yes, we have. We do. And what I would ask is if, if anybody who has something different from what has been said so far, please to use this time to speak or as Councillor Wright said, if you, you know, have a counter argument in terms of the balance and then, then please do speak. Who was next? Sorry. 
We have Councillor Roberts next. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Chairman, I've taken on board what you've said, so I'll keep it very brief. Um, clearly, the list that we've got in front of us. Councillor shows... Deborah Roberts, do you want to put your video on? Sorry, your Sorry. camera. Sorry. Um, surely, we have in front of us on page 13 the list of things that we needed to consider, but the most important one was the very special circumstances. In my opinion, it has not been shown um, that this does quantify and qualify under very special circumstances. I shall be voting against. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams next year. Thank you, Chairman. With your words in mind, I would just also like to draw members' attention to page 19 from our affordable housing team because one of the things that we do sometimes say is in the right balance of affordability and affordable housing can tilt it but I, I quote only be suitable for those on high incomes um, and therefore the there is absolutely no benefits that I can see to this um, that would outweigh the undoubtable harm as others have mentioned thank you chairman thank you Next, we have Councillor Hawkins. Councillor Dr. Jimmy Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, there is, I mean, the, 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 the diagram that um, uh, the case officer put up for us, I think, is very instructive. And the balance is just not there. But what struck me also was um, uh, Ms. Kettle's comment about the hotel. Mm -hmm. Hotel, beg your pardon. <laughs> Um, mentioning that in the neighbourhood plan so far, the the views looking towards that site is one of the key views that they have referred to in their plan. And that indicates just how important that part of uh, the landscape is. And building on it um, is just not right in my opinion. So I will be voting against this. Thank you, Councillor Tumi Hawkins. And, and obviously at the stage which that in terms of a neighbourhood plan it's, it's not a significant material condition but obviously that is very important in being one of their first findings and, and key findings so thank you for that can i reiterate that if you have requested to speak if you have something which adds to our debate about the balance between harm and benefit that hasn't already been said um, then please do continue with your wish to speak so next chair we have councillor richard williams Thank you, Chair. Keeping that in mind, I'll be very brief. Um, I agree with everything that, 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 that's been said. Um, I just wanted to really add that I thought the report was, was set out very well um, and uh, the presentation as well. Um, both um, set out the issues very clearly um, and um, I think really helped me to, to make the balance, but um, I will be voting against. Thank you. Thank you. What was different, case officer? No, you were complimented on the report. <laughs> I, I, I was complimenting the case officer. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, but in due, you know, obviously what we do have here is some, you know, I think this come towards us because of the amount of public interest, because of this, um, whether or not providing access um, and to this piece of this countryside park area. Um, but at the moment, I'm not hearing that for anybody that has changed their view in terms of the balance. Anybody else who's registered to speak has something additional or to bring to this debate, please. Yeah, I guess a little comment that I would like to make. Uh, uh, sorry, no, we'll go to the vice chair. Sorry. sorry. Yes. sorry. Yeah, or in, in order, chair, it's councillors Bradnam, Fain, and then Khan. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> my observation is that I did act, uh, understand what the applicant was saying, and we do need to make provision for elder accommodation. It's really important, uh, and uh, but it needs to be suitable for the people who need it and within their affordability. And it, we need a, a range of accommodation, and I dearly hope we do consider that in our evolving local plan, but this is not the right place. Uh, as as Councillor Toomey Hawkins and Councillor Cattell said, to, to build on an iconic view and the, the local precious area, it would be totally inappropriate. So I shall be voting against. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brad. And I'm also to, to recognise that, you know, as the case officer did say, that there is, an, un, there is um, an unmet need. We do need to look at this in our new local plan going forward. And I think it was very, very important considerations that were brought through. Um, Vice Chair, who's next, sorry? 
Uh, it was Councillor Fain, but I've just read that he wants to speak at the end as local member. So yes. next committee member is Martin Khan. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I really wanted to add a couple of minor points. I've taken the point about the speech. Um, one of the main purposes of green belts is to keep settlements apart, uh, and particularly to uh, limit um, ribbon development. And the proposed development seems to me a classic form of ribbon development. Which in it, so, so it's not just that it's in the green belt, it's also the, the type of development in the green belt, which does um, cause reservations. Um, secondly, obviously, from the comments that were made, uh, I want uh, it's clear that it's not a straightforward matter of creating a high quality by, uh, uh, wildlife chalk grassland is not an easy uh, an easy thing. I think this needs to be uh, taken into uh, account as well. Um, so uh, the third point is that the, the actual location in terms of providing for the elderly is quite isolated, is poor, uh, poor links. Uh, that strikes me as a, a, a very significant factor to take into account. So uh, like the other uh, other councillors that have commented, I, I shall be voting against. I, the balance seems to be quite clearly against this amendment. Thank you. Um, so I think we can now invite the local member to speak and move then forward to somebody who may want to put forward a motion. Thank you, Councillor Peter Fain. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just mention the objection put forward by my fellow ward member, Nick Sa Councillor Nick Sample, um, and he rightly identifies the potential benefits as well, uh, the need for affordable housing suitable for elderly residents. Uh, the need also for access to the countryside immediately around these villages, as well as the very substantial um, and significant green spaces which we have on the edge of the village. And those are important factors. However, um, firstly, we have to consider whether this will be affordable for local people. That is clearly a key factor in any assessment of special, very special circumstances. I'm not convinced that that has been established. I think it's worth just bearing in mind that there are 70 sheltered housing units within these two villages um, of this district council. Um, there is, however, an identified need for more affordable housing and including for elderly residents. The question then is whether this is the site for it. And I asked the planning officer earlier on for confirmation on those criteria. There are certain criteria for uh, the construction of new buildings being appropriate in the green belt. But I think it's quite clear from the evidence before us and from the planning officer's response, that this site does not meet those criteria. It would not be limited affordable housing for local community needs um, uh, nor would it be an exception site, although that's not the sole criteria. And so when it comes to the balance. Just just one moment, Councillor Peter Fain. I have just seen that Councillor Heather Williams has dropped out of the meeting I, and I want to establish her ability to vote on, on this. Liam, are you able to help me? Hi there. Yeah, so they've dropped out, sorry. Councillor Heather Williams has dropped out of the meeting. She's trying to rejoin. We need to. Um, I am back. You're back, Heather. And have you heard um, what Councillor Peter Fain has been saying? I heard up to the, the um, words that Peter Fain said about Nick Sample and referencing the affordable housing in his um, submission. I then dropped out for a, a few seconds and came back. Um, but that's so I've only missed between now and when Peter said affordable housing. Peter, do you want to just re summarise yeah, those? You were talking about the, 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 the positive points from Councillor Sample's um, part. You just want to summarise the last bit that you said about why then it's about where it is, you know, having seen Chairman, what the that's, positive... Chairman, that's the best invitation I've had to repeat myself. <laughs> I was, Don't normally do it, Councillor Peter Fain. I was recognising the importance of affordable housing, particularly for elderly people. In this community. I was pointing out that we have in fact got 70 units of sheltered housing in these two villages. I would recognise also that the Chalk family have made a provision for affordable housing for local people themselves nearby in the past, so this is not a new development. However, we come to the key question 
of whether the very special circumstances are met here. Would this be uh, local, uh, affordable for local people? And I'm afraid that that has not been established. And therefore, I think it's quite clear that under paragraph 146 of the NPPF, this is not a case where land could be uh, developed within the green belt. And I have to say that I will be voting against this. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Peter Fain. Um, and Vice Chair, do we have somebody who'd be ready to move the motion? We do. Councillor Roberts has moved that we go to the recommendation chair, which I'm happy to second. Thank you very much. So the recommendation um, by the officer on this application is refusal. Um, I haven't heard anybody yet that has shown that they um, would be moved, minded to approve this application. So I'm going to ask whether or not we can take this by affirmation as Councillor Deborah Roberts is recommending that this be refused as per the officer recommendation. Can I take that by affirmation? Agreed. 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 Is Agreed. there anybody Agreed. who's against that recommendation, that motion? Anybody who abstains? Thank you. Um, therefore, that's a refusal of that application. Members, we now move to agenda item six, which is on pages 69 to 84 of your agenda pack. I'll just find them myself. This is land south of Thompson's Meadow, Gildan Morden. Um, the application number is 20 stroke 03151 stroke reserved matters. The proposal is reserved matters for appearance, landscaping, layout and scale following outline planning permission S stroke 3077 stroke 160 stroke 0 L for the proposed development of up to 16 dwellings, eight market and eight affordable with all matters reserved except access. The applicant is Peter David Holmes. No site visit, given that we're um, during the pandemic, we haven't been doing any of the site visits. Is it a departure from policy? No. And an extension of time has been agreed with a decision due by the 16th of April 2021. The application has been brought to committee because Gildan Morden Parish Council requested this to be determined by planning committee. Um, the officer recommendation is approval and the presenting officer is Aaron Coe of, as principal planning officer. Aaron Coe, are you with us? Chair, we have Chair. a request from Councillor Bradnam. Perhaps it might be worth hearing what she has to say before Aaron starts. Uh, yes, sorry, thank you. Sorry, uh, that was an error on my part. I would say that I have actually visited this site when it was at outline stage, but I'll refer, I will save my comments for the debate. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's fine. Thank you very much. Aaron. Hi, Chair. I can't Sorry. hear you, Aaron, but I can see your presentation. Can you hear me now? Yes. Brilliant. So the application site is the land to the south of Thompson's Meadow, which is located immediately adjacent to, but just outside of the village framework of Gildan Morden. The site is not within the conservation area. Um, so as you can see from this aerial view, the application site is currently undeveloped grassland. Uh, the northern and eastern boundaries of the site include trees which are protected by a group tree preservation order. The southern and western boundary also consists of tall trees. However, none of these trees are protected. The site is in flood zone one, which is of an area of low risk. The principle of residential development uh, for the erection of 16 dwellings on the site was established through the outline planning consent, uh, which was granted in 2016. Uh, the outline application dealt with the matter of access to the site. Um, 
and this application comprises the submission of matters for approval that were reserved when the outline planning permission was granted. And these include details of the layout of the site, the scale of the buildings, the appearance of the buildings and the landscaping details. So this slide shows the, the proposed site plan and layout. Uh, as established under the outline consent, the vehicular access to the site is on the, uh, the northern boundary. Um, and there's also a footpath link access, uh, which is also along the northern boundary. Uh, the outline permission was granted uh, to include 50% affordable housing. Um, so eight, eight of these 16 units uh, will, be, will be affordable. So the key issues to consider in the determination of this application are therefore compliance with the outline planning permission, housing provision, open space provision, and the reserve matters details I've mentioned, so layout, scale, appearance, landscaping, biodiversity, flood risk and drainage, highway safety and the residential amenity of existing and future occupiers. Uh, so the, the next next few slides I'm going to show will show the floor plans and elevations which are included in the, uh, the plans pack which has been circulated to members. So I'll just flick through these. So moving on to the context of the area, uh, this slide shows images of properties nearby to the development site. Uh, the local character is generally mixed uh, in terms of house types, materials and designs, uh, as you can see from the, the images shown on this slide. It's considered the um, overall the proposed development is generally in keeping with the existing scale of development, and the character of the surrounding area and the proposed design of the buildings would not dramatically change the overall visual character of the village edge location that the, that the development site is located in. Um, a suitable design response has been produced by the applicants and it reflects the scale of the neighbouring dwellings. Um, this slide shows a, a CGI of the proposed development site. So as I've set out in the officer report and as shown on this slide of the presentation, the key material considerations for members to consider are those listed on the slide. And overall officers consider the submitted details to be acceptable and the proposal will provide a high quality scheme that would positively contribute to the character and appearance of the area. For the reasons set out in the report, officers consider the reserve matters to be acceptable and in accordance with relevant national and local planning policies. Subject to condition, the app application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Aaron, thank you very much. And if you keep that slide up there now, just do we have any questions for clarification for Aaron, Vice Chair? Not immediately, Chair, but I'll give it five seconds or so. No, no one's indicated, Chairman. OK, um, and if everyone just makes note that these are the key material considerations in terms of the reserve matters, we have layout, scale, appearance and landscaping. But we do have these are the issues that will be the material considerations for our debate. Do we, have, we, do we have some questions coming in? Yeah, we've had a few people pop up. We've had councillors Bradnam and Heather Williams. Thank you, Councillor Anna Bradnam. Thank you, Chairman. Through you, I just wanted to ask um, the case officer um, to what degree the the case of the case office has been involved with discussions about the road layout uh, for this site, um, and and is is it the case officer's view that this is a satisfactory road layout for this arrangement? The, the reason, sorry, the reason I'm saying that is because um, the road seems to whilst it keeps the integrity of the development in the middle. Um, yes, the, the, the road around the north and east side appears to sort of cut the houses off from the green space. And I just wondered if that had been a matter of discussion. Aaron? So the, the applicants carried out pre-application um, discussions before I came involved as case officer of the reserve matters application. Um, but the so obviously, as I mentioned, the access is, is, was fixed at outline stage to be located there, but the internal road layout um, was considered to sort of um, to create a, an acceptable highway environment for the for the future occupants. But 
but also to sort of emphasize the open spaces that are on the site as well so obviously it's got they've got these properties mm. along the western boundary put nice views of the open space here and also the the field element in the application here um so for the for the access to to um be provided in this way is is considered acceptable yeah. um thank you, thank you. That's, thank fine. you. that's fine it's it's a better layout than i saw at, at the, the outline proposals thank you and councillor heather williams thank you um i just wanted to clarify with um with aaron and or any other officer that was involved in it is that um I do believe there was a bit of discrepancy ar around the original plans to the outline and if you could just give reassurance that that has been overcome and we now have matching matching designs um, and also if there is conditioning around on the outline to do with operational hours on construction. Thank you. Aaron? Are you able to answer or would you like somebody else to no, answer? No, I, I can answer that. Yeah, so so the, um, the, the, yeah, the access issue was resolved. Highways are now content that the uh, Preserve Matters Plan Spirit complies entirely with the, uh, the outline plan approved SK1 as shown on the plan here. Um, yeah, then the footpath link is in the same location and also there was a condition on the outline um, that ensured that was, that was provided. Um, and the second point raised by Councillor Williams on the construction house, I'm just going to have to check the outline consent. For that. I believe it was uh, covered under the outline permission. Yes, there is. Yeah, there's a condition uh, that restricts the the hours of operation of machinery and deliveries during construction. So that's carried over. Is that that's is that your? Yeah, they'll have, they'll have to comply concern. with that. Yeah. Is that um has that answered your question, Councillor Williams? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And we have Councillor Fane next, Chair. Councillor Peter Fane. Thank you, Chair. Um, on the question of highways, the Highways Authority um, concerned about the difference between the conditions in the outline and those and the uh, proposal here. If we look at page 84, um, paragraph 43, officers recommend that the Planning Committee approve the application subject to the following conditions. Uh, there's then a blank. Would that condition be one of those proposed? Sorry, um, can you just clarify the, the question again? So the details of the high, the access arrangement was that. Do you want to refer to the page, Peter, or the paragraph number? The page number is 84. The paragraph number is 43. Officers recommend that the planning committee approve the application subject to the following conditions. However, there is no, no condition stated there. I wondered whether the one requested by the high, highway authority is proposed as one of the conditions applicable. Chair, if I may, it's Chris Carter here. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, the conditions were circulated as a, as a supplement following the publication of the agenda, so that's why they're not listed there. Um, the condition with regard to uh, construction hours and operation that Aaron referred to as a condition of outline planning commission, so that would also bite on implementation of any reserve matters, so that would carry forward and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't need to be relisted again. Thank you, Chair. Does that answer your question? Councillor Fane. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Any more questions, Vice Chair? No further speakers, Chair. Thank you. Um, we have no public speakers um, in terms of objectors, applicants or parish council on this item. And... Sorry, Chair, we just said Councillor Khan asked to speak. Ah. 
Councillor brief comment and it's not a reason for refusal or anything. But no, I just, time, can I just, no comments, the only we have a clarification question at this yeah, point. Yeah, the clarification that I was going to ask is it would seem to me uh, um, whether the, the fact that the uh, it seems to me that a lost opportunity with plots 13 and 16 to uh, benefit from the view that they could have over the field, uh, whether that's a consideration that you can do anything about in, in, in the discussions. That point was considered um, in, in discussions with the urban design team and the applicants actually amended the elevations of these properties, number 13 and 16, to include additional um windows within these elevations so there will be views of the of the open space thank you thank you um good so we've finished the clarification questions to the presenting case officer we don't have any public speakers in terms of objectors applicants or parish council um in terms of local sorry member, that's sorry oh. cha sorry chair um i believe we do have public speaking on this item um for the applicant and mr watson I think Mr Watson said that seeing that there was no objection, he had uh, said that he didn't want to speak. That was the I, latest I received. Perhaps Ian Senior can confirm. Do apologise. Yep, that's correct, Chair. Thank you. So local members, Councillor Heather Williams, would you like to speak now or at the end of the debate, Councillor Heather Williams? Is indicated to speak. Do you want to speak now or at the end of the debate, Heather? Uh, well, I'll try and do both, but I'll speak as a local member now, if I may, Chairman. Yes, of course. Yep. And then as a planning committee member later. Yep. Um, so the it, this is an application. Actually, the, the parish council had um, wished to withdraw their request for it to come to planning committee. Um, and they asked me to make that uh, to clear to members today. That's why they're not in attendance. Um, I'm, I am pleased that there is a condition in relation to the safety arrangements around the pond. Um, and I I would suggest that we do look very carefully when the time comes around the construction and, and access, because it is a very constrained site in, in that respect. It comes just at the start of, of coming from a 60 mile an hour to a, a 30 mile an hour sort of T-junction to turn in and obviously with the protected trees and um, it can it and it is quite narrow so i think we do need to make sure that any plans on that are um are really done with the protection of the residents particularly those that will be right opposite that access road um but i think on page 82 to 83 most of the um issues have been raised have been have been dealt with by officers and i thank them for that um, but I would ask members to to include that condition around the safety issues around the pond. Um, that is a particular concern to, to residents, particularly those with with smaller children or grandchildren. And uh, the fact that it's 50 percent affordable housing, um, I know, is a, is a strong factor into why it has been accepted and supported by many, um, many residents and, and the parish council. I think I shall um, leave it at that if I can. Thank you, Councillor Williams. So I just want to know whether, in terms of that condition, Councillor Williams, is that something that you've discussed with the case officer and he may have wording or is already included or is something you'd like to propose? It's already it's already included in okay. the in the suggested conditions. If I refer to page 82, it says the condition will be imposed to ensure a sufficient boundary treatment is put in place surrounding the drainage features. And I just ask that members endorse that condition and don't make any efforts to remove it um, because it's a, it is a real concern to local residents that along with the maintenance, which um, it does refer to in section 106. OK, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so members, we now open for debate. Um, do we have anybody who would like to speak first, Vice Chair? Yes, we do. Councillor Bradnam is first up. Thank you, Councillor Bradnam. Thank you. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for the report. And um, as I said, I did visit this site uh, at the time it was given outline planning permission, and it has been through a number of iterations trying to improve the layout and improve the amenity of the site. I know at the time there was also a lot of concern expressed because there isn't 
the public transport links are not good in this area and the access via Meadow Lane um, is out onto a point of the road where it switches from 30 to 60 miles an hour, as Councillor Williams has said. But on balance, I think this is actually a, a much better um, proposal than we had all those years ago. And I'm pleased to see that there is now much better provision for play in on the site. And absolutely, I'd endorse Councillor Williams's concern about the swale. Actually, one way of addressing that is actually, in addition to what Councillor Williams has said, is to make the um, the slope of the swale very shallow, because then there's less li likelihood of falls into water. It's more likely uh, that with good planting on the outside, nobody would get into the water. But absolutely, I would endorse that care. So I shall be voting for this. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Councillor Fain. Yeah, it's always dangerous to assume that there will appear to be no other speakers. However, um, it's clear in this case the principle of development is obviously established. If we look at paragraph 42, um, taking account of the reserve matters, the proposal would provide a high quality scheme that would positively contribute to the character and appearance of the area. We know that there were concerns to be expressed by the parish council, um, but those, it seems to me, particularly in relation to highways, can be met by conditions which we've heard confirmation will be imposed. Um, I was going to suggest that we therefore move straight to a vote since the parish council have not asked for this matter to be referred to us. However, I see there are now other speakers, so I will not make that proposal as intended. Uh, next speaker chair is Councillor Hawkins. Councillor Hawkins, given that Councillor Peter Fane is saying that we probably could move to um, a motion on this one, but is there anything else that you would like to say? Uh, no, not. Uh... Well, it's just to actually say to Councillor Bradnam and Councillor uh, Heather Williams that condition four in the supplementary paper that we had with this actually um, uh, states that prior to the first occupation, uh, the treatments, boundary treatments to be erected around the edge of the drainage ponds within the site will be submitted to and approved. So that is taken care of. Um, so there was, you know, really is no reason for them to uh, to worry, just to assure them. And yes, um, I'm happy to second Councillor Fane if he's going to make that motion again. Yes, no, and I think Councillor Heather Williams did recognise that this was contained in the report and she was just emphasising how important they were and that there should be no attempt to remove them, which I'm sure nobody would want to attempt to, to remove those. Um, so we could move, uh, do we have any more speakers or could we move to the motion, Count Vice Chair? We have uh, another request from Heather Williams to speak. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. You've um, echoed some of my uh, some of my reports requests to speak is that uh, I did identify that condition in what I said um, and also to emphasise now as a planning committee member that um, the uh, eight affordable housing housing um, units are very much required and that um, also to, to thank those residents that, you know, especially those nearby that have accepted this site as well. We don't always see that and I think that shows great maturity and um, appreciation for their village as a whole. So I thought that's worth noting. Thank you. And so we will now go to um, a motion which is the officer recommendation is for approval. Um, that's been proposed by Councillor Peter Fane. And be seconded by by me, Councillor Hawkins, Chair. Councillor Toomey Hawkins. I haven't heard anybody um, that would seem to be saying that they're minded to refuse this application. Therefore, I'd ask if we can approve this application um, with all the appreciation of the hard work that's gone in to resolve all of the concerns. Can we do that by affirmation, members? Agreed. 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 Anybody against? Anybody abstaining? Good, thank you very much. So that um, agenda item six has been approved.
Members, we're now moving to agenda item seven. This is in Water Beach. The application number is 20 stroke 03370 OUT. This is an outline planning permission with all matters reserved except for access for the dem demolition of the existing house and the erection of five dwellings. It's in Vanald Road, Water Beach. The applicant is Mr Sanders. The recommendation is delegated approval. The key material considerations are the principle of development, housing provision, access highway safety and parking provision, character and visual amenity, flood risk and drainage, and agricultural occupancy condition. Um, there wasn't a site visit to this particular application, but we did have a site visit to um, an application in a similar area, and we will hear about the planning history of that one, I'm sure. It is a departure, um, and that was advertised on the 2nd of September 2020. The presenting officer is Alice Young, a senior planner, and it's being brought to the committee because it's a departure from the adopted local plan, and the officer recommendation of approval conflicts with the recommendation of Water Beach um, Parish Council. And I understand that a date is yet to be agreed in terms of the extension of um, decision date for this application. And Alice, if you would like to present the case to you as a summary. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> um, let me just get um, my screen up. Can I just confirm that you can see that I've been having IT issues today? We can see it and we can hear you perfectly. Brilliant. OK. So uh, 95 Bannard Road comprises a detached dwelling with a generous front and rear garden and is located on the northern side of Bannard Road, Water Beach. The application site falls outside of Water Beach development framework with the boundary located south of the site. The proposal seeks outline consent with all matters reserved except for access for the demolition of the existing house and the erection of five dwellings. This is an indicative site plan illustrating a potential site layout. Please note that, please note that this is indicative. A previous planning application for this site was submitted to the council and was withdrawn prior to being presented at planning committee. The current application is similar to the previously withdrawn application, but it also includes the access connecting to the site, connecting the site to the adopted highway at Bannold Road. A judicial review pre-action protocol notification was formally submitted to the council regarding the extent of the red line shown on the site location plan as previously submitted and claiming that this should also include the visibility space across the adopted highway. After receiving council legal advice, officers consider that the red line as submitted is sufficient and that all necessary visibility space as required by the highway authority are either within the red line or within the adopted highway land. There remains an ongoing dispute as to the red line location plan and whether it includes all of the land to which the application relates. Atta attached to the committee report is an extensive correspondence with Hughes Lane Consortium, which correspondence remains unresolved. The legal officer will be available to answer any questions from members. As stated, the application site falls outside of Water Beach settlement boundary. The, the location of the proposed residential development is not support and the and the location of the proposed residential development is not supported by a neighbourhood plan. Therefore, the proposal is contrary to policy S7 as a matter of principle. Yet there are other material considerations relating to the site and officers consider that despite this conflict, the proposal should be supported due to the limited harm which would arise from the development. This is an aerial view of the site. The application site is in red um, and this shows kind of the site context um, of this area of Water Beach. 
The aerial view shows that the application site is surrounded and enclosed by residential development to the north and to the east and to the south. And the site, um, sites to north and east are outside of the development framework boundary and gain consent when the council could not demonstrate a five year housing land supply. Consequently, the northern side of Vinyl Road has, through the introduction of these dwellings, changed physically and functionally. Furthermore, the council recently lost an appeal on the narrow site directly west of the application site, so this one just here. Here is the application site boundary. Um, so hang on a second, this is just showing the development framework boundary here. Um, and this one is on the aerial view as uh, this one does not show the um, site next door, which has also been developed. Um, so this is the adjacent appeal which has just been allowed um, and costs were awarded um, in this instance. The inspector noted that the character had changed when um, assessing the appeal and emphasised that the appeal site had more affinity to the suburban form that surrounds it rather than the countryside beyond the adjacent developments and surrounding Water Beach Village. Officers considered that the application site 2, which is the subject of this application, this one, um, has more affinity to that of the suburban development surrounding the site compared to the rural countryside which the site is separated from and makes limited contribution to. Therefore, the proposal would not harm the wider character and appearance of the countryside. And it is the view of officers that the site and its immediate surroundings cannot be categorised as countryside to which the proposal can encroach to. In terms of suitability, the proposal is for five dwellings, well within the indicative maximum of 30 dwellings, which a minor rural centre can accommodate, detailed in policy S. Nine. Whilst the application site is located outside the development framework boundary and therefore technically policy S9 would not apply, the scale of the development, five dwellings, a net gain of four, is aligned with the quantum of development which is normally um, permitted within this framework. Officers consider that a departure from policy S7 of the local plan is justified in this instance given the site context limited harm to the countryside and the relatively sustainable location of the scheme close to services and facilities. Furthermore, there are no other technical issues such as drainage or highways that would render the development unacceptable when taken individually or accumulatively. Another aspect of the development to note is the ag agricultural occupancy condition. The existing dwelling due to be demolished has a condition restricting the occupancy to agricultural workers. Policy H19 relates to the new dwelling to support a rural enterprise and supports the removal of agricultural conditions subject to specific criteria. The proposal does not seek removal of the condition but demolishes the existing dwelling and redevelops the site. However, given that the original reason for the condition states that the dwelling serves the agricultural use of the adjoining land, which appears to be redeveloped into housing now, the need for such a condition is no longer evident and thus officers support the redevelopment of the site. Several concerns have been raised regarding the impact of the development on amenity of neighbours. The application is in outline form with matters of scale, outline, uh, scale, layout, landscape and appearance reserved for later approval and thus final layout, scale and appearance is not known. Yet officers are satisfied that the um, five dwellings can be accommodated within the site without significant loss of light and privacy or outlook to surrounding residents. Again, these matters would be considered further at reserve matter stage. In conclusion, planning decisions should be taken in accordance with the development plan unless other material considerations that indicate otherwise arise. This is a clear case reinforced by a recent appeal decision of the inspector where officers advise that material circumstances indicate otherwise and the principle of redevelopment of the site for housing should be supported. Whilst the proposal would be considered as a matter of principle, 
Limited harm to the aims and objectives of the local plan would arise in terms of encroachment onto the countryside or the sustainability of development. Therefore, officers recommended recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, Mr. Kadu, is it possible to turn off your camera, please? Sorry. And your microphone. Thank you very oh. much. Thank you very much, Alice, for laying um, out all of the issues that we need to consider. Do we have any questions for clarification for the case officer? We do. We have a few chairs, starting with Councillor Bradnam. Thank you, um, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to clarify with the case officer, please. Could you just um, point out to us given that this is an illustrative plan, could you just indicate to us the distance between the eastern boundary and the nearest livable rooms in, in the, in the um, development to the east of this site? I don't have that information directly to hand, so I would need a bit of time to, to get that information to you. Um, I'm happy to do that. Um, if that's desired. Well, it, it, it's, possible yeah. make, it's possible that may come up, but, uh, but um, it was just something I would like to clarify. Um, the other issue I wanted to ask about was whether I can see that there's um, a condition relating to a scheme for disposable surface water, disposal of surface water, and I wanted to, and I'm going to ask it now, um, whether we can add in some wording referring to ongoing maintenance of the ditch, which runs along the front of the property. It's piped at present, and I just wondered whether we could add in some wording uh, relating to that and whether the case officer felt that was acceptable. Um, when I went out to site uh, multiple times, I didn't necessarily see the ditch that you were referring to. Um, there is a ditch on the adjacent um, sites which has recently got consent. However, I'm more than happy to attach a condition if, if that's felt by members. Um, I think um, the reason you can't see it is because it's been piped underneath. Um, but it was just simply if we could amend, if you would, if it, I just wanted to establish whether it would be acceptable to amend condition 18, which says no, no development should take place until a scheme for disposal of surface water and foul drainage, including ongoing maintenance of the ditch might be added. Sorry, excuse me. Alice, you're, you're able to um, look at that, I think, during the debate, if there's a proposal for that condition to come through. Do we have other questions? Is that fine for you, Councillor Anna? Yes, Brandon? that's fine. Thank you. Yes, Chair. Yes, we have Councillor Ripper next, Chair. Um, thank you, Alice, for that clear presentation. Councillor Bradenham, could you turn your camera off, please? Sorry. Yep. Um, you mentioned obviously the site next door, which has just been um, um, one on appeal for the developers. Um, how much weight? I mean, I, I'm getting from you. Is it really significant? Because um, this obviously has seems to me to have a big impact because this is literally next door. How much do we apply in our considerations? Of course, uh, thank you for your question. Um, yes, it does carry significant weight, um, as does the surrounding context, which is what I was trying to illustrate by those visuals. Um, I'm happy to get those back up again um, to show you um, in a bit more detail. But yes, um, it does carry significant weight within the um, within the application assessment process, especially as um, in that appeal decision, um, they were awarded costs um, against the, the mm. decision that we made. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, Councillor Rippers? Yes, it does. I mean, it's quite difficult at this stage because we don't know the exact layout and it's quite hard to ascertain, I imagine, how close 
everything is going to be to surrounding sites. Sorry, that's a bit. But this is the principle of development. Question. So we do yeah. have, you know, what we have is those, those considerations yeah. that we do have. But I think what, mm -hmm. so as we're understanding what, it, what, debate, isn't it? What, even though we have to look at each application on its own merit, what we're being advised here is given that a decision that we took at an earlier planning committee meeting, which was to refuse an application um, within this area for the reasons that we refused it, um, South Cams then presented those arguments during the appeal mm -hmm. and we do have a copy in our report of the yeah, inspectors right, countering that. each of yeah. those reasons. As I understand your question, I think it's really helpful for us all is what weight therefore do we have to afford that context, the context of that appeal decision? Yeah, indeed. And we've been told that's significant. Thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you very much. Next. Is Councillor Fain, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, there is no intention to demand uh, affordable housing. So paragraph 71 deals with that. Uh, should not be sought for residential developments that are not major developments, except, of course, in the case of exception sites. Now, in terms of paragraph three, uh, the proposal would not comply with the local plan, is outside the development framework boundary, not supported by neighbourhood plan, what consideration was given to making this treating this as an exception site? Um, the agricultural occupancy tie is also perhaps relevant here because whilst it is no longer agricultural land or indeed rural, um, that does not necessarily mean it is not still needed for some element of affordable housing so that if it were an exception site, we would see a mixture of affordable and market housing rather than just exempting it under paragraph 71. Alice. Thank you. Um, so um, it's, it's a valid point. Obviously, this um, outline consent is for just five dwellings, so it falls below the threshold um, of affordable housing. Um, and it's as such, um, we haven't included a condition to, re to require affordable housing on this site. I think Councillor Fain's point was if it's outside, therefore, even any kind of um, what, what we would say is a rural exception site, that you would have some kind of affordable housing requirement. I think that was the point he was making. So was that considered not the threshold of a, of a you know, a major development of 10 houses? Should I? Chris, I can see you there. Yeah. That. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, the starting point for determining the application is uh, the development plan, clearly the local plan unless material uh, considerations indicate that a, a contrary decision should be made. Uh, and that's really uh, the consideration that was set out by the inspector in the recent appeal decision on the site next door. So the starting point would be um, this is beyond the development framework um, and therefore unacceptable uh, unless it was um, either a scheme for affordable housing, as Councillor Fain points out, or there are other material considerations which indicate uh, that planning permission should be granted. Um, and what Alice has explained and what the report explains is that the context in particular of the surrounding area um, and how that has changed is, uh, in officer's view, uh, the significant material consideration which would indicate that, um, that planning permission should be granted. Um, in the circumstances, the applicant's obviously entitled to apply for a, a scheme for market housing, uh, which is what they've done, and, and that's what we need to consider. So whilst Councillor Fain is correct that in, in normal circumstances you would expect a site on the edge of a settlement such as this to come forward as an exception site for affordable housing. In this particular case, um, there's an argument being made that there are reasons uh, not to do that and that, that a market scheme should be acceptable. Thank you. Councillor Fain, do you have a follow up question? No, Chair, that's a very uh, comprehensive answer. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair. We have no more speakers, Chair. OK, thank you very much, Alice, for that. And I'm sure we may come back to you during the debate. <laughs> thank you very much. We'll now move to the public speakers and I'd like to invite uh, Mr Skidmore to speak, please. Are you with us? Hello, I am. Can and Dr. Ian Skidmore, sorry, I can just right, see that. Okay. <laughs> right. um, and 
if you just explain, introduce yourself sure. before we get to your three minutes. Yeah, so and can I also say I've asked for some slides to be shared whilst I'm speaking, so could those be ready for when I... Can I'm I ask Liam, is that possible? Or oh, Alice? Okay. okay. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so, so anyway, yeah, before I start, um, yeah, so, so I'm Ian Skidmore, I'm a neighbour of um, um, 95 Bannell Road I'm on Barnfield Coast. Sorry. Thank you. And so, and you're, so, you're... So, so I'm representing several of the neighbours who have, we, we've, we've joined together for this statement, basically. Thank you very much. Um, and so your three minutes begin now and we have the slides as an aid to your to your points. Thank you. Yeah, OK, thank you. So, as I say, I'm speaking here on behalf of all four neighbouring properties on Barnfield Close, but I'd like you to note that objections have been raised by no fewer than nine neighbours in total. Amongst more common fauna, foxes, deer and bats can be seen using the property's gardens. The application is to replace a single house and these substantial gardens with five houses plus garages. The suggestion that this can enhance, restore and add to biodiversity is not credible and no evidence has been provided to the contrary. Indeed, the plan requires the felling of 11 trees, including two Class A trees and seven mature or early mature trees. The development will convert a distinctive local property that offers a small refuge for nature into an additional load on already stretched services. One such example is the local open reach street cabinet, which is already at full capacity. This means that number three Barnfield is on a waiting list to receive fibre broadband, as will be any new houses built, regardless of their internet service provider. Whilst the submitted plan illustrates that five properties can fit on the land, it also reveals that to do so means that they must be pushed close to its boundaries, causing a maximum negative impact on neighbouring properties residential amenity. So to prove the likely scale of light loss, for example, my first figure, top left, looks across the site from the sole living room window of number five. The sun is seen setting straight ahead just above the boundary hedge. It's irrefutable that any development in this direction will block direct sunlight from illuminating the room. My second figure there shows just how much of a sky a house like those depicted in the illustrative plan would block, depending on its distance from the boundary. The indicative plan would have a dwelling blocking the full lateral extent of that image. Move this, dwelling later, move this dwelling laterally and it will instead block the light of one of my neighbours. You should also note that the illustrative site layout shows buildings occupying nearly 90% of the lateral extent of the plot. Uh, are we still on the same slide just to ask? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, so ne next slide now, though, please. <laughs> yeah, um, so daylight, daylight loss can be calculated. This figure shows a plan, of, plan view of my living room. On the left, you see the light level now. And on the right, you can see the significant impact where the indicative plan to be built. Similarly, the application does not show that five houses can be built on the land without a significant loss of privacy to residents. Regardless of the final layout, some of the five new houses will have views directly into both the living rooms and master bedrooms of numbers, of numbers four and five and overlook the gardens of all four neighbouring homes. So in summary, the building of any additional homes on this land will have a detrimental effect on the local ecology and add pressure to local facilities. The application provides zero evidence that five houses can be placed on the land without a significant loss of habitat and residential amenity, breaching two aspects of policy H16. The proposed development will irrefutably cause a significant loss of light and loss of privacy for neighbours on Barnfield Close, negatively impacting the residential enjoyment of our homes. Permitting five properties here will push bound buildings towards the boundaries of the land, making the de development even more overbearing and out of keeping with the street scene. Without evidence that a layout that doesn't, which doesn't cause a significant impact on both habitat and residential amenity is even possible, this application should be rejected. Thank, thank you, you very much, Ian. Um, and thank you for all your preparation for, for your contribution today. Do we have any questions? Yes, Chair, we have one from Councillor Rithers. Councillor Judith Rithers, yes. Thank you so much for such a clear um, three minutes. Um, one thing I'd like to ask, which I found really helpful with your photographs, and I know the plot well because of being a local member, how many metres would you estimate those windows are from the edge of the hedge, the, the site boundary. Do, do you mean our front windows? 
So, yeah, from your front window, yeah, number it's, five, it's, I think. It's, it's about 15 metres. 15, OK, yeah. thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. The distance to the house would be 17, I believe, on the, on the indicative plan. Mm -hmm. Thank Any you. Any others, Vice Chair? No further speakers, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mrs Skidmore. So, Ian, if you um, close down now, you can join the meeting via the, the, via the webcast. Thanks. Thank you. And I'd like to invite now Mr Moyes, the applicant. Are you with us, Nick? Hello. Hello. I'm here. Thank you. Um, would you like to introduce yourself first before we get to the three? Yes, years? my name is Nick Moyes. Um, I'm an associate partner with Brown & Co Property Consultants um, and I act as agent for the planning application. So I'm speaking on behalf of the applicant. OK, thank you very much. If you'd like to start now. Yes, um, I will be brief because I think many of the points that I wanted to raise have already been discussed and mentioned. Uh, of course, it's acknowledged that the um, proposal is contrary to the local plan because of its location outside of the development framework boundary uh, and of course in many circumstances that would justify a refusal of permission in principle but I think this is one of those uh, quite unusual cases where the particular circumstances of the site would justify a departure from policy. Uh, essentially I think in this location as you've seen on the slides the development boundary has been overtaken by events in that there's been quite significant development around the site so that it's now bounded on three sides by housing and as you've seen also permission has been granted for development on the fourth side. So really the site forms. Sorry, just of... Mr Moyes, um, Jane Williams, Councillor Jane Williams, if you could just turn off your cameras, please. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr Moyes. I think she's frozen. But yeah. Right, thank you. Yes, so essentially the site forms part of the, the built up area of the village. Uh, and there would be no intrusion into the countryside uh, or adverse effects on the setting of the village and therefore no conflict with the objectives of, of policy S7. Uh, in terms of broader sustainability considerations, uh, there's a good range of services in the in the area, all of which would be readily accessible uh, from the development. And in terms of its scale, its small scale would be in keeping with the council's strategy for growth in villages like this. In terms of other planning considerations, uh, obviously we have taken note of the concerns about potential overdevelopment of the site and impact on neighbours amenities. Again, as you've heard, the application is in outline, the layout is indicative. Uh, but I think in terms of broad principles, our view is that the site is certainly capable of accommodating five dwellings satisfactorily. Uh, the density of the development proposed would be quite low. And what that gives us is, I think, considerable flexibility in terms of the layout to make sure that the, the final proposal, which would obviously be subject to a further application, um, would meet all of the requirements in terms of relationships with neighbours. Um, the application is for five dwellings, so some of those dwellings could potentially be single storey or elements of the buildings could be single storey. Uh, and there is certainly scope to vary the layout from that shown on the indicative plan to create a, a satisfactory relationship with surrounding properties. Mm. Uh, in terms of other issues, um, various technical reports have been submitted with the application in relation to matters such as ecology, uh, ground contamination and protection of trees. And no objections have been raised by consultees in respect of those uh, reports. And so we would hope that all of those matters can be satisfactorily dealt with by condition. And in terms of the proposed conditions, uh, there's no objection from our side to those that are proposed in the report. So on that basis, we would hope that members can support the application. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions, Vice Chair? And thank you very much, Nick, for keeping within the time. Chairman, no one's indicated yet. I'll give it a few seconds just in case there are. And we have Councillor Ripeth, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if my clarification is for you, actually, or Chris Carter. Is that OK, Chair? Well, yeah. Um, yeah. You just mentioned elements could be single storey. I would like to know at this stage if we're able to consider that kind of question or whether that would be something for reserved matters. I think it would be good for Chris to come in because this is an outline 
planning mm -hmm. application, of course. Uh, what has been raised within the other public speakers is whether or not the fact that five giving outline permission for five buildings would make that possible or not. That that has been raised. Chris. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, at this stage, we wouldn't be able to control that. That would be a, a matter for the reserve matters application that comes later. OK, thank you. Uh, no one else has indicated at this stage, Chair. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. Light. Councillor Bradman just popped up. Um, thank you, Chairman. Through you, I just wanted to check with Mr Moyes. Um, you heard my um, asking for clarification at the beginning as to whether we might add um, taking making sure there's ongoing maintenance for the ditch that runs along the top of the front of the property. Would that be an acceptable modification to the conditions? Yes, if, no if, objection if, to that. If the application no. were given approval. Yes, no objection to that change. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think there's nothing more. Thank you very much, Mr Thank Moyes. You. Thank you. And I'd now like to invite um, Councillor Jane Williams. Hello, can you hear me all right? can hear you, yes. I saw your Hello? video previously. Are you Hello? able to put your camera on? Hello, um, I'm having trouble switching my camera on and off, so let's just go with what we have. Um, okay, yes, and so I, I, I do have a Williams, Just before um, you introduce Council yourself, but also morning. confirm that you have full authority of the Parish Council to speak on their behalf. I do. Uh, I, yes, I do. Can you hear me all right? You've frozen here. We can hear you perfectly. Yes, yes. we can't see you, but we can hear you. Right. But we can see uh, you now. Yes, I'm going to say otherwise I'll switch my camera off. Okay. No. So yes, I do have authority to speak on behalf of Water Beach Parish Council. Um, there are three issues I would like to address. The first is the agricultural occupancy. Um, could officers actually confirm that it is a requirement for the applicant to seek to formally apply the removal of the ag agricultural occupancy prior to the approval of planning application? Um, I did note that the officer said that this would be a requirement once approved, but um, I would just like to ask that question as to the, to the process. Um, because permitting the application as it stands would breach the clear wording of policy H194 in the adopted local plan regarding the relaxation of the existing occupancy condition. Um, and then I'd like to move on to drainage. Um, there is no evidence from what I can see regarding drainage in the applicant's planning statement for this application. Page 92, para 4 in the public pack states, the proposals are not in accordance with South Cam's adopted planning policy. I'll let you read the rest of that or I'm going to lose all of my time. Um, a condition 18 on page 111 of the public pack actually mitigates the drainage um, but, but without the evidence. Um, also there is no evidence that the Water Beach Internal Drainage Board as the regulating body for the management of drainage for the parish um, has been consulted with whether there's um, capacity for the new development um, but um, I don't know why the Old West Drainage Board has on the consultee list. Um, WPC has concern regarding who is responsible for the long-term maintenance of the ditch and culvert between the road and the property, which is a vital part of the village storm water drainage and requests that this is clarified and appropriate action taken before any construction is allowed. And there has been much discussion between local bodies regarding this matter. WCPC are not aware of any resolution to mitigate surface water drainage and flooding which has occurred quite badly uh, over the winter um, in Bannold Road where the development is proposed and therefore WPC recommends the deferment of this application until such outcome is known. Um, as I say, it's, it's been a huge issue. Highways, this is the last issue I would like to address. The application is for outline planning permission with all matters reserved except for access. There is no approved plan for the access listed and there is no condition requiring the development to be carried out in accordance with any access plan. WNPC understands that this creates total ambiguity with regards to the detail of the access. As access is not a reserve matter for this application, the question of access 
goes to the heart of the decision on granting outline permission. Paragraph 109 of the National Planning Policy Framework 2019 requires that development should achieve safe and suitable access for all users. And just my, my, my last words uh, with regarding to highways. Um, WPC requests that details to provide a safe and suitable access for all users are specified and controlled by a planning condition. And WPC also seeks reassurance the decision to approve without such a condition will not be to the detriment to the safety of pedestrians and other users of Battled Road. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for sticking to the time as well, Jane. Um, and so I understand the last one, it would be to the detriment, yes, of, of safety. Do we have any questions for Councillor Jane Williams? Not as of yet, Chairman, but again, I'll give it a, a few seconds in case there are. <clears throat> and we have one from Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is not actually so much a question for um, Jane Williams, but I did want to pick up on a point that, that was made in that submission, which is about policy H194. Um, there is a paragraph in the report on, on, on um, paragraph on policy H194, but at no point does the report actually say that the conditions have been met. It, it, it seems to sort of gloss over that. So I would like to re to reinforce what Jane Williams just said. It would be useful to hear from the officer um, about H194. So there is a clarification. You'd like clarification as to whether or not that has yeah. been yeah. Yeah, or like the clarification of the officer rather than yeah. the yeah. speaker. Alice, are you able to respond to that or or Chris? Hi, um, yes, um, that was taken into consideration. And um, as I said in my presentation, the reason for the condition um, when it was um, imposed on the um, dwelling was to do with the adjacent lands um, which it served. Um, and obviously it appears that that land has been developed. Um, and so in terms of need for that particular dwelling um, to serve the surrounding um, agricultural land, it, it renders it slightly um, what's not as needed in that respect. I think the question from Councillor Dr Richard Williams is whether or not the, the, that policy has been met, you know, the conditions for that, for the change have been met. Chris Carter. Oh, sorry, Thank Dr Chair. Richard, I don't, want to, I don't want to speak in your, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, Councillor Williams. Sorry, Chair. Um, yeah, it, it was that, and particularly point K about marketing for 12 months, um, but also the point about um, the condition needing to be removed before this planning application is approved, which I think was the point that um, Councillor Jane Williams from Water yeah. made. If I can try and help. Um, so policy H19 uh, relates to proposals for permanent dwellings in the countryside for full time workers in agriculture or forestry, etc. Um, this application um, isn't for uh, it doesn't propose dwellings for um, such workers. Um, it proposes new market dwellings and the demolition of an existing dwelling that is tied in that respect. So when that dwelling is demolished, uh, it's my view that the tie, the agricultural tie will fall away with that and the new permission would override. Uh, therefore, uh, I don't consider that they need to meet that requirement of 4K of a marketing, um, marketing uh, exercise um because this isn't an application for a, uh, either removal of the tie because the dwelling would be demolished and therefore uh, that tie would fall away with that demolition sorry to come back again <laughs> would would not the tie be tied to the land not the building the land will still be there and the land will still have the tie it's not just the building it's the land well policy h19 relates to proposals for permanent dwellings in the countryside uh, as opposed to the use of land, as I'm reading it quickly here. Um, therefore, uh, my view is that it relates to the occupation of the building. And if the building is no longer there, then the occupational tie would fall away. It's an agricultural building. Thank you. Councillor Dr Williams, have you a follow up question? Um, uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've taken up a lot of time here, but um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually slightly thinking beyond 
this policy now ab about the nature there is a condition attached to that land um through you know previous planning permissions and, and surely i would imagine that condition on the land has to be released it wouldn't necessarily disappear just because the building goes can um, we um, just have a legal legal response to this or chris or stephen chair i don't know if stephen reed wants to uh add anything to the discussion uh the application in front of us is a proposal for for market dwelling so it's it's uh not a proposal for agriculture use the use of the land would be changed the agricultural tie would would fall away um Stephen did you want to add to that um, no I I will leave that to the the planners to uh, uh, give their their planning view on on the condition thank you so um, I, I don't really have anything additional to add uh Councillor Williams other than um it's my view that uh, the the new planning commission should it be granted would override the uh, existing agricultural tie which would fall away on the demolition of the property. Thank you. Alice, I see you've come in. Would you like to add anything? Yeah, just to add something on, on Chris's um, explanation there, the agricultural occupancy condition specifically um, talks about, specifically relates to the dwelling, not the land, just to clarify mm -hmm. that. So what um, Chris was saying is when the dwelling is, is you know, gone and demolished, that falls away because there is no longer a dwelling um, there. OK. Thank you. Councillor Dr Richard Williams, is that OK? We can move on to I, a further I, I, question. I think, I think I've had my say for the time being. I might come back to it in debate. All right. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? We have two, Chair. One from Councillor Heather Williams and then Councillor Bradnam. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. <coughs> My apologies to Councillor Jane Williams because I think my question is more directed to officers as well. Um, Councillor Jane Williams refers to a lack of consultation with the internal drainage board. It went to an old board. I just want to clarify what we've signalled. This is the greatest at times. Um, if I could confirm that's correct and then from officers, what implication does that have? Do we have to consult with them? What confidence do we have that the consultation process can't be challenged? Thank you. Alice, can you respond? Sorry, there's a slight delay on my computer. My bandwidth isn't coping very well. Um, in terms of um, drainage, obviously that's um, something that has been considered and appropriate conditions have been attached to the outline consent for which further detail will, will come in the reserve matters um and and that will be addressed through those conditions on the outline consent i think alice the question was around the consultation around that um which consultees did those include the internal drainage board or um and have it has it been have they been satisfied that consultation has taken place with those responding on drainage i would have to triple check that um to to confirm but um when writing the report we were um, satisfied that all the correct consultations were carried out. Would you like a follow up to that, Councillor Heather Williams? Yes, and this time I'll I'll direct it to Councillor Jane Williams. Could you just clarify um, in your in your three minutes, you mentioned about consultation to an old board as opposed to a current board. Could you elaborate a little bit more on on that, please? Um, and then in the meantime, if officers could double check and triple check, that would be appreciated. Thank you. I think you're on mute still. Sorry. Hello. Hello. Um, yes, uh, obviously I've done some homework and looked at the um, planners pack. And looking at the consultations, uh, it's not clear who has been consulted. If you look on the planning portal, the, the front page, uh, the consultee, the highways and also the, the IDB are shown under general comments, i.e. and so is the parish councils mixed up with um, the actual, everybody's consultation. So but the lead flood is on the front. But basically, 
going through the IDB because of the issues that we've had in flooding um, in, in the um, Ballard Road area, it's really imperative they have the last say or they say the advice as to how much capacity there is in the storm drains and the drainage that they are responsible for it and should be consulted with. Looking at the uh, planning portal, it only shows that the IDB, the, um, Brit, the Old Western Drainage Board has been consulted with, but not the Water Beach Internal Drainage Board, which is my concern because of the issues that I raised about riparian responsibilities, but also about flooding. As I say, the manhole covers have been lifted with this rain. So it's really important that we sort this out and it's done in the right way. So this is why I've raised that. Thank you. Thank you. And if we can move to the next questions while officers are looking up um, if there is any more information on that. Yes, I think it's Councillor Anna Bradnam next. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so two things. Um, and again, really, um, I just wanted to point out that my understanding of paragraphs 113 and 114 address the issues that Councillor Jane Williams brought up about the agricultural occupancy in the sense that there is no longer long term need for a dwelling with restricted occupancy to serve the need in the locality. I think that's the ground. So, Anna Bradley, this is a clarification yeah. question okay. at this moment rather Sorry, than. Yes. A, okay. Yeah. The, the other point was that for clarification, sorry, I'll, I'll wait till the debate. Thank you, thank you. Um, do we have any um, more information coming back from the officer on the consultation? Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties accessing that information. So my um, manager, Toby Williams, is just gonna check for us now. Thank, thank you. Well, that, that can perhaps come to us during, as we're getting the rest of the speakers. Thank you very much, Alice. Thank you very much, Councillor Jane Williams, um, for your time. And um, you can join through via the webcast now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. And now we turn to local members. We have two local members, Councillor Anna Bradham and Councillor Judith Ripper. Um, would you like to, Councillor Anna Bradham, would you like to speak now as local member or at the end of the debate? Uh, yes, I'll speak now. Thank you, Chairman. Just one uh, moment. Um, Councillor Jane Williams, are you able to either leave the meeting or, or turn your camera off? I, th I still seem to have you on the screen. Perhaps Liam, can you help us with that? Hi there, Chair. Yeah, I would advise to leave the meeting and come back in. I will watch the participants list to uh, admit them. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor, you'd like to speak now. Thank you. I just wanted to, um, as, as local member, I'm familiar with this location and you'll recall that I asked the same question that uh, Councillor Rippeth asked about the distance between the boundary and the front windows of the neighbours properties because I'm mindful of the distance involved and the aspect of those dwellings. Um, the point I was going to make is that my understanding of the condition around the agricultural occupancy uh, in addition to what Mr Chris Carter has said is that under um, H19 section 4b my understanding is the part of the reason is in addition to the fact that the, the agricultural occupancy condition relates to the dwelling not the land that at section b there is a, a clarification that um, it can be relaxed when there is no longer long term need for a dwelling with restricted occupancy to serve the need in the locality. So that's my understanding that that's reasonable. Uh, the other point um, I wanted to point out with regard to Water Beach Internal Drainage Board is that uh, Jane Williams is quite right that 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 ditch is within the Water Beach Internal Drainage Board area, but it is not itself an internal drainage board drain. Um, it's a right and proper to check that they have been consulted. Um, and the reason they are is because anything that goes into that drain does eventually go into the 
internal drainage board drain, the award drain at the eastern end of Bannold Road. Um, I'm, that, that's all I wanted to say at this point. Thank you. Thank you. And we know that you, you are also considering proposing a motion that you will bring later in, in the debate, I'm sure. We also have local member councillor Judith Rippers. Would you like to speak now at the end of the debate? Um, I'd like to speak at the end of the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's ten past one, members, so I think we'll continue with the debate um, and at half past one sort of have a rain check where we are, as we said that we would have a, a break, short break for lunch at around half past one. So we're opening now to the debate. I don't know if we have any more information on that consultation yet, Alice, just before we go into the debate. Sorry, um, yeah, my, uh, Toby Williams is still is still checking that and checking the areas for for um, jurisdiction in terms of internal drainage boards as well, just to to then be able to come back to you fully on that. OK. Um, members, so that is an issue that we do want to bring into the debate. We, we can open the debate um, now. Do I have any speakers? We have Councillor Ripeth, Chair. Councillor Judith Ripeth. Um, it was only to suggest should we do lunch now whilst all that information is being collated? Or, but obviously that's your choice as Chair. And who we have somebody else to Councillor Bradnam, Chair. Councillor Bradnam. Uh, and obviously, uh, pending the decision, the, the information that comes back, I wanted to. Um, uh, this is sorry, a bit iterative, and I apologise, Chair. I just wanted to ask that we. I would like to propose that we amend, even regardless of anything else we do, mm -hmm. um, that we uh, consider an amendment to condition 18 on page 111 um, so that it should read, uh, and I'm reading from it and I'll point out where I'm putting the amendment in, no development shall take place until a scheme for the disposal of surface water and foul drainage that can be maintained for the lifetime of the development has been submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. I would like to add in including ongoing maintenance of the, the piped ditch. And in, if you remember, Mr Moyes said he would be happy to accept that condition. Um, so that would just be if the, the committee is minded to approve, then at least that condition would protect maintenance of the ditch for the life of the development. Good. And so we have um, some information outstanding for them to look at. We have also just to for officers to double check on that, the wording of that condition. Um, so it, it could be that we have the break mm -hmm. now and um, and then come back and we would have hopefully have that information and the clarification. First, do we have any other questions that we have a that question of clarification from Councillor Heather Williams? Yes. Thank you, Chairman. It was just to reiterate part of my clarification earlier, which I, I fear has been forgotten, is I actually did ask not only have they the right people been all um, consulted, but what are the implications if they haven't oh, yes. as well? Thank you. So yeah. if I, I know that's a, a small add on, but it's quite important. No, that's fine. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. So, so what I will do then, if everybody's um, OK with that, I've got it sort of 11.13. If we come back at 11.45 um, and if I can speak to officers during that period just to make sure that we have got answers to that and also um, that the proposed conditioning, the wording of that is all clear as well. And then we'll go into the final debate on this. Liam, as we've got a half hour break, what do you propose? Uh, I will put up a slide in a moment. Thanks. And, but everybody should also turn off their cameras and their audio, their microphones. Yeah, they can do it. It doesn't matter uh, as it won't be being streamed, but uh, I would be on the safe side. I would mute. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. So thank you, everybody. We'll be back here at quarter to two. Thank you.
OK, we're now live. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back and welcome to everybody who's watching this. This is the Planning Committee of South Cambridgeshire District Council. We are resuming after a short break um, over the lunch period with agenda item seven, which is um, for 95 Panelled Road, Water Beach. I'm just going to do a quick roll call of the members of the Planning Committee to ensure that we're all here and present. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Present, Chair. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Present. Councillor Dr Martin Kahn. Present. Councillor Peter Fain. Present. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. Present. Councillor Judith Rippeth. Present. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Present Chairman. Councillor Heather Williams. Present Chairman. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Present. Councillor Nick Wright. Hello. Hello. Thank you, everybody. And we're resuming. And as you all remember, um, we were waiting to have clarification regarding whether or not the internal drainage boards are statutory consultees, whether they were consulted and also whether the correct one was consulted and what implications are there for the planning process if they weren't consulted. Um, is it Alice or Chris who's going to give us a response on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll respond to that. Thank you. Thank um, you. <laughs> Our colleagues have been looking up at this again up to the very last second, so I'm, I'm happy to advise that having interrogated the back office consultation system, the consultation was sent to the generic email address which covers both the Old West and Water Beach levels IDB. Uh, so whilst it lists only the Old West on the website, I'm afraid that is slightly misleading in that it was sent to both, uh, uh, the email address that covers both, um, but no consultation response has been received. So the correct consultation has been undertaken, I can confirm. Thank you. OK, and um, we also um, wanted to know in terms of the wording of a proposed motion by Councillor Anna Bradnam in case um, the committee was minded to approve. Yes, Chair, thank you. Uh, this is the amendment condition, recommended condition 18. Um, I see no issue with the amendment as proposed by Councillor Braddon, should, should members wish to support that. Thank you. And this is around the maintenance um, management of that said ditch. That's correct. Councillor Braddon, would you like to move that motion? Yes, thank you, Chair. So uh, I have not, um, not predetermining my decision, but certainly I would like to propose that condition 18 should uh, include um, wording. Would you like me to read it or would you like me to? I'll read it. So condition 18 should now read, no development shall take place until a scheme for the disposal of surface water and foul drainage, comma, including ongoing maintenance of the piped ditch along the, sorry, Chris can say the right word, the frontage of this curtilage, that can be maintained for the lifetime of the development has been submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. Right, so I can see I'm looking at um, condition 18 and it's it's inserted within there, so we understand um, the spirit and essence of what you're saying. Would Thank anybody you. like to second that proposal? I'll second it, Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. So this is in the event that when we come to the vote around that, if it were committee were minded to approve, it would be with this condition. So could I now, um, is there anybody that would, can I take this by affirmation? I'll say that. Would, can we take this condition by affirmation that if committee were minded um, in terms of voting to approve this, that this condition would be added? Agreed. Agreed. Is there anybody against? Anybody abstaining? Thank you. So we, we have approved that condition. Thank and, you very much. And well, now, I'm happy that the officers tidy up that rather clumsy yes. one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. We'll go back to the, the main debate now on the merits of the application itself. Vice Chair, do we have anybody ready to open the debate? I'm muting. Um, no one I can see as of yet, Chairman, but I'm sure someone will pop up in a second. Or maybe not. Or somebody would like to propose a motion. 
Oh, we have a couple Would I go now, straight chair. to the voting on this one? We have a couple of speakers requesting now, Chair. Thank you. Starting with Councillor Bradnam. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Bradnam. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I want to point out that I have. I accept the point that the um, officers and indeed the manner in which we've been advised about the environs in which this planning application finds itself. Uh, the surrounding area has changed around it and uh, I am satisfied that that has covered the concerns that people had about whether this was actually going to be planning as it were in the countryside, which I don't feel it is anymore. Uh, the the advice, the, the comparator of the appeal next door, I think that has convinced me. However, for myself, I feel that five dwellings on this plot represents an overdevelopment of a plot which and, and the building out of that means that those have to go very close to the boundary and I feel that's inappropriate. So um, I'm very glad that you've accepted the condition should the committee um, wish to approve this application, but I am minded to vote against this. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair, who do we have? We also uh, waiting to hear Councillor Judith Riff as a local member at the end of the debate, but I see we, we have some other speakers who have requested. We do. The next one being Councillor Wright. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Bradnam, sorry, Councillor Wright, can you turn your camera off, Councillor Bradnam? Thank sorry, you. Chairman, it's showing us off on my screen. I don't know why it isn't off. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm, I'm minded to refuse this application. And from what I've heard from the Parish Council and local member, um, I'm not happy that there's trees being removed without, um, uh, you know, two quality trees that, you know, with give good planning and good good eyesight could be saved on the scheme. There's only two Class A trees, you know, there's there's ways of saving those. Um, so that comes down to poor layout, I think, of what's proposed, and. Not only does the poor layout damage the trees, it damages the neighbour's amenity from what we've heard as well. So um, now I appreciate without a visit to the site, this is very difficult to judge. Uh, and the neighbour has made some clear points from what he sees and uh, how it damages his amenity. Um, we've not heard the distance it is actually from that neighbour's home, from the planning officer which would you know, give us some idea of you know, how damaging to his amenity it is. But it gives the impression that the, the houses on there are shoehorned onto the site, um, which also concerns me. So poor layout and design, not saving trees and damaging neighbours amenity. I'm concerned about H19 and that. I'm not sure we've interpreted that correctly and it, it's I appreciate it's not a farmhouse, although on the previous history it does call the house a farmhouse rather than uh, a farm workers house. Um, so I'm not quite sure there how that goes, but even as a farm workers house, it still has that tie to agriculture. And in this day and age, there is a big demand for any houses where small holdings can be built uh, and you know with the acreage that's there around this house it is an ideal small holding for somebody in that area and there are others in water beach in that area as well it would make an excellent small holding uh, for uh, still to sustain agricultural use so i don't think till the proper procedures have been followed to remove the agricultural tenancy, the agricultural uh, holding, 
the tie on it that we should proceed with this development at all. Uh, you know, we lay out, if you don't follow the correct process, you lay yourself open to challenge all the way through. So, you know, we, we haven't had legal advice on that. We've had planning officers' opinions, which isn't the same. Uh, and I think we need to look particularly at this being advertised for the 12 months to give people who are looking for small holdings and we know there are more and more uh, to have the opportunity of purchasing this as an uncultural development at a fair price because that's what it is as it stands at the moment. Um, so, you know, I am minded to refuse that with those reasons and uh, I'd be interested to hear what the other local member and other members say. Thank you, Councillor Wright. And what, what I'll do is I, um, and bear with me as I'm learning my chair role as well on this one, but um, as I understand, sort of scale and layout would be part for reserve matters, but what I'm hearing from you, it's definitely around the principle of development, visual amenity and the agricultural occupancy conditions are the reasons that you're, you are putting there. That That's correct. Thank you. Vice Chair, who do we have chair. next? We have some more speakers, but Chris Carter would like to come in. I think it's pretty prudent mm -hmm. to let him speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to clarify one point and before um, the debate moves on too far, um, this is an outline application uh, with the matters of, of layout, scale, et cetera, reserved. So we, we don't know uh, that the impact as uh, on the neighbours would be um, what they're concerned it may be. Um, it's an indicative layout that's been provided and I think as the applicant indicated there is the potential for alternative house types to be proposed at reserve matters stage. If uh, an outline permission was granted it would be the reserve matters stage where concerns around the scale layout etc um, should be correctly raised. So I just wanted to be clear with members that in my opinion um, to refuse this outline application based on an indicative layout would not be a sustainable position for, for the council to take. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. So that kind of kind of confirms what I was saying there. But I, I think as therefore what I heard from, for example, from Councillor Wright were the issues around principle of development, visual immunity and the agricultural occupancy conditions, but not the issues of um, layout and um, scale or appearance. Yeah. Thank you. Who do we have next? Chair, we're back to Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I read the um, the officer's report on this and listened to the presentation um, very closely because I really wasn't sure um, how I felt about this and, 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 and which way I would go. So I've listened to all the arguments and read the documents quite carefully. Um, I, I am concerned about overdevelopment. Um, we, we, we're just densifying areas more and more with these kinds of um, applications. So I, I, I do worry about overdevelopment of this plot for five homes um, through in whatever um, configuration they're eventually brought forward. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, overdevelopment is a key concern for me. I I would echo what Councillor Wright said about H19 as well. I'm not at all convinced that that's actually being followed. H194 talks about the relaxation of an occupancy condition. It's not about a new condition. It's presupposing a condition is already in place and it sets out three um, criteria for when um, a condition should be relaxed. and Clearly, one of those hasn't been met, and that, that's about the property um, being marketed for four months. Now, taking the logic that demolishing the property would mean <clears throat> that the original condition would lapse, then essentially what we are doing in this application um, is deciding to relax a condition because we, we would grant a planning permission that would, in effect, override it. So I would see that as exactly the same as relaxing the condition because we would take an action which would mean it would no longer um exist um so on that basis i think um h194 is applicable um because as i say we'd be replacing a permission with a condition with a permission that doesn't have a condition so we would be effectively relaxing it um and i'm not content to do that because i don't think um those three points um in h194 have been met thank you thank you we have councillor hawkins next um thank you chair um i think for me i was i mean what uh, mr carter said earlier on um actually took away some of the things i was going to say because um it's outline 
and that's what we need to be looking at now. Um, everything else will be um, sorted at the reserve matter stages. The question is, is the principle of development um, uh, right or you know, allowable on this side? And bearing in mind the, uh, the appeal decision that we had in February, um, my feeling is yes, um, we would lose this if it went to appeal um, you know, on the basis that we turned off, we, we uh, refused an application for outline with everything else <laughs> reserved. So um, on that basis, uh, I will be leaning towards actually voting for this application. Thank you. So if I understand, Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins, what you're saying is in terms of the principle of development, you're accepting that significant weight of the appeal decision on a, on a similar site in the same area it means that you think there isn't a reason for um, refusing that principle of development. Uh, yes, that is correct. I yeah. mean, it's the, it's the site next door <laughs> and all our reasons of, you know, it's in the countryside, it's outside the framework, it's everything else has been debunked with, a, you know, a site right next door to it. So I don't see that that will stand up. Um, okay. It's an appeal. Thank you. Thank you. The Heather Williams is next, Chair. Thank you, Chairman. And um, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins, can you turn your camera off, please? Sorry. <laughs> so, um, I think I agree with much of what um, all colleagues have, have said. Um, however, I'm, I too am not, not satisfied that H19 um, isn't applicable. I, I feel that the demolition is almost an attempt to circumvent that, but I think when it comes down to it, that policy is in place and the criteria haven't been met. So I'm not comfortable with us making a, making a decision on that basis. Um, I think that on the principle of development, five houses on that site does seem it does seem excessive and, and overdevelopment. I'd agree with Councillor Bradnam and others about that. Um, in relation to the appeal, I can understand why that appeal decision would make members nervous, but, but every application is on its own merits, as we're, we're told time and time again. Um, and overdevelopment is something that we need to take particularly serious and the densification on an area that is already you know, seeing quite high development. Um, so I, I think we have to have the courage of our convictions and I think we have to do what we think is right and not not well not make a decision today based on fear of a, an appeal and in later dates I think that it's overdevelopment H19 does come into case and there is harm to the visual amenity and character due to the amount of housing that would then be put into that plot of plot of land um, and uh, it does need to be advertised thank you okay. thank you chairman thank you um, we have some other speakers, but the case officer Alice would like to come back in, so mm -hmm. we're better to take her next. Hi, um, thank you. I just wanted to come back on um, issues to do with density overdevelopment um, because I think it's really important um, that I emphasise again that the density of development, the quantum, is compliant with the local plan in terms of um, it's under 30 dwellings um, per hectare. So um, you could say that that's not overdevelopment, we can't call that overdevelopment, is that what you're saying? In, in my professional opinion, I would not say that it is overdevelopment of the site, considering that it is below what is required of stated in the local plan. Um, whilst this is outside of the framework, um, as I said in my preceding presentation, um, we have used that as a guide to, um, given the site constraints and, and the site context, as a guide to suggest that it's not overdevelopment of the site. So not overdevelopment within the density within the um, planning application, but it's also been considered that if you don't take that context and the significant weight of the appeal decision, people are saying just having another development, another application, another development in that area for them is outside the development framework 
is overdevelopment. That's what they're saying. So they're challenging the principle of development. OK, so yes. OK. Yep. Fine. Thank you. Uh, we have next, please. Councillor Fane. Chairman, I'm very influenced by what Councillor Hawkins was just saying in relation to <coughs> an appeal on the next door site. Whilst it might appear that the circumstances are very similar, there are some significant differences. Um, if we talk about the objections which are being proposed now, those are not in relation to policy S7, which was the one which the inspector was looking closely at in that case. Furthermore, the inspector drew attention to the advantages of affordable housing on that site, whereas in this case we're seeing a site with no proposed affordable housing on what would otherwise be considered to be an exception site. I'm not convinced by what was said earlier that sufficient consideration has been given to treating this site as an exception site. I accept that it may be appropriate to remove the agricultural occupancy tie, but that should be done in the right way, not by giving consent to demolish the property and making it redundant. Um, and I don't think the proper procedures have been followed for that. So I am inclined to say we should refuse this application. Thank you. Speaker is Councillor Khan. Councillor Khan. <coughs> I've also listened to what the various people have, have said. I've also listened to what Councillor Hawkins has said. Uh, I, I tend to sympathise more with Councillor Hawkins. I, I view the site now as de facto an urbanised area. And whatever the uh, location about the, uh, the development perimeter, I, I, I think we have to treat this as an urban area. And having a house which is limited to agricultural use in an urbanised area, right in the middle of an urban area, seems to me um, inappropriate. And I think that if any appeal, the uh, inspector would uh, just waive the condition or, uh, by de facto the situation that you find on the ground rather than upon policy. And I think it's an overriding factor on policy. So I'm not worried about the agricultural condition. In terms of the density of development, I had another look at the aerial photograph, which was shown up uh, in one of the uh, slides, uh, and looking at it in a, taking a different um, uh, 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 alignment and with different uh, perhaps with different types of housing, I th I'm pretty sure that you could uh, minimise any 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 uh, impact on adjoining on the adjoining settlement. So I don't I don't, and it's within the uh, the, the prescribed density. Um, so I do think the fact that the experience on the adjoining site. Um, is relevant. The fact that one couldn't impose um, the new uh, affordable housing on this site, I'm afraid, is not our choice. It's, it's, it's imposed upon us and therefore we have to work within the framework that we're within. Uh, and while it might be desirable, I don't see that we could insist upon an exception site on, on, on a site which, by the president of the previous site uh, application, now will be considered an urbanised and developed area. So I, I'm afraid I, I would uh, support uh, and approve of it, uh, vote to approve this application. Thank you. And I, I think, think it would be, do we have any other speakers or we could move to the local member? It's just the local member left here. Ah, OK. Thank you, I timed that correctly. <laughs> I'm guessing how many more people there would be. Um, I find this really, really difficult because when I first joined the planning committee, we were told, you know, it's really pointed out to us to um, view every application on its merits and really focus in on that. But in this case, we have been told to put significant weight from the appeal um, which we lost on the site that is next door. So we we can't avoid that we can't sort of step away from it um and on balance having heard like every um representative and the whole debate i really do think that any concerns that i have can only be addressed at the reserve matter stage so i'm not going to go on for ages because you know everyone else has made the points the dwellings per hectare, although you look at the site and you think, how do those fit in? You, 
they can they can fit into the site and um we we can't say it's over development of the site because it isn't anywhere near the um the percentage that's um would, wouldn't be um allowed so i will be voting to approve okay thank you um and vice chair if there aren't any more i think what we'll do now is is move to a vote and i think there are very different opinions that i've heard in terms of where people are leaning on this so i will do a roll call um and this would then be on page 107 oh sorry chris Sorry, Chair, um, just before you, you do get to a vote, I, I just wanted to be clear, obviously, if the committee is voting to refuse ah. uh, the reasons why. Um, so I've heard, obviously, discussion about um, the agricultural tie and I've drafted some wording in respect of that. Beyond that, I think I need a bit more guidance if there are additional reasons that um, some members may wish to cite. Uh, yes, I think what I, I heard and, and we can hear back from others. So. I think we have principle of development is um, a consideration and I think we've had several that have questioned the principle of development. Right. And also the visual amenity. Those are that's what I've heard. So the, the tie, the agricultural occupancy condition and the tie, the principle of development and visual amenity are, are the ones that I and also the housing provision. Councillor Peter Fain, um, I think was, his point was around the housing provision. OK, is, is, would you mind if I just commented on those? Yes. For a moment? Um, so uh, as we've just heard from Councillor Ripworth, and uh, it would have to be my advice that to, to refuse on the principle, having regard to the very recent appeal decision on the site next door um, would be um, would be uh, um, at risk uh, and likely to be overturned at appeal. In terms of visual impact, um, given we're outlined, I think I'd need to understand a bit more about what the visual impact is that is unacceptable to some members. Um, and then Councillor Fain's point, I think I understand, which is in relation to the site not coming forward as an exception site. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's anything other members may wish to add to those points, please. Vice Chair, does anybody want to add to those? Yes, uh, Councillor Heather Williams would like to expand on the reasons for refusal. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just think one thing that's not been picked up, and um, I'm sure I've heard other members say it as well, is that we're talking about the harm from this development. So what we're saying is the five houses on that, the harm that that creates is on, on the visual amenity of the area, given the quantity of housing that are being proposed, and that due to the lack of affordable housing, and the fact that this is a departure application, that the harm is not outweighed by the benefit. So if there was affordable housing, as was in the appeal application that we lost, then there could be an argument of, of the harm being outweighed by the need for affordable housing. However, this is not the case in this application. So I think it's very, we need to be very clear why this is different to the appeal um, application and that I think is a very large large part of it that um, it is only harm there is no benefit. Uh, Chair we also have Councillor Bradnam asking to speak. Mm -hmm. Thank you Chair and um, my request to speak was purely because um, the case officer has asked to speak and I, I didn't know whether you had seen that that was all. Oh, okay. I think that's an old request. Um, I know it, it was it was just before um, Councillor Williams, Councillor Heather Williams. Sorry, I'll leave it to you to decide. Yeah, it's been picked up. Thank you. Stephen Reid would like to speak then. Thank you. Claire, if I may. Yes, Stephen Reid. Um, reference has been made to the affordable element on the adjoining site. Uh, the adjoining site was not brought forward as an exception site. It was only brought forward with 40% affordable housing. And I think that's something that members 
could be mindful of. So we're under the threshold here. Yes, uh, members may decide that that uh, all or some of the five dwellings should be affordable, but I just wanted to highlight that the appeal site next door was not brought forward as an exception site. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephen Reed, for that. And basically so what you're saying therefore also is in terms of the numbers, this is under the threshold where we, we could oblige and therefore use that as a reason for refusal, if that's what I'm understanding. Chris, I see you are. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so just to come back on the um, the reason uh, that Councillor Heather Williams was expanding upon. So I've got that um, the applicants failed to satisfy that the harm created by the additional five hazards uh, site has been adequately mitigated. But what I don't, what I need to understand is, and I'm not trying to be difficult here, uh, what is the harm that members are identifying of these five dwellings? Um, is it a, a visual? What's the visual impact harm that these five dwellings might create? Bearing in mind that this is an outline application with those matters reserved. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Heather Williams. I think we refer to the visual immediacy because there will be the street scene is sometimes referred to, um, and that break. And also, it's a departure application. And we can't we can't forget that or ignore it just because of the appeal next door. And I know it was 40 percent affordable housing. It was an exception site, but that's still more affordable housing. And this offers nothing to the residents um, and it's a departure application. And surely in that case, it's important that that the harm is mitigated and we manage to outweigh that. That is our policy, is it not? Chair, if I may, through you, and um, obviously it's, it's my role to to um, e explain the risks to the committee. So um, I will just quote from the inspector's appeal decision with regard to the cost application on the site next door, uh, where the inspector says that the council failed to consider the layout and appearance of recent housing nearby and failed to have regard to the scheme's overall appearance in this context. So that's why I'm asking um, if we can try and identify what the visual harm is um, that may be uh, resulting from this proposal that that's that's the reason I'm laboring that point just because um you yeah, know that's clearly a, an issue that was identified by the inspector next door notwithstanding that that was of course a separate site but in that case with your permission chairman I suggest it's a significant change to the street scene it's developing land that currently has a, a rural nature to it and is, is of agricultural use um and that in itself is harmful to the to the character of the street scene um, and Water Beach is a village. It's not a town. We have the new town coming up the road, but it is a village. It is not urban. And the, that character with the new town coming is even more so important, I think, to the residents of Water Beach. And we should take that into consideration. OK, thank you. Um, and so obviously we're, we're back to move into the, the vote members. And just as chair, you know, I think this is a difficult one, I think, as Several have pointed out this is in terms of having a, you know, everything's taken on its merit, but this one we do have, um, and often we're sort of said, consider if this, you know, what, what would happen, what are the implications of a decision? And we're thinking now about the implications of a decision. And the case officer has shown us that this, by virtue of the de decision from the inspector, the character of this area has changed both, she said, in terms of physically and functionally, and that was the inspector's opinion. And I've I've heard everything, and I think what's difficult in for me is that saying, you know, we don't want two wrongs make a right. So it was upon the fact we didn't have a five-year housing land supply that then laid laid med had some of the building. Um, we as a committee refused that application. Um, that came on an adjacent area, an area that was near to this, and that was defeated at appeal. And we we do have to take that quite seriously. And in that appeal decision, the inspector said that the character of this area has changed. And this is more now of a suburban, not urban, but sort of suburban um, outlook. In my, where I am minded um, to go with this is, 
because of those conditions, those um, this context, um, I'm finding it very, very hard to come up with reasons, therefore, for a for approval, although I'm disappointed um, with what's happening with the area, but I'm finding it very hard to find enough sufficient reasons for approval myself as a voting member of, of this. Um, Chris, did you want to speak again? Sorry, I just saw. Just very briefly, Chair, just so that members know what they're voting on. So I've got three reasons for refusal if members are minded to refuse. Um, one relates to the agricultural tie, then the lack of affordable housing as a rural exception site, and then thirdly, um, a reason around um, the visual harm uh, and change to the street scene uh, and the character of the village of Water Beach, um, as highlighted by Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. And what we're voting on, members, is on page 107 in our Bradman, report. Sorry, we, we have Councillor Bradnam wishes to speak on reasons for refusal as well. Councillor Bradnam. Thank you, Chairman. It was just um, the reasons uh, described by Chris Carter. I don't object. Uh, that's fine. But the, the specific point was that there's a potential for loss of light. Even even if those houses are put in the middle of the plot, there is a potential for loss of light for those properties to the east. So it was loss of loss of light to to um, what's the word? You're talking no, visual amenity. Well, no, it's loss of light to to visible rooms. But I appreciate but we, what we've got. Anna, is on, illustrative. On, on this one, I don't want to labour this point, but you know those are reserved matters. So I think yes, on yes. that one, um, I think we've heard from case officers that would be a reserved matter of. of okay. And you said you're happy with the three reasons that Chris has given. If you were minded to refuse. Yes, that's fine. With that, uh, members, I'll go to page 107, paragraph 137. So what the recommendation is that this is approved subject to the following conditions, plus the condition that we approved as committee members as well, which is about the maintenance and management of the ditch. Um, I'll now please, as I do a roll call, say this is to approve. So either you are for, Anna, can you turn your camera off, please, Councillor Bradnam? Sorry. This is... You answer for approval, against or abstain. Councillor Henry Batchelor. For. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Against. Councillor Dr Martin Khan. For. Councillor Peter Fain. For. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. For. Councillor Judith Rippeth. For. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Against. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Against. Councillor Nick Wright. Against. And myself, for. That's six, four and five against, which I think very much reflects um, the debate that we've just had. Quite a complex um, application. Thank you, everybody, for your time on that one. Members, we're now moving to agenda item eight in your agenda pack, um, page 255. This is for, sorry, Falmere, Foxton Mill Farm, Falmere Road. The proposal is for the construction of a single storey dwelling. The applicant is Mr. Timothy Poulson of Poulson Architecture. And the key, and this is a very interesting one for us, is the key material considerations, principle of development, character and appearance of the area, residential amenity, ecology, drainage and highways. Um, there was no site visit. It is a departure um, and a further extension of time is requested for the decision date. And this has been brought to the committee um, because Falmere Parish Council has requested that it comes to the committee. The presenting officer is Jane Roden, Senior Planning Officer. Jane, are you there? Hello, Chair. Hello, Jane. Hello. Thank you. Do you want to give a presentation there? Yes, I Thank do. Thank you. Uh, one second. Can you confirm that you can see my PowerPoint slides? Yes, can hear you perfectly and can see your slides. Perfect. 
So as part of a verbal update before I begin, uh, the determination date of the application, this should read the 28th of September 2020 and a further extension of time has been requested. Uh, the condition pollution control is to be removed. This is a duplication of pollution control water. Uh, the conditions implementation of energy strategy and water efficiency have also been duplicated in the list of conditions. It's suggested that the duplications are removed. Um, an email has been received from a resident who is not speaking at committee. Uh, they raise no new issues, um, but their comments are summarised that this applicant is a member of the DEP and the application should be considered by an independent panel. They also have concerns over the access to the site and the delivery of materials. OK, so here's my presentation. So this application is for the development of one dwelling at Mill Farm, Falmill Road. This application referred to planning committee by the parish council and uh, deferred by delegation panel on the 9th of March this year. The application is located in the countryside as it is outside the development frameworks as indicated on this map, which shows the closest development frameworks to this site. This constraints plan shows the proposed site. It's located to the south of three dwellings, which are Mill House, Mill Farm and Springfields. The RSPB SSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSSS
tree planting, wetland, grassland area, and a ditch for the link between the water feature and the dwelling. Because planning committee can't do the site visit, I've taken some videos of the site, uh, so you might need to bear with me for this one. So on all the videos, there's a plan on the right hand side. The star in the centre is where I was stood taking the video. The arrow is where I started and then the arrows show where I've panned round. So this first video shows the access track. It's facing south along the access track. This is towards the access. These are the properties that share the common boundary with the proposal site. That's the boundary to Springfields. These posts in the ground mark the dwelling, the first post of the outbuilding. And this would be the piazza in front of you and the dwelling to the rear. That tree in the middle is where the courtyard would be. I refer to that quite a lot through my videos. That's the boundary with the RSPB site. I'm panning round further to the western boundary. And then finishing back on the access track where I started. This next video I'm facing is with the boundary of Springfields. I'm st stood near the far corner of the site. This is facing the RSPB boundary. The RSPB boundary as you pan round. There's a tree showing the internal courtyard. This would be the piazza in front of you now and then the external outbuilding that centre of line of trees I was referred to later and then the continuation of the boundary with Springfields. This video is stood part way down the real ditch I mentioned a minute ago uh, facing northeast with the Springfields boundary in front of me. There's the courtyard tree just in front. Panning round, this is Springfield boundary. There's the RSPB boundary. Facing the western boundary. Around. And there's the continuation of the ditch behind me. It's towards the access. Towards the common boundary with the other properties. And that's the beginning. This video is facing the access. So this is the proposed access through this hedgerow, the Falmere Road. It's panning round to the common boundary. And then this is myself walking along the at the proposed access. Every so often facing the western boundary. Oh. It appears to pause then, sorry about that. I'm following those red arrows on the site plan. Stopping in a second at that second star. And then panning back round towards the development site in the background, Springfield boundaries. There's the common boundary in front and then back towards the access where I've just come from. This next video, I'm stood on the edge of the part of land that's not to be included in the site, facing towards the courtyard tree, which you can see in the middle there. 
says the RSP boundary in the distance. It's the western boundary. The access track would just be in front of me past those piles of logs. There's the access in the distance. These are the properties that share the common boundary with the development site. There's the centre line of trees and then the development site and the courtyard tree in the centre. So this video, I'm stood at the bottom of that centre line of trees facing the courtyard tree in the centre. It's the that's towards the southern boundary, the RSPB, and the western boundary, there's the access. There's towards the access through the hedge, you can see the cars just in the distance. And then background is the common boundary, and then back through the centre line of trees. Springfield's in the background. And back round to the beginning. This video I'm stood in the centre of the site with my back to that courtyard tree. I'm facing the centre of line of trees where I stood a second ago. The furthest point you can see the posts, they're the outbuilding, panning backwards and forwards. That's the outbuilding the energy centre. The part in between would be the piazza and the post closest would be the boundary of the dwelling. This is where all the rest of the living accommodations are going to be. And then walking around the tree in the centre, this is the boundary with Springfields. As you can see the moan area is the part is the proposed dwelling location, that's the boundary with the RSPB site. That's the western boundary in the background. And then background to the beginning. This video, I'm stood in the far southwestern corner of the site. It's facing towards the access. That's the western boundary. That's the centre line of trees that I stood at a moment ago. That's the southern boundary of the site. And then this is a view out of the corner of the site. It's looking out of the site. And then back round for the beginning again. This video, I'm stood at the centre, the bottom of the centre line of trees facing towards um, Mill Farm. There you can see the proposed dwelling with the tree in the middle. There's the RSPB site. This is the proposed access, the moan area. For the western boundary. There's the rest of the access going towards Family Road and then background. You can see the buildings in the common boundary and then background to the centre line of trees. And then my final video, I'm stood in the corner, the far southeastern corner of the site. This is the common boundary with Springfields. It's 
can see the courtyard tree in the centre. So I'm walking into the site. So you'll see the courtyard tree in the centre. And then in a second, I stop and turn around. Towards the boundary with Springfields. And then this is the view out of the corner of the site towards the RSPB site. There's the rest of the boundary with the RSPB site, I registered. And then background to the courtyard tree in the middle. So this is the area of hedge that's being proposed to removed from looking outside the site. This is looking east along Falmere Road and then west along Falmere Road. And then the key material considerations are in front of you as previously read out. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Jane. Vice Chair, do we have any questions for clarification of case officer? We do, Chair. We have three so far. Councillor Roberts is first up. Yeah, Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, Ms Rodens, can you um, give me the following information? Can you firstly tell me, um, they, can you agree that the um, drawings uh, show us um, Springfields and then also show us the other two dwellings, which is Mill Road, um, can you confirm that Springfields is actually under an agricultural reason and policy compliant in that it is a cattery in the open countryside and it is also a small farm? And can you also confirm that the other two buildings, one of which is uh, in the ownership of the applicant, um, were uh, put up to replace very small um, prefabricated houses when it was a pig? insemination area and can you also confirm that um, and I don't think you showed us maybe you could go back to the video there's no sign of where the stream is you didn't actually show us a stream uh, which is an important um, issue here as well um, and runs along the site so if you could show us um, somewhere on the video where actually that that is situated and could you confirm um, how far away um, in distance uh, the nearest um, other dwelling is there? Um, those things I like and also that due to how far away from the other present dwellings in that area it is, um, that actually there is no light pollution uh, whatsoever on this very um, still very wild country area. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. OK. So in regards to the site history of Springfield, I'd need to have a look at their site history to confirm if they are an agricultural holding and a cattery. I do believe they do. They are an agri agricultural holding. In regards of a cattery, I would have to look at their site history to confirm that. But I can come back to you on chair if you'd wish on that one. In regard to the replacement dwellings from Mill Hyde and um, no, sorry, Mill House and Mill Farm, um, again, I'd have to look at their site history to see how they were replaced and how they were given planning permission. Um, that might take a little bit longer. But I might, I can, would need to come back to you on that one, Chair, as well. I could save you on that, Jane. Both those are the correct situations. Springfield's uh, is a cattery and it is a farm and it's just had recently had a barn put up. It has sheep there and the other two dwellings were um, prefabricated, small prefabricated dwellings when it was they were the um, employees of the pig insemination unit. OK, would you like to me still check or are you happy with? If you're happy with your own answer, Deborah, I think I Okay. I'm happy, I'm happy, Jim, but I just wanted it to be made clear exactly okay. what we are talking about here. Okay, so yes. So rather than a clarification question, you're you're bringing new information, well, bringing some information to the members. So you, there are there are those two questions. 
um, distance to the nearest dwelling, and you mean beyond those dwellings that you just mentioned, Councillor Roberts? Um, no, I think to those dwellings that I've just mentioned, Chairman. Okay, um, I can start with the stream one first, if that helps. Mm -hmm. um, that was the next question. If I can share this slide again, sorry. I didn't take any videos as such of seeing, can you see that chair? Yes. I didn't take any videos of the streams itself. Um, it was a little bit tricky to take them to the top at the time, but the River Shep is the boundary to the northeast and the Gildan Brook is to the, the west of the site. Um, I will see if I have another, you might have to come back on me on that other one for a picture of it. Chairman, can I get Jane to say, um, can you confirm, um, Jane, that actually the, uh, the streams there are very close uh, up to the application yeah. site and where yeah. the dwelling would actually be? Yep, yeah. so okay. probably the best one would be this plan here. Can you see? Yes. Oh, it's where it's moved. So the best one would be this plan here. The blue lines are the streams to the, the, the eastern site and the west. And as you can see, the dwelling is the closest. It's this one at the top. OK, thank you very much. Did That's established. And in terms of the, the distance to dwelling, would you need to, have you got that? Okay. I'd need to measure that one. I'd need to come back onto that one in a second. Okay. That's all right. I can get measuring on that one now. OK, thank you very much. Is that OK, Councillor Roberts? If we continue with the other questions, meanwhile. Thank you very much, Chairman. Appreciate it. Thanks. We have Councillor Bradman next, Chair. Councillor Bradman. Sorry, I just had a telephone call just at the moment when my name was called. Um, it's supposed to be turned off, Anna. I can't, I can't turn it off. I don't have any okay. way about turning it off. Um, sorry, what I wanted to ask was, uh, yes, when we were panning round, the buildings in the distance, were they Paddlesworth, Mill Farm and um, Mill Hill? Oh, Yes, Mill House. Were, they, were those the ones that we could see? So in other words, was one of them Paddlesworth on the north side of the road? No. Thank yes, you very much. Was. That's what I wanted to clarify. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Next one, please. Yes. Next, Councillor Rippeth. Councillor Rippeth. Sorry, this isn't a question. It's just, um, are we supposed to, after four hours of the meeting, agree to carry on? Procedurally? Yes. OK, I was just I've just um, looking at my watch and realised with lunch and breaks, we were over four hours. That's all right. I was... Ian, are you with us? Ian Senior. Yep, I'm here. Yep. <laughs> so, so, so that is right. After four hours, you need to uh, uh, just vote to to continue. Yeah. Okay. Can I do that by affirmation, everybody? Agreed. Me. Agreed. 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 Anybody against? Okay. Thank you. Anybody is abstaining? Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ripperth. Um, next, next one. I'm going to. We were sort of hitting a, a slump. So um, yes. Next one, please, Vice Chair. It's Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I'm having a bit of trouble with my, my videos. Is it OK if I keep my video off? OK. Um, the stream keeps breaking up. Yeah, I just had a quick um, question about this issue of curtilage and mm -hmm. um, policy H15D, I think it is. Um, the, the report sort of asserts that it's not in the curtilage because a red line is drawn on, on the site, on the, on the application form. Um, I was wondering if we could just hear a little bit more about that, because that seems odd to me, because it seems that anybody could therefore say, something is not in the curtilage of their property by just submitting a, an application for, say, half their garden. So um, what, what is the basis for saying 
you know, the, 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 this site is not within the curtilage of, of, of the existing dwelling. Okay, um, so it's in the ownership of uh, the applicant site at the moment, which is in the blue line. Uh, we said it's not in the curtilage because it's not used as their consistent residential garden of the site. So the curtilage would be the most private part of your garden that you use con consistently. That's kind of the main approach that we take to curtilage. We would say quite rightly this bit's taken out. It's not used as a main residential garden at all times. It's just land either associated or in the ownership with the applicant site at the moment. Also because of the boundaries, we could say that it's not a residential curtilage. It's got quite clear defined boundaries, which is both the stream and the trees on either side. Um, Jane, we just lost you that little bit. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, we just got to the streams, um, bounded by the streams and the hedges. No problem. Everybody went glitchy then. That's fine. Um, so we would say that it's got its own clear defined boundaries as well through the streams and the trees. Mm -hmm. be where I ended there. OK, thank you. And okay, thank you. That's useful clarification. Thank you very much. And then Councillor Fain. Councillor Peter Fain. Well, that was very useful to have those videos. A lot of time and trouble put into that saved us perhaps doing a site visit, bearing in mind there's nothing on the site at the moment. Um, it does seem to me, however, that this one stands or falls principally on uh, 79E of the uh, NPPF. I wonder if I could ask the planning officer to put up that particular paragraph again. So we had a slide um, where you both, both policy H15 and um, 79E, you had them side by side. That's not a problem. Can you see that one? Yes. Okay. Maybe um, if you come, can you make it a bit bigger? It's a bit small for people yes, on the screen. So I'll try again. If I, if I unshare and share again, sorry, I might make it that's easier. That's fine. Is that better? Yes. Thank you. That's that's helpful. And if I'm right, that uh, the, the key question is whether this should be uh, allowed in in the countryside as an isolated home, uh, despite um, the local plan. If is it of exceptional quality? And our local plan policy H15 goes a little bit further than 79E, doesn't it? Um, it's slightly different in that respect. I'm just looking at the, you showed us a picture, presentation of what it might look like. And I believe that this building is to be coated in cork and steel. Um, and it's not a, a, a material I'm familiar with, but it's highly recommended by the look of it from the design enabling panel. I notice that the applicant refers to it being um, reminiscent of Dutch barns. Um, well, I would have a lot of Dutch barns in my ears. I've never seen one look quite so like Peter, it. do we have a this bit, bit debate issue? Or, uh, do we have a question for the officer? Sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it appropriate? Is, is the design enabling panel referring to this as being like a Dutch barn? Is this cladding material something that will last? So it would last. Um, it's a highly sustainable material. So um, from my understanding, it would come into the site pre-weathered. Um, it would be as it, that mottled effect to it as it comes in already. Um, in regards to the design of it, um, I believe Bonnie's on the call as well. She may be able to answer a few of your specific design questions if that's, if that's easier. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I'm happy with that reassurance as the, the, the impressions that you showed us are how it will continue to look often with wooden buildings. That's not the case. But on the design, the applicants do make something of the fact that it looks or suggest that it looks like a Dutch barn. I'm wondering where the where that impression comes from. I believe that's more to do with its, its colouring more than anything, more than the design of it. So this um, design is taken um, as you've seen through the progression um, from quite a, diff quite a few 
different stances really. Um, it's set low into the site, so I wouldn't say it's a Zam uh, Dutch barn due to its height, probably more to do with the colour of the material. Thank you. OK, thank you for that answer. That surprised me rather more, but there we are. OK, okay. thank you. Is that, no, is that uh, OK, Councillor Peter Fane? Yeah. So I was going to say there's no further speakers, but we've got Councillor Roberts who wants to come in again, please, Chair. Yes, Councillor Roberts. Many thanks, Chairman. Um, Chairman, could I ask, can we just go back to that um, policy um, statement that we've just had up again, please? Um, because I, I, I would like to point out something on that particular and ask the officer. As long as it's a question and not something that you want to tell people in debate, but yes. That's yes, Chairman. Can, can you see that one? Yes, I can. I can. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, no problem. Jane, um, on the left hand side in the pink block, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things it says that uh, this has to comply with is um, about significantly enhancing. And then nature and size of the site, the design of the dwelling is landscape and location of site are sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area and to wider views. In your opinion, would you say that this design uh, has um, would actually comply with that? Um, is it like in any shape or form um, the other um, dwellings in that area? Um, in simple, it isn't in design and forms as the other dwellings in the area, but that's kind of how we take a paragraph 79 house. These are the grand designed houses, if you want to take that approach on it, the Kevin MacLeod sort of houses. Um, as I said in my officer statement, they are, they can be considered my Marmite and they are very subjective. So we've taken the views of from the design enabling panel and our design colleagues as well as landscape officers to have their recommendations on whether there would be any impact on the landscape from this particular dwelling in this setting. Um, and it's been considered by all those three parties that there would be at the minimal harm um, subject to conditions, of course, on this site. Um, again, to you, Chairman. Um, Jane, I think you and I have only spoken once about uh, this application some weeks ago when I was just mm -hmm. sort of seeing how the, the thoughts process was going on. Um, and at that time, uh, my recall is that you said that this was um, a fine balance um, and that um, the uh, the position and the, alloc the, uh, the allocation and the style and the area and the um, unspoiltness were also a big factor um, in the decision making along with the views of basically the design panel. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, so every application is on a fine balance, especially considering this one, they mm -hmm. have to meet such a high standard and a high bar. That's why we asked our design enabling colleagues to comment on the application. That's why it went twice as well with additional information. OK, thank you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, and I'm keen for us to uh, move on to the other speakers that we have. Do we have any other clarification questions? We have one more chair from Councillor yeah. Khan. Uh, Councillor Roberts raised a lot of the points, but but I'm interested in this word exceptional um, and, and what it means. Uh, um, in terms of exceptional quality. Uh, you've taken the advice of the design panel. Um, how much uh, how much importance do you think needs to be put to the fact that, that people generally like it? And how much importance do you have, do you need to put to the fact that it, how it would be considered the same in 30 years time, um, it will be moved into a, a different uh, era? In other words, how do you accept what the meaning of exceptional is? It seems to me a very difficult thing to do. I can, I agree. Um, exceptional is exceptional at the time. Mm. Um, it's considered by the design enabling panel that at, at this moment in time, this building is exceptional. Um, of course, it has to meet the test with its uh, truly outstanding design, innovative, mm. innovative mm. and landscape qualities. Mm. Whether that may change, as you say, in 30 years time, 
something may come along and trump it. But at this moment in time, the design enabling panel and the other quantities on this say that it, it meets that standard. Thank you. Thank you, Kamsa Khan. Um, good. Well, now, thank you very much, Jane. And I understand that you're still um, just looking at the issues of distance. Is that OK, Councillor Roberts, if that continues to be looked for while we move on with the other public speakers? I'm very happy with that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Right. Um, and so I would now like to invite um, on behalf of the applicant, David Gretsch. Grech or Gretsch, are you with us? Uh, good afternoon. Yes. Um, and apologies. Sorry. How is your name? It's uh, David Greck. It's Greck. as if it's uh, C K, but it's C H. It's yep. uh, Maltese origin. And David, do you just want to um, introduce yourself before the three minutes start? Okay. Uh, yes. And my name is David Greck. I'm a qualified architect, and some of you may remember me from my time as this council's design and conservation officer when, uh, between 2003-2008. Uh, I subsequently worked for Historic England. And while I'm now retired, I still sit as vice chair on Cambridge City Council's design and conservation panel and um, often join the South Cambridgeshire design enabling panel. Uh, I therefore believe I'm quite well placed to talk about design issues. Um, but I must confirm that also, though, that I wasn't on the design enabling panel that considered this particular proposal. And do we have the applicant who is available, as I understand, to answer questions if, if it's needed? Is that right? Hello, hello, Mr. Pilson. Yes, so you're, so you're here and, and could answer questions if need be. I understand. Yes, I can. But your the three minutes will be taken by by David Gregg. They will. Right, thank you very much. You may start, David. OK, thank you. Um, the application before you is uh, for a new house that is to be considered under paragraph 79 of the government's national planning policy framework, which allows for new houses in the countryside where, and I quote, the design is of exceptional quality, reflecting the highest standards in architecture. A little while ago, Tim Paulson invited me to undertake an independent review of his proposal for Mill Hyde and to test whether I considered it to meet the criteria of paragraph 79 of the MPPF. In order to ensure my conclusions remained fully independent, I've not accepted any fee for this work. At the outset, I first needed to establish where the bar might be set on designs for this type of house. And I did that by reviewing a range of 20 different paragraph 79 houses that have been approved across East Anglia, including the only one currently approved in South Cambridgeshire. That particular scheme at Mines Farm was first allowed on appeal back in 2009, though the project has not yet been built. More recently, uh, there was another appeal decision for a paragraph 79 house in the Cotswolds. And again, I took a careful examination of that particular proposal. Through this work, that enabled me to establish a benchmark for the design excellence as required by paragraph 79. When I reviewed Mill Hyde against that benchmark, I concluded that it passed the bar and indeed was significantly superior to many of the other schemes that have been approved. So today you're being asked for your judgment on the design merits of this proposal. Assessing design excellence can be challenging. You're not being asked whether you like the scheme or whether you'd want to live in this house. I suggest you need to ask whether it displays a design integrity that is founded on a valid architectural concept that has then been developed through a rigorous process of examination and testing. The architectural concept behind this proposal is founded in the work of the Italian Renaissance architect, Andre Palladio, and in particular, his seminal design for the Villa Rotunda outside Vicenza. But this is not a neoclassical proposal. Instead, Palladio's ideas are developed in a striking contemporary manner and adapted to specifically relate to this site. I consider this to be a design of merit that would contribute positively to the quality of the built environment here in South Cambridgeshire. Furthermore, I believe it will be from designs such as these that in 30 years time, historic England will make its selection of buildings from the early part of the 20th century 
that are to be added to the national list of buildings of architectural or historic interest. I therefore commend it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for keeping within the time as well. Um, obviously very experienced at that. <laughs> Do we have any clarification questions yeah. for um, David Gregg? We have one from Councillor Roberts, Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again, Chairman. Um, hello, Mr. Gregg, and uh, I do remember you at South Cams. Hello. Hello. Um, long time no see. Um, yes, you, you talk about it being, um, in, in your opinion, a, you know, a, a, a fine new example in the built environment, but this isn't in the built environment, is it? This is out in the open countryside. Can you tell me what um, what considerations you took to that? Um, and obviously the policy is, is very pertinent and very careful um, because it's concerned about protecting the natural environment. And the, as been said on numerous occasions during the early discussions here, um, there was a talk about the, uh, the bar is set very high. Um, how can we be talking about it being, you know, part of the built environment when it clearly isn't? Uh, I think what I meant by the built environment is I, I actually said the, the quality of the built environment because it is a building and is adding to those range of buildings that exist in South Cambridgeshire. It's, it's, uh, it's not part of the urban environment, but it is a building that is part of the range of the suite of buildings, if you like, that, that exist across South or could exist across South Cambridgeshire. And those buildings can be in the rural area, it can be in the urban area. But uh, the point I was trying to make is that in 30 years time, uh, when one is looking to add uh, buildings to the list of the national buildings of, of architectural or historic interest, it is these type of buildings that will be being looked at um, rather than uh, the sort of more run of the mill, uh, if you like, uh, types of buildings that, that exist. Um, and when you, you know, in terms of, of, of the, um, the, the setting of the bar and things, uh, as I say, I, I looked at um, 20 different schemes that have been approved across a number of district councils um, plus ones approved at appeal. Um, and the appeal decision ones, I think, are, are particularly pertinent because obviously the planning inspectorate has, has uh, looked at it um, in, a, in, a, in a, a very forensic way, if you like. And when you, you see what the planning inspectors are saying about design and the issues and things that they're, they're talking about, um, I do believe this, this does meet that criteria. It's, it's a building that is uh, relatively modest in its scale. It's not tall, it's single storey. So it's um, the, the Cortan steelwork uh, is a hue and colour that actually, I believe, complements the natural environment. And I think it sits into its site, um, which will be um, uh, changed. I mean, the, the, you know, sort of it's, it's not the site is not going to be urbanised or anything, but it will it will evolve. And the way the building relates to the site, the use of the water, the rill, um, and the enhancement of the existing trees and things like that, will it, it, the, the site will be changed. But I think this building will sit in it and it will actually enhance the area. Thank you. Sorry, Chairman. I'm, I'm going to can I come back on a on a secondary then, Chairman, about that. I, I don't think actually my question was answered about how uh, about the other how much in, uh, interest you've taken in looking at the the area around about. But clearly, and you're talking about the uh, national policies, but the policy H stroke 15 is very specific, and it says that it should be uh, sensitive to the divining characteristics of the local area and to wider views. Do you, are you trying to say that this actually um, complies with that line? So I think Deborah, if you don't mind, I think I've, I've heard that he obviously does and the applicant does. And I think that's very much something for us to debate. And I would okay. love you to bring that to the debate because I'd enjoy debating that as well. Um, Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next question, Chair, is from Councillor Khan. Councillor Khan. So I was coming back to this term exceptional again, uh, and the scene and the point that Councillor Roberts was referring to about being sensitive to the surrounding setting. Um, when you looked at your other other appeal decisions, uh, I, mean, I mean, it seems to me there was a conflict, inherent conflict in being an exceptional building and being being similar to the buildings around it. Now, does that therefore mean sensitive, not mean similar? Does it, what, what exactly does it mean? When you looked at your other appeal decisions, did you find that the successful ones were more sensitive in the sense that they tended to mimic some of the buildings around them or were they exceptional in the sense that they were very different? How does, the, how does that fitting in come in? I mean, is, would you say that your fitting in is to the fact that it's sort of it's a palladium mountain and it's in the natural Can I just sort of, I don't think anywhere it says fitting in. So it says uh, sensitive to. You too, okay. <laughs> yes. Um, right. It, it's uh, obviously I haven't got slides of, of the 20 houses to show you. Um, but generally speaking, the, um, as the planning officer mentioned, these houses, uh, by their exceptional quality, is is makes them different to the buildings that are, are in proximity to them um, because otherwise they wouldn't be exceptional. Um, but I think they need to um, be aware of their site, they need to complement the site, they need to uh, fit in with their locality and I think this building does that. I say the, uh, the Corten steelwork, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically it, it's steel that that um, has been weathered, so it, it has a rust red colouring, and I'm sure you're you're all familiar with sort of barns and things that that exist across South Cambridgeshire that have um, corrugated iron that, that's gone rusty red and things. So it, it's that hue, that colouring that you, that you do see in the landscape that complements nature in terms of. The, the greens and the, the hues of, of nature, I think um, this material complements that in a way that, say, a uh, white painted rent or something would Thank contrast. You. Thank you, David. I think yeah. what, you, what you did was you actually answered the question around sensitive to and what that means in terms of exceptional and similar to. Thank you. Um, do we have another question? We do, from Councillor Fain. Councillor Fain. Thank you. You've answered uh, some of my questions in relation to the quality of the court end steel and the way that it will look in perhaps 30 years time. You referred to it being a single story building. I think there is a section that looks to me to be three stories. Um, that's as shown on one of the slides that may be for illustration purposes. Um, three stories. And I referred earlier to it being resonant with generations of agricultural buildings you've just dealt with that and the familiar farmyard Dutch barn. Um, would that be your impression of this building? Uh, right, well, uh, dealing with the scale, that is, um, as far as I'm concerned, that this the building is a single story building um, and uh, I don't think there's any any component of it that is more than a single story. So, um, but the the, the um, the relationship to Dutch barns, I think it's more, it's, it's not a, um, a, a direct, you know, sort of comparison with a Dutch barn. It is uh, one of, as I say, tonal quality of a Dutch barn, which has got a, a curved corrugated um, iron roof that has then uh, rusted over time, gives you that, that hue, that colour. And so can I can I just stop there because I think we're having a repetition. So I think Councillor Fain, the case officer mentioned it was more the colour and the tone of it, and we have just had an explanation of that particular colour and tone from um, yeah. David Gregg, and he's about to repeat the, the sort of Chairman, the, the description of the colour and tone. The uh, illustration that I'm referring to, submitted by the applicants, from slide 25 on Design Report Volume Four. Now, if it's been put there merely for illustration, it would be helpful if that had been explained, but it does seem to be three stories. That section. 
Thank you, Councillor Benson. But what we've heard is a single story. I've got somebody with a hand raised. I can't see. That's not the way to raise a hand. So I'm not. I'm sorry, Chair. My name is Bonnie Quack. I'm the urban designer. Hello, Bonnie. Yes, sorry, I didn't see. Um, Hello. Hello, Bonnie. Yes. You want to just introduce yourself, Bonnie? Yeah, my name is Bonnie Clark. I'm a principal urban designer and I commented on this application. Um, I just want to answer the question in relation to the three story element. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, in volume four of the DAS, that three story element is actually a precedent study of another bird hide. Um, so, it's not related to this application, it's just an example to show the quality of the 410 cladding, that's all. So it was used as an illustration of a different example and the height has nothing to do with this particular application. That's correct. Is that okay, Councillor Fain? Just the explanation I needed, thank you. Thank you very much. Good. As I understand it, that's all of the questions. Thank you very much, um, David. Okay, thank you. And I'll now invite, um, please, from the Parish Council, Councillor Steve Mulholland. Um, Councillor Mulholland has had to leave and he's asked me, this is Lawrence Schrag, the Chairman of the Council speaking, he's asked me to read his statement in his place. Can I ask if you have the full authority of the Parish Council? I do. I speak on behalf of and at the request of Fowling Parish Council. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for taking his place. And I'm sorry that the proceedings have taken this long, but it's meant that Councillor Stephen yeah. Holland couldn't um, continue with us. Your three minutes begin now. Thank you. Parish Council have significant concerns relating to this application that have not been given due weight in the officer's report. The specific intention of policy H15 was to prevent existing sites being divided up so as to permit the construction of additional dwellings in the open countryside. But this is exactly what this application is proposing. The site is registered with the land registry as part of Mill Farm and the application is proposing to construct a second dwelling within the site. The officer's report tries to argue that creating separate access and boundary treatments allows this to be treated as a separate site, but that is contrary to the policies adopted. The officer's report places significant weight on the conclusions of the design enabling panel, where the potential for conflict of interest is a serious concern. The applicant is a member of the panel, but this was not mentioned in the reports of most panel meetings, and it was only after it was highlighted by the Parish Council that a somewhat tokenistic statement was made in the final report. Members of the design panel are not elected and are not answerable to voters. For this reason, the Parish Council had suggested that it would be appropriate to the application to a neighbouring design panel which would have put the planning authority above reproach but this is not done leads to the unsatisfactory situation where officers are recommending approval whilst drawing heavily on the opinions of a panel of which the applicant is a member. Whilst the design enabling panel have commented on the quality of the design they actually drew no conclusions on whether it significantly enhances its immediate setting one of the requirements. The only assertions that this is the case are those made by the applicant and consequently no weight can be placed on them. Parish Council does not see how the construction of a large new building uncharacteristic to the local area and next to a site of special scientific interest enhances the setting and simply calling it a height do does not mitigate this. The tests required within policy H15 and the NPPF paragraph 79E deliberately set a high bar and we would argue that this application does not meet the requirements for a countryside dwelling of exceptional quality. Contrary to policy H15, the proposed dwelling would not significantly enhance its immediate setting. The design of the dwelling is not sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area, and there is an existing dwelling on the site capable of being replaced. In consequence, we ask members of the committee to uphold the adopted policies and to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for that. Um, 
I would, as chair, I will um, put forward the four members that in terms of design enabling panels, such a situation as this has been considered and any member of the design enabling panel has signed up um, to due protocol, which ensures that there isn't a conflict of interest. Um, and so that's something that we, you know, we, we must accept within within this. But we do hear, I think, very strongly from you, which is around the setting. You know, the understanding of the enhancement of the setting is one of the key issues that you are you are bringing forward in terms of your um, comments today and contributions. Thank you. Um, can I just check one thing um, logistically? Councillor Peter Fain momentarily lost connectivity, but you did hear the parish council presentation. Is that right, Councillor Fain? That's correct. I That's heard correct. the presentation. May have missed half a sentence in the middle. I think that that's, um, is fine. The, the, in terms of you continuing to be able to have the vote, thank you for letting us know. Do we have any other clarification questions? Councillor Bradnam, Chair. Councillor Bradnam. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to ask Mr Rag, um, when you say that there is already a building on the site. Are you referring to either Mill Farm or Mill House? Or are you referring to the triangular site in the red line? I don't have the um, the diagram in front of me. Perhaps. But within the curtilage, there, there are surely the existing buildings, isn't there? Well, not as far as I'm aware. That's why I asked the question. So to be clear, the triangular green site, let's call it that, the site with houses and uh, with um, trees and scrub on it that we saw the um, video imagery from Miss Rodens didn't appear to show any other building on the site. So I can only assume mm. that you're talking about the wider curtilage which includes either Mill House or Mill so Farm. Councillor Bradman, can I perhaps we just ask the um, police that? officer, because I understand, yeah. you know, it's very difficult for um, Mr Rag to answer that question specifically. Jane, thank you. Mill Farm and Mill House, shall I show you the slide? Would that be? Yes. The, yes. For the dwellings to the... Wait a second. I think... The so would it be these dwellings at the, the north? Sorry. Well, that's what I'm asking. Is is it that because those are within the same ownership, is that why Mr. Yes. Rag is saying that there is a, already a dwelling on the site? I think that's yes. the point the parish council wanted to make. Yeah. OK, right. I understand what you're saying now. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Rogers. No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, and but don't think we have any other questions. Mr. Rag, thank you very much for stepping up and stepping in. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll now go to, um, if you turn your camera off, please. Thank you. And local member, Councillor Deborah Roberts, would you like to speak now at the end? Um, I'd like to speak now and uh, follow the normal procedure and, and uh, at the end as well, please, Chairman, as, as uh, Heather Williams did earlier on today. Um, yes, it's an interesting one. Um, and I firstly would like to say that the other few dwellings in the area um, have actually been either replacement buildings or have got agricultural restrictions to them. Um, the mill farm uh, is clearly the ownership uh, in the ownership of the land that's in question today. And therefore, in my opinion, it is clearly within the curtilage of a, a, a building that is on site already. And um, the way forward would be, uh, if the applicant wished to have something different, would be to uh, demolish uh, that present residence that he has sure. uh, and replace it, because that's what happened before. There was, as I said, small prefabricated house there. Um, it got demolished and the uh, mill farm was built. So that would be uh, how you could actually um, satisfy the policies. However, there are things that we need really to think about here. This is a completely at present unspoiled area. It's very close to the RSPB reserve. It's right next to the site of special scientific interest. It's right 
uh, adjacent next to uh, two important streams, very close to important streams, it's still completely unspoiled. And, and round here, round Falmere, and unfortunately all over South Cairns, we have very few of these areas left. And we as a council have the double greening up policy now because we know that we are in danger more and more as the years go by of losing these sites. And I think our intention absolutely, absolutely spot on has been to try to actually uh, protect them uh, and that we've put these things within the, the policies. Just, we've got stick all sorts of stuff over there, greenhouses. Excuse we? me, I, we have somebody who is should have their microphone turned off. Thank you very much. Is it you? Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Roberts, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. That quite flummoxed me for a moment. But the policy um, of H15, um, our own policy, it is, is quite right. And it talks about desire, if, if it was to be allowed, it would have to be sensitive. And I, I actually don't think that particularly has to just be about the design. I think it has to be sensitive. Is, is it right to put something like this um, into a very unspoiled, uh, wild, um, undisturbed area? And I think that I, I'm going to ask colleagues to really think about that because this site has no light pollution, it has no noise pollution, it has no building uh, at that particular area, though, as I've said, it has another site already, another dwelling on that site, so it's not compliant. Um, but in that area, I can tell you the, the deer, the deer herds, that's one of their rutting areas. There are badgers um, all over that area. Um, there are brown trout in that stream. There are all sorts of butterflies and invertebrates and, and all sorts of wildlife um, that that area is extremely important to. And I think that we really have to say um, that this is not sensitive to any of that. It's described within the pages of being a monolithic type building. Well, if we are talking about local designs, we're not living um, on Salisbury Plain with Stonehenge. Um, so, you know, this idea of this monolithic style building is completely alien. Um, it's like a spaceship would have landed on here. And we have to protect these places. This gentleman could build this anywhere in South Cairns within within a, an envelope where it would be seen and might be admired. Um, he could do that anywhere. There's lots of land that is um, presently being considered for the new local plan. Um, he could build it. Deborah Roberts, I'm going to ask, we're looking at the application, not the applicant. Yes. So if we focus then on what I'm understanding from you is definitely, again, it's about whether or not this is sensitive to and enhances the setting. So we can hear very strongly that that is not in your yeah. regard. If I can, yes, I, I'm sorry, Chairman. Yes, I, I, I take absolutely on board what you've just said. But but the thing is here that um, and we're looking at if, this particular one. Yeah, yeah, this particular yeah. but this this particular design could go anywhere. But is it right to put it in such a natural, unspoiled, rural place, right. um, which is really important? Um, and it seems to me that um, as a as a planning authority, we have every day we have to make decisions about planning applications, which don't run up against this problem, but this problem is something that we we must focus upon. The problem of the loss of these sort of places which we are trying so hard to avoid. And um, I, I very much hope that my colleagues um, will think upon these things. Um, I see no, uh, no way that this can be validated as as being a, a good application, a correct application, a within policies application. But I'll speak again at the end, if I may, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Sir Rose.
Um, so we're moving into the debate members. Um, and we've we've had a lot, and this is a this is I think really a good test, and it's right that it comes here into committee. It's a good test for us in terms of a policy that in my time we haven't had to look at. Which the only reason that this could be given planning application is because of those two policies that say it's exceptional and outstanding. On page two five seven at the bottom and page two five eight, just as we had um, with the case officer's slide. We do have the um, explanation of policy 79E and policy H15 A, B, C and D. And basically, whatever we decide has to show that we are, we are convinced that this does meet all of those. It has to meet all four A, B, C and D of policy H15, not just one or two, but all four of them. And it must meet in full 79E. And they're, they're similar, but they have sort of slightly different um, sort of emphasis, I think, between the two of those. So ready now to open the debate. Vice Chair. We have Councillor Wright first up. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this, uh, I agree with you. This is a really interesting application. And when I looked at it to start with, looking at the plan from above, I thought, ah, oh, Roman Villa. And seeing the pictures of it from the side, you could not, you know, unfortunately, it does not have the grace and the beauty that we associate with Roman villas, villas because of the lack of pitch roofs and everything else. Um, and I thought, oh, I was sort of pretty, pretty doubtful about what I saw. And, you know, its, it's suitability in its real setting. However, you know, I am but a I am worse than a tin pot expert when it comes to design. And I really do value the opinions of David Gretsch, who uh, not only is an outstanding artist in his own right, but also uh, was an outstanding officer for our council and greatly missed. Can you come back, please, David? <laughs> uh, so his opinion uh, sort of independently given that it is a building of quality. You know, I I accept that. Um, and, you know, to other councillors that didn't know David, uh, you know, he has, you know, a very good reputation and uh, a very good eye for this sort of development. However, there is weight in what Councillor Roberts also says in, you know, this may be an outstanding building, but is it in the right place? You know, where it sits is a, um, at the moment is a sort of a, a green lung between the present housing and the SSIs. And, you know, for that to be picked up as a planning objection, we would need the support of, you know, our college officer, uh, Natural England and the RSPB. Unfortunately, they, from my reading of their comments, they do not raise an objection that we can latch on to um, as a reason for refusal, as a material reason for refusal. So they leave us, you know, with a very subjective decision of our own policy um, without lacking that, um, that, that definite uh, reason for a refusal that we could latch on to with an objection from the ecologists. They all raise concerns, but they don't say that, you know, there are grounds there for a refusal, acknowledging there's nature on the site. You know, it's a lovely wetland site and is a green lung. So, you know, I'm I'm going to be really interested to listen to what other members say, and uh, I look forward to that in the debate. Thank you. Thank you. We have Councillor Khan next, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Khan. I've been tossing and turning around decision making on this. It's uh, as Councillor, I very uh, eloquently put the, uh, the, the the discussion and the issues uh, involved in this. Um, uh, and uh, I uh, also Councillor Roberts uh, raised the issue about this, uh, the area which is be where it's being built. However, I found the also I found that Mr. Grech's uh, presentation very illuminating. I found it very helpful. 
Uh, I was particularly taken by his reference to the Palladian influence. Uh, 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 and putting a building with Palladian influence in, in arable farmland, um, which is perhaps the alternative if it's not going to be an interesting site, would, uh, would mean nothing, it would have nothing. Palladian buildings are a bad setting. Um, uh, and in a sense, I can see that that makes sense for it being in the setting where it is. Um, the building, I'm not sure whether I like it, but it's interesting. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on, the, the, the test is, uh, in a sense, the test is, would it be a, an, a building of architect, uh, listed building in 30 years time, uh, which or 30 or 40 years time, which is when modern buildings are listed. Uh, and is it exceptional enough to be considered worth uh, protecting? And I'm pretty sure it would. It is really unusual. Um, it, it's, 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 it has a, a theme and an interest uh, and the setting, is, it would be rather, really very nice. So it comes back to the worry about the sensitivity of the site uh, uh, whether it needs protecting. It's been located on the driest part of that site, uh, which appears that at least from what we can see to have the least uh, biological interest. Uh, so it's been well set. Um, the, the fear is that the rest of the site might be more intensified uh, 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 and there might be pressure on it. Uh, and that, I think, um, is probably can be determined by condition. And it may be that we need to look in terms of Article uh, Section 106 protect, to protect the remaining areas of the site and to uh, ensure that they're properly enhanced. And if that is covered there, uh, then that, that that term doesn't come. In terms of the curtilage, I, I just don't buy this idea that it's all part of one curtilage. You've got a, you've got a river between the, the house and the site. That That's a pretty divide, a big division. Um, I see them as two separate curtilages and I, I, I don't I don't follow this um, this argument at all. Um, so I think people will be coming to look at this in 30 years time. That's the question as an example that they want to see. And that to me is a pretty good test of whether it's exceptional. So I think in f I'm coming around to the idea that I would support this. Um, and it's been difficult. And I think it's very important that it came to committee. Thank you. Next speaker chair is yourself. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, I think as others, I've really looked at how we weigh this, but I also have sort of set the bar high for myself in terms of it having to meet everything, 79E and A, B, C and D of policy H15. And I have heard um, about, and, and I'm like Councillor Wright, I think, that I wouldn't be able to say um, if something was outstanding in terms of design. And I'm not going to apply any subjective um, opinions on that. I would listen to our design enabling panel um, upon that. However, what I do when I read the report is I do not find, um, because 79E says, it doesn't just say respect, retain and enhance, or perhaps as Councillor Martin Khan has just said, now with a condition mitigate the um, enhancement of the setting. It says this is where it would be outstanding. It would significantly enhance its immediate setting and be sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area, which include significant, we have very few of them in South Cambridgeshire, which are designated protected sites. And I was very disappointed to see that in terms of all of the consultees, and, and I'm a bit different from Councillor Wright in this, it's not about having reasons for refusal. If this is about significantly enhancing the setting and being sensitive to that wider location, there would have been um, agreements already with Natural England, with the Triple SI site and RSPB. What they're saying is we very much like to be involved in any decision making in the future. And to me, that would have had to be to so how do we live together with nature? If you're going to have some kind of building in this, it can be amazingly outstanding, exceptional, innovative in its design of the building, the dwelling. But the second test there about how it fits into the setting I'm not convinced that it significantly enhances. The report says it respects, retains and enhances. It doesn't say, um, for me, doesn't convince me yet that it significantly enhances. Um, and in terms of the, the energy, it does, there is innovation in terms of the nano grid that is being put there. Um, but I haven't been convinced in terms of significantly and that they've actually ensured that the grid would enable this. So the, the condition that is in there is if it turns out that the grid cannot um, support what is being proposed 
um, then there is almost a sort of a get out clause. And that's where I'd like to see something outstanding in South Cams is where the solution is put before us of how we actually do overcome grid capacity constraints um, with our energy efficiency. So those are those are kind of where I am at at the moment. Next speaker chairs, Councillor Fain. Councillor Peter Fain. Chair, it uh, may be apparent to uh, members of the committee from my previous questions that I am a little sceptical as to whether this meets the very high bar that has been described here. Um, however, in that regard, I was very reassured by the entirely objective assessment of David Grech in this matter uh, and his assessment, which is, of course, backed by the urban design officer um, who says quite clearly design is considered to be of exceptional quality. He may be referring to the views of the design enabling panel is truly outstanding and would reflect the highest standards in architecture. Um, in some respects, I'm, if you like, disappointed in that in terms of sustainability, I don't see as much as I would have liked to see on that, but that is not the criteria on which this is being judged. And when we look at those criteria, I have to say that it does seem to me to be exceptional. I'm not sure whether all of those criteria have yet been satisfied, as you said, Chair, in relation to our own criteria. So the question might be whether it is ready for approval yet before we have the assessment of its ability to enhance the area. But I think I'm moving towards a position where I would say that, um, yes, I am persuaded that despite my personal views on the, uh, the design, it does meet the criteria and that it would be good to have a uh, paragraph 79 house actually constructed within South Cambridgeshire rather than merely one approved on appeal. Um, and that this maybe is the uh, is the one that, it, as Councillor Khan said, in 30 years time, we will certainly still be looking at this one and probably admiring it. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams is next. Thank you. Um, I do find this this application particularly difficult for many of the reasons that others have mentioned, but because when we're talking about words like exceptional, it's very subjective. It's it's not clear that there's a lot of um, grey to negotiate in it. And what what uh, one person sees as beautiful is is not what another does and what one person sees as exceptional is, is not. But if I look more towards page 272 with the policies and, and paragraph 79, Again, it is it is a matter of personal judgment, I think this one, but I don't see how putting this building in place enhances its setting um, and the character of the local area. So I'm very much minded to to refuse if um, but I will listen to others, but I, I, I can't say personally that the design I do think is exceptional. I think it's I think it's good. I think it's better than some, but to go to exceptional, you, you have to really go far. Um, I'm not sure if it's quite gone far enough for myself on, on those grounds. And actually, I think I think Councillor Rag made a, a very good point in that um, the design enabling panel is is very helpful. It's it definitely helps us as members, um, but they aren't accountable. And, and we are. So when it, when it comes down to it, I think we have to be um, we have to be content ourselves. And and I'm not content that it's it's uh, it's exceptional enough. And I, I definitely don't think it enhances the setting and therefore doesn't comply. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, and Councillor Bradnam, Chair. Good. And I think then probably after that we would move to a. A vote, I think. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes. Sorry, sorry, Chairman. 
I'm sorry, Anna. Yes, you have to to, you speak obviously at the end. Councillor. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, sorry, Anna. It's all right, thank you. Um, yes, how interesting to see such an innovative design come through our planning committee. It's, it's quite refreshing to see a, a modern design. Um, and in terms of our wish for buildings to be sustainable, um, with the exception perhaps of the Wi-Fi <laughs> that Councillor Haylings mentioned uh, and the internet access and the power grid, I, I'm not sure about that, but in terms of the building itself, um, I'm, I have no doubt that this building is sustainable in that sense. But um, as Councillor Haylings has said, it needs to significantly enhance its immediate setting and be sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area. Um, and what I find about this application is it's undoubtedly a striking building and an innovative building, but sensitive to the defining area. I don't I see it turning its back and its sides on that field, uh, which is, you know, a, a, a rural area close to uh, a triple SI and the, the wild the wildlife reserve. Uh, and I just I find, uh, you know, the reference to monolithic. Um, it's not so much that for me, it's just that I find it it feels as if it's turning its back on the rest of that field of uh, that plot because there are no there's so few so little windows and fenestration and I just feel as I say it's striking but I don't um, so there's other things the color I actually quite like because on an autumn day I bet all that field is going to be autumn colors and it will look brilliant with it but I I do find that the absence of visible access I find slightly insensitive if I may say so I still haven't decided which way I'm going to go on this one but I find it um, an interesting application and an interesting design so I, I hope people can start to consider where they find because <laughs> we do have other agenda so we're going to need to um move to the vote but prior to that um as the local member councillor roberts if you'd like to have any concluding comments um thank you very much chairman and i'm going to i think probably focus on on your comments that you've made because i think that's the absolute um star point of all this um the bar is a very high one uh, and I think, as some of people have said, it's an interesting design. Um, it, it, you know, beauty is in the, the eye of the beholder and is subjective, uh, as Councillor Williams said. Uh, one person will think it's wonderful, another will think it's terrible. Um, but we cannot ignore the fact that the two policies that we are working upon, the national policy and the uh, local plan policy, are very adamant about that we are trying to protect these unspoiled special places. And it seems to me to be quite apparent that this is not doing so. It says very clearly, as you said, Chairman, that all four parts of policy um, H15 have to be complied with. Not, you know, maybe should be complied with, could be with complied with. It absolutely states they must be complied with. And I believe that they do not do so. And therefore they are actually undermining. If it was to be given approval, we are undermining our policies. Now we have to look at every application on its merits and we can't um, go out of the thing. However, this will set a, a precedent because um, everybody uh, now is going to come and think that you can buy a field or own a field and all you have to say is uh, and get some people who might so like it. Robert, to say, I, think, I think you've done very, very well up to there. And I think what we're saying is there's a very high bar set by our absolutely. policy. So nobody can come and just do it. But there's a very high bar. And yes. you've just explained why you don't think that bar yes. is met. But I think members should also know that even at this moment in time, there is another application 
um, for the very next field to this, uh, which has been argued on the exactly the same things. And, and we are in great danger of losing our very precious and rare resources of open countryside here in South Cambridgeshire. We're not the most beautiful county in the world. We're not. We, we must never kid ourselves. But what we do have is lots of uh, lots of um, housing um, in villages and very few areas like this um, to actually give those houses somewhere that they can see and enjoy in their entirety, in their rural nature, with all the wildlife. Please, please, members, don't put this um, so thank particular you. application on them. Thank you, so, Chair. Um, what I need to do is, Chris, um, in terms of where people are minded, I'm hearing this is very, very interesting. So there are people are minded either to approve or to reject. If they were to go against the officer recommendation, which is to approve and to reject, do you have the reasons for that? Uh, I have a reason I've drafted, Chair. I wonder if it might be worth hearing briefly from uh, Bonnie Quack, the Urban Design Officer, just to address some of the points that have been raised um, mm -hmm. before we just go to that reason that I've drafted, if you're happy. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chris. Um, I just um, I would like to just answer some of the questions um, I heard, um, for example, from Councillor Brednam about the building um, not having a lot of windows or turning its back, etc. If I may. Yes. Yes. So basically, I think what when we look at this application, um, unlike other applications that we've looked at for Para 79 for subcams, is that this house is designed by the architect. Um, who's been um, living in, 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 in the locality for, for some time. He understands the site really well. And this house is something that he really wants to build for his family. And the reason for the, for, for, for the proportion of the windows and how they're, they're sited is very much to reflect his personality. Because um, I believe the applicants, when we had the design workshops, he, he talked about He's a very quiet person and a very private person, so he, he felt it's quite important to his sort of a, a more enclosed um, enclosed facade uh, towards two sides of the queue. Councillor Roberts, can you take your camera off, please? So we're not having any requests. To be, thank you. And 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 actually, if you look at that um, square plan form, um, two sides, it's got four facades basically. Two facades are quite enclosed. Two facades are quite open, and that's the southeast and the southwest. That's and that sort of um, reflects the concept of the of the bird hide, which is very much what the RSPB is about. It's about the birds. It's about providing a natural habitat. It's about relating to them. So that that sort of um, openness towards those focusing on those two facades is his way of relating to that and his, op his, his willingness to open up his personality. So it's a very much a house that he wants to design for his family, reflecting his own, his, his own needs and also a response to the surrounding context. So that, that, that's what I want to say about the how, how the way the windows are sited and, and why there are some enclosed areas on two facades and more open areas on the other two facades. Thank you, thank you, Chair, for that, for, for Bonnie Quack giving that explanation. I found that very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yes, thank you, Chair. So um, I've got a single reason drafted, um, should members wish to uh, vote to refuse. Uh, and that is as follows. Whilst considered to be of high quality design, the proposal is considered to fail to significantly enhance or be sensitive to the defining unspoiled rural characteristics of the local area, contrary to the requirements of the South Cambridgeshire District Local Plan Policy H15C and Paragraph 79E of the National Planning Policy Framework. I think that matches what the comments that I've heard um, from others today. Is there anybody who isn't in agreement with that being the, the principal reason if they were minded to refuse? No, thank you. So, sorry, Chairman. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry. I don't think it's compliant with policy H15 where it says um, that it would uh, that it would significantly enhance its immediate setting. That, that's what he's just said. Uh, yeah. 
And the nature and the size of the site and the design of the dwelling, its landscaping and location on site are sensitive. It's not sensitive, Chairman, I don't believe. Chair, would you like me to read it out again? Yes. OK, uh, so the wording I have is whilst considered to be of high quality design, the proposal is considered to fail to significantly enhance or be sensitive to the defining unspoiled rural characteristics of the local area, contrary to the requirements of the South Cambridgeshire District Local Plan Policy H15C and paragraph 79E of the National Planning Policy Framework. That's fine. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. So members, um, as on page 285, the Office of Recommendation is that the committee approve the application subject to the conditions that are contained there. Um, I will do a roll call. So this is to approve. So please say whether you are for, against or you abstain. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Against. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Sorry, um, I'm actually for it. Sorry, okay, that's fine. I my mind. Councillor Dr. Martin Khan. At four. Councillor Peter Fain. Four. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Four. Councillor Judith Ripeth. Four. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Against. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. He's not present, Chairman. Gosh, I didn't realise when he'd, he'd left. OK. Um, Liam, do we do we know when Councillor Dr. Richard Williams left or had or was dropped out of the meeting? Chairman, if, if I may, he hasn't dropped out. He did say at the start that he had a, um, a medical appointment and then he'd be back at four. OK. Councillor Nick Wright. At uh, four. And myself against. That's six four and four against. Therefore, this is approved. Members, it's just two minutes to four and we were going to have a 10 minute break at 3.30. So I suggest that we have a 10 minute break now and come back at 4.10. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. If you turn your camera and microphones off, please.
Hello, Liam. Hi there. Hi. We're still live, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So thank you, everybody. It's 4.10. This is South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee meeting, and we're con continuing with today's committee meeting. We just had a short break for 10 minutes. I'll do a quick roll call just to make sure that we've got all of the planning committee members here and present. Councillor Henry Bratchelor. Present. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Present. Councillor Martin Kahn. Present. Councillor Peter Fain. Present. Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins. Present. Councillor Judith Lippers. So present. Oh, good. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Yeah, present and annoyed. Excuse just please, Councillor Deborah Roberts. Um, Councillor Heather Williams. Present, Chairman. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. So not not present. Councillor Nick Wright. Present. Thank you. We're moving to agenda item 10 on our agenda pack. If Councillor Richard, Dr. Richard Williams joins us, he'll be able to join in the discussion, but not in the voting on agenda item 10. Uh, Stephen Reid. 
It's item nine, Chair. It's item nine. Oh my goodness, agenda item nine. Excuse me, everybody, I've skipped one. Thank you. Agenda item nine, which is Falmere, which is pages 297 in our agenda pack. And this is the 20A Piper's Close Falmere. And um, the proposal is for new access from London Road and extension to the existing parking area to create on-site parking and turning. Um, the applicant is Mr. Sean Gentle. The reason it's with us is because this is owned by South Cambridgeshire District Council. No, and we wouldn't have this kind of um, application in front of us, but because it's owned by the council, that is, those are our rules. We haven't had a site visit. Um, it's not a departure in terms of application. Decision due by the 15th of April 21. And the presenting officer is Marie Roseman. Hello, Marie. Hello. I see you and your recommendation is approval and you're going to give us um, any updates, but also a, a quick summary of the application itself, Marie. Thank yes. you. I'm just going to share my screen. Let me know when you can see. I can see that perfectly. Thank you. No problem. So this is an application for a new access from London Road, an extension to the existing parking area to create on-site parking and turning for 20A Piper's Close Falmere. And as you said, um, this application has been brought to planning committee as the site is owned by South Cambridgeshire District Council and it's in the Falmere development framework. So the aerial photo on the left shows the site on a slight bend in London Road with fields opposite. And the existing plan here on the left shows that currently 20A and 20B share vehicle access via the land owned by 20B. So the property on the below. And so 20A, the application site seeks to create a new access and parking arrangement shown on the proposed plan right in grey. This would create a parking area 12 metres in maximum depth and 8.5 metres in maximum width. A chain link fence would then separate the properties. So the photo on the far right is the existing access and the first two photos show the location of the proposed access site. Um, and the key considerations are character and appearance of area, highway safety and neighbour amenity. So thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that. Um, any questions for clarification for Marie? No one's indicated, Chair. I have a, I can see a hand raised, but so if anybody needs to speak, could they please put that in the chat box? Yeah, so no. I, can't, I can't see hands, but no one, oh sorry, Deborah Roberts has indicated in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good afternoon, um, Marie. Um, can you, I'm finding this quite a difficult one uh, because I, um, I know the circumstances um, behind it in a way, but can you just confirm to me there is actually um, which I know there is actually parking uh, allocated spots there already, isn't there? Yes. And there the, next door the next door neighbour, who's a private owner that was bought, has got a parking spot of his own, which was in his what was used to be the front garden. Yes. So actually, there is more than adequate parking in that area already. Yes, there is. Um, I believe that the reason for the application is because 20B um, and 20A, there's um, some, um, they prohibit them from parking outside their house. So that's why they're asking for a new access. But obviously we don't get into neighbour disputes. No, we don't. We don't get into the neighbour disputes. We're, we're just on what's in front of us and whether or not somebody is able to apply for a, a change to um, to the, have a new access. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, 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 Robert. I'll, can I talk about, about the application? Oh, no, 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 not now. Sorry. Thank you. I'll talk about it in a minute. Thank you. Vice Chair, we have any more clarification questions? Yes, one more chair from Councillor Fane. 
Chair, that's premature. I am proposing to say something on debate. Thank you. And Councillor Bradman. Oops, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I I just was trying to work out what, what was going on. Is it that there, there is already access on the northern property, isn't there? There is the seven property, the property, the existing properties on the seven, seven property, and it's the northern property that are asking for new access. Okay, right. So it obviously looks different to what it does on Google Maps then. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I, I, I'm, I stand corrected by your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just reminding everybody, this, this capital application wouldn't normally come before us. Um, unless it generates a huge public interest, but of a policy issue and it's coming before us because it is the applicant is a member of South Cam's District Council. That's just due diligence on our part for transparency. So um, I will now thank you very much, Marie, and I'm going to move to um, the public speaking section, which we don't have any public speakers. Um, and Deborah Roberts is the local member. Do you is there a need for you to speak at this moment on it or you speak in the debate? Uh, I'll speak in the debate, Chairman. Oh, Thank no, sorry, I'll, I will speak as local member now, if you okay. would like. Um, yes, I, I, I have a lot of sympathy for the department um, in this application. Um, I can see absolutely no real reason for it, but I know that the uh, person that we are trying to placate um, will uh, and has um, caused a lot of difficulties. So Councillor Roberts, I, I really, we, I know you've got this local knowledge, but as mm. members, we have to just look at the application in front of us, which is for access. So we normally don't go into the reasons why people are asking us for an, an access. Yes. I, I, I'm a little concerned um, ab about the fact that we're getting a, a new access because it is actually right on that corner itself. and. We get a lot of um, cars whipping around that corner, um, and and it's quite quite a, a risky area. So I, I I think that you know there are uh, reasons that I I don't think it should be going on um, in planning terms. Um, but I I'm being obviously led by the information that I've got, which isn't anything to do with planning. Yeah. So um, you know. So what we've got is no objections from the parish council yeah, and absolutely. not in principle from highways, but they have yeah. asked for, I think making to your point, they have asked for some specific conditions yeah. to sort of deal with the safety issue yeah. that you're you're mentioning there. I've got objections to it, but not as a planning application. Thank you. Chairman. That's what then that then you keep those to yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so we'll go to the main debate. And I think Councillor Peter Fane, you said you would like to speak in the debate. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is not a departure application. It's had no representations from members of the public. Uh, the Parliament the Parish Council has no objections. The concerns, it, possible concerns in relation to highways are dealt with by the local highways authorities in terms of the condition. The access is further from the bend than the existing access. I would recommend we move straight to a vote. Yes, I would agree with you. Um, and um, Councillor Deborah Roberts, you said you have objections, but not on planning terms. So if I said that we would move to this by affirmation in terms of the officer's recommendation, would you have a different opinion? I share your opinion, Chairman. Thank you. OK, so officer recommendation is approval, members. Um, and can we do that by affirmation? Can I second the Councillor proposal? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Sorry, and Councillor Anna Bradham, thank you very much. You can second that. I jumped it into there. Thank you very much. And is there anybody who can I can I also say? I, no, no, Councillor Anna Bradham, no. So, um, well, because no, because Councillor Anna Bradham, just if you take your camera off, please. Thank you. Sorry, and my mistake. So I should have allowed you to. Um, second the motion. The motion was proposed by Councillor Peter Fane. It was seconded by Councillor Anna Bradnam. We took it by affirmation, but I just want to check there is nobody against and nobody abstaining. 
Thank you. So that agenda item is finished. Thank you very much. And that was agenda item nine, which I put in the chat, which is finished. So that is now agenda item nine that's finished. Members, we move on to agenda item 10. In your report pack, that's on page 305. Chairman, and just to remind you, I need to step down at this point. Thank you very much. Um, at this moment, my vice chair, Henry, Councillor Henry Batchelor, um, as he mentioned at the very beginning, has declared an interest. He will now leave the meeting. Um, and I will ask that Councillor Peter Fain act as my chair, vice chair. Um, can I take that by affirmation that Councillor Peter Fain act as my vice chair for this agenda item? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much, everybody. Anybody against? Anybody abstained? No, and thank you very much. So Councillor Henry Batchelor has left the building. He's left the virtual building. This is agenda item 10 on page 305. Um, application number 20 stroke 02098 stroke S106A. It's for the land between Church Lane and Ermine Street South and Papworth Everett. And the proposal is for the modification of planning obligations which concern the building of a community building contained in a section 106 agreement dated 21st of October 2014, pursuant to outline planning permission S-0623-13 FL, full permission. The applicant being Flagship Housing Development Limited. And the key material considerations are the principle of development and the section 106 agreement and infrastructure contributions. The fact that this is coming to committee um, for a change in those conditions agreed in the Section 106 agreement. So no site visit for this. It's not a departure. Um, an extension of time has been agreed until the 20th of April, and it's brought to the committee because Papworth Everard Parish Council has requested that. Aaron Coe is our Principal Planning Officer. Aaron, hello. Afternoon, Chair. Hello again. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you for keeping in with us here. And would you like to give us any updates or summary of, of the situation that we have here? Yeah, I'll just share my screen with members first. Can I just confirm everyone can see that? Yes, we can. Brilliant. OK, so yeah, firstly, I'd like to make members aware of the additional representations that have been received since the report was circulated on this item. Uh, Papworth Parish Council provided additional comments um, submitted yesterday, which echo similar concerns and objectors, uh, objections that have been previously raised. Um, Alia Limited, who are the first beneficiary of the community building, have also made further comments, raising concerns related to the timings and the modifications proposed. And an additional representation from a local resident has been made supporting the deed of variation. Each of these representations are all now available on the application file via public access. So now moving on to the um, application. So the application site is the land between Church Lane and Ermine Street South, which is within the village framework of Papworth Everard and partly within the conservation area. So this slide here shows uh, the blue and pink land is approved under application reference S0623-13 slash FL. So this original planning consent was granted in 2014, which was considered as a hybrid planning application. The scheme secured outline planning permission for the erection of up to 58 dwellings within the land shown as blue on this image here, and then full planning permission for the works of the community building, as well as an erection of eight residential dwellings on the pink land here. So this slide shows an aerial view of the site, as you can see outlined here. So moving on to the details of the application we are considering here today. The deed of variation proposes to amend various aspects of the original Section 106 agreement. Firstly, the original Section 106 involved the community building being completed and offered to the first beneficiary prior to the occupation of the first dwelling. Since Flagship acquired the site and commenced a tender process for the development in 2016, there have been other matters which have resulted in delays to the delivery of the community building. These matters have included a series of issues being uncovered, which has resulted in further investigations, such as an assessment of, of temporary works, structural and fabric surveys, steel upgrade, geotechnical and concrete core testing. Fab flagship then decided to carry out pre-application discussions with 
the district council regarding a new community building rather than refurbishing the existing building on site. However, the pre-application responses provided by the council did not give flagship enough certainty that revised application for a new building would be supported. And therefore, flagship made the decision to pursue the delivery of the extant permission for the community building. Due to the delay suffered whilst considering the options of providing a new building were, were exp explored, the construction of the dwellings has now surpassed the trigger which required the community building to be completed prior to the first occupation. And there are a number of dwellings ready now for occupation. The variation is required to enable future occupiers to move into their properties before the community building is fully completed. As set out in the report, a series of enforceable new triggers have now been introduced to secure the delivery of a community building. So I'll just run through these quickly. These include no dwellings within the blue land to be occupied until £60,000 has been paid to the district council towards the fitting out of the community building. No more than 25 dwellings should be occupied until the community building reconstruction has commenced on site. No more than 30 dwellings shall be occupied until the steel frame of the building has been installed. Then no more than 35 until the brickwork of the building has been completed and no more than 40 dwellings until the uh, the community building has been completed and offered for transfer to the first beneficiary. The second modification relates to the time frame given to the first beneficiary to open the building to the members of the public following the transfer. This involves a reduction of, of this period from 24 months to 18 months. The third modification proposed relates to the sixth schedule of the Section 106 agreement, and this is proposed to be modified to ensure the spec of the building will be in accordance with current building rev requirements and the installation of an upgraded flooring as well as new fire doors provided. The fourth mo modification amends the owner occupier exclusion clause to ensure the obligation which prevents occupation of dwellings applies to individual owners and their mortgagees. This, offer, this offers more protection than the original agreement, which was not enforceable against any owner, occupier or mortgagee of individual dwellings. Sorry, sorry, the fifth, just to cover the fifth modification as well, which introduces an amended mortgagee in possession clause for affordable housing. This variation is proposed to update the clause in line with current best practice. So moving on to the planning assessment and the key planning considerations to be taken into account today. Uh, the two key questions that must be considered to determine if the proposals meet the relevant tests are, does the obligation still serve a useful purpose? If it does, does it serve the purpose equally well if it affects the subject to the modifications specified in the application? So in respect of the first test, the revised obligation still secures the provision of the community building at a stage of the development where there's still a reasonable number of dwellings left, dwellings remain unoccupied to ensure the opportunity for the council to enforce in the event of any future breach, as well as a clear incentive for the developer of the site to carry out the development and comply with the obligations to enable the release of the remaining dwellings. In addition, the revised triggers have been introduced to ensure that dwellings cannot be occupied until the community building has reached the relevant stage of construction Officers consider this the additional triggers provide sufficient certainty that the community building will come forward and be delivered. The District Council Section 106 officer has also been involved in the process and throughout and is of the same view. With regards to the second test, whilst it's acknowledged the revised proposal will result in a further delay in the provision of the completed shell of the community building, it must be noted that the revised proposal now includes £60,000 contribution towards the construction of the shell which will provide a core, toilets, a kitchen, as well as the upgraded flooring, fire doors, which ensures the community building spec is compliant with the building rev requirements. In addition to this, as mentioned, the, the reduction from 24 months to 18 months from the completion of the transfer to the opening of the building, as set out in paragraph 25, successfully reduces the delay. A, a reconstruction build out programme has been submitted within the application and is also available on the, app, on the public file. So overall, for the reasons set out in the report, officers considered the obligations which continue to serve their e purpose equally well if modified, as detailed in the presentation and the report, and therefore approval is recommended. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Do we have any clarification questions? 
Yes, Chair, we have a question from Councillor Adam Bradnam, then followed by Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Chairman, I withdrew my uh, request to speak because the uh, question was answered as the case officer presented. Thank you. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you. Uh, a couple of things. Um, I'm sure I kind of read the documentation through, but I couldn't find anywhere where the reason for the £60,000 um, contribution um, was explained and how it was calculated and if it was in conjunction with ELIA or however it's called and also why reducing the 18, 24 months to 18 months and again is this was this done in you know, together with either the parish council and or Elia, who are supposed to be taking it on. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hawkins. Um, so the £60,000 is going towards the fitting out of the uh, community building um, to get it to the spec level and um, the a, the reduction from 24 months to 18 months is sort of is a an incentive for a, a um, for Alia to complete it in a, a, uh, in, a in a in a faster way to, to speed up the delivery. I'm sorry, that doesn't answer my question, Aaron. Mm -hmm. The question is, how was that sixty thousand pounds reached as a figure? And also, you know, if 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 uh, the developer is proposing to reduce the time frame, um, just because they feel they can. Was it? I mean, how can they do that without the third party who's going to take it on actually agreeing to it? Did they agree to it? So I can ask if James Fisher's on. The, I wasn't involved in the application at this sort of when the sixty thousand was decided. Um, as the figure, um, James, when Katie was leading the case, did, if James is with us. I don't know if we have James Fisher with us, who's our Section 106 officer. Chair, it's Chris Carter here. Can I suggest possibly Stephen Reid might be able to helpfully contribute at this point? Mm -hmm. Stephen Reid. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to the reduction from 24 months to 18 months, when we get to public speakers and we hear from flagship or their representative, I think you'll find that they, they're they proposing now to revert to the 24 months. Can you answer this? Well, so we'll, let, we'll hold that and get clarification of it before we take it up as an item that we're trying to dig into further. But um, and on terms of the how the figure was achieved at the 60,000. Um, the the 60,000 again, when we hear from flagship, it's an offer that they've made and they'll be able to set out the basis on which they arrived at the figure. OK. Thank you, Chair. I will wait. Thank you. <laughs> then we Do have, have any other questions then. Thank you very much, Stephen Reid as well. Thank you. Can you turn your camera off? Councilor? Yes, indeed. Then we have Councillor Wright. Uh, thank you for that, uh, uh, Chairman, for, list, uh, for my point is it has been made that this morning we had a change amendment to this that it was going to be 18 months, but Nicole Smith from flagship has moved it back to 24 months. You know, this has only been informed this morning. Um, and, you know, it just shows what a muddle they are in with this application. Um, so my question is, you know, in the absence of James Fisher, can I ask the planning officer, when was he made aware of this material planning change to the 106, that it was going back, that that when this application was put in, it was going to be 18 months. And this morning, I understood that it had gone back to 24 months. When when was the planning officer made aware of this? 
I was also made aware this morning um, that they were reverting back to 24 months. How, however, I'm assessing the application. It's been assessed on the basis of being 18 months because that's on the application form and that's the item we've got in front of us. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm presenting it in that way and um, advising members to consider this uh, as, as they have it in front of them as 18 months rather than 24. Stephen, um, you are our legal and yet you've referred us to the 24 months. So, uh, no. Can you answer two questions, Stephen? One is, uh, we'll leave it to flagship, but I think we're better, we need to know what, what are we looking at, not what flagship is presenting. What are we looking at in terms of the planning application here, in terms of the change to the um, S106 condition? What are we looking at and what do we need to look at? In, independent of what flagship tells, what are we looking at as a planning committee now? Um, and secondly, uh, yes, so that first of all. Um, Chair, if I may, the, if members wish to um, determine the application on the basis of the 24 months, as Aaron says, that's the application which has been subject to consultation then you could determine it on that basis. However, Alia have sought to criticise the reduction from 24 months to 18. And I think we'll hear from flagship that in those circumstances, um, they, they would ask members to consider the, the application on the basis that it reverts to the 24 months because that will withdraw an objection from Alia yeah, on that Stephen, point. can I can I just clarify something? As I have seen everything, we have looked at it not at 24 months in the way it was consulted. We have been presented with it and by the planning officer as 18 months. Yes. Yeah, not 24. You've just said it was as 24. We've been presented as 18 months. Yes. Yeah. And so what we need to know before going any further is if during the presentation in terms of the public speaking piece, flagship were to say they would change 18 to 24, what implications in planning um, terms does that have for us? Are we able to see within the period of time that we are now sitting as planning committee being asked to look at it 18 and it is then moved to 24 within the same meeting does that have any planning implications for us as committee members and as also explain the relationship between flagship and alia in that is do we have anything to do with that at all or is that a private matter but the first is the most important which is what are the implications for us as planning committee to have it? How significant? I think Councillor Wright mentioned it was material, key material change in what's being put forward to us. So the application that has been the subject of consultation is 18 months. However, um, if members um, decide that actually um, they would be willing to grant the application were it to be amended to revert to 24 months. I think that is within the gift of members to decide in terms of inviting an amendment to the application and for members to decide on the basis of the period reverting to 24 months. So what you are confirming now, Stephen, if I understand it, is that that is in our gift of the committee to hear new evidence and to enable that change to the S106 agreement to move from 18 to 24 if flagship presents that to us. Yes. Thank you. Chair, we have Councillor Heather Williams next. But before then, I see that Aaron Coe would like to speak again, perhaps on this point. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, my issue has been covered. Just, just I was just correcting Stephen that the consultation went out on the 18 months, not 24. But uh, Councillor Hailings already did that. Thank you. Thank you. So then, Councillor Williams. Councillor Heather, Heather Williams, please. Chair, uh, oh, sorry, I Stephen, can you turn your camera off, please? Unless Heather's got a question for you. 
It may well be. Chairman. It may well be. <laughs> um, I, I think it probably is. I'm so. We've been told it's in the gift of the committee to to take in what's been given to us this morning. However, my understanding of the practice is normally if there is a key material change, then we would reconsult. So I just want to because to ask us to then take into consideration a 24 month based on the applicant's email this morning. Not not um, personal, only if today during this committee meeting that during the public speaking, the applicant tells us if that. If the yeah. applicant tells us when they speak, um, surely we would be in some difficulty on consultation grounds. The, uh, the fact that there has been a material change and we have not consulted. Thanks, thanks Karen. I was trying to get to whether or not, you know, in any way at all, including reconsultation, when I asked that question of Stephen Reid. I see Chris Carter has asked to speak, so maybe he can help us with this. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, I must admit, I, I tend to agree with you. I think we need to hear from flagship as to whether or not the email they sent this morning was actually proposing a change or not. Um, if it is not proposing a change to that which has been considered by officers, then I think the committee can proceed to consider the application in front of it. Uh, if they are proposing to make a change, then I would tend to agree that we should consider whether or not further consultation is required. Uh, in which case we may need to consider deferring the item, but I think we need to hear from flagship um, to avoid going around in circles on the Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yep. Do we have any other clarification questions for? None listed, Chair. Sorry? Ah, now we have uh, this Councillor Bradnam again. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify as I understand it, the driver behind this was the wish for a community building to be delivered at a, con at a sensible time to match the new development. Some, can someone clarify that, that is correct? Yes, that, that is correct. So in, on the um, original outline or the hybrid application, uh, the community building was Put to come forward prior to the first occupation of the dwelling but as I said the applicants were exploring other options and trying to achieve a new building on the site rather than refurbishing the existing um, and unfortunately the trigger has now passed and um, this is what's caused the frustrations of the parish council and and Alia as well the fact that they've continued developing dwellings um, beyond the um, thank you Aaron we're just yeah. establishing yeah. the question and the yeah, principle so, so just to cl just to clarify my understanding then the whole driver was to provide community buildings early on in the development so that it would provide a core place for the community to build in the in this new de newly developed area so actually this delay back to 24 months is is the opposite of what so Anna, Anna can we not deal can I just with clarify, I'm just trying to clarify that that is the implication of what's being said is that right it in sorry is that right that it's simply takes it back to a longer time frame, which was not what was wished in the first place. Uh, that's correct, but the um, the, ori the original building to be delivered would have been. Uh, yeah, sorry, Stephen, should I? Uh, uh, ch Chair, if I may, can, can we wait to hear from flagship? Yes, I, was, I think so, okay. Anna, because I think what we've done, Anna, is clarify, you know, the intent, but we don't yet know about the this this period of the 24 months. Are there any other clarification questions for the case officer? Not if you move on quickly, Chair. Thank you. So let's move to the public speakers and we have Tim Jones. I'd like to invite him to speak. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, I am Tim Jones. I uh, first got involved uh, in this project in 2012. I uh, am now the senior consultant, senior advisor to Alia. I am authorised on their behalf to speak. I was at that time the chief executive of, of Alia and I got involved with Papworth Trust and Lee Rig, Lee Rig being the developer of the site on behalf of Papworth Trust, uh, to, to um, look at a, how to use the former print works and whether they could be brought forward for community benefit. I should say Alia is itself a charitable community benefit society, so we're not a company 
our mission in life is, is about community benefit. Thank you, Tim. Um, so thank you for that introduction. And you have you I don't you don't have a camera, but that's fine. We can hear you perfectly. Oh, do I have a camera? That's hold on. I thought to turn my camera on. Can you can you see me now? So forgive me, I don't know why that's not working. Let me just let me just come back in. Can you see me now? No, but I think we should just continue, Tim. That's fine. We can hear you perfectly. Okay. I will I will carry on. Um so we'll start your uh, three minutes now. Super. Thank you, Jim. The um the, the process was a consultation in the with the community as to what might be done with the uh, former print works and we ended up designing a microbrewery and pizzeria because at the time the community was short of a place to, to uh, for eating and drinking um, and coming together for that sort of a purpose and there were to be community rooms and a variety of uses. We did a full community consultation with the parish and indeed with the community and that is all on, on file. Uh, designs were worked up with Allium Design and fully costed and those designs became the planning application, which has been referred to earlier, uh, which was S062313 FL. And those designs were incorporated into that uh, full planning consent at that time. Um, marketing materials were then developed with January's and Bidwell's, and Alia's proposition was made clear in the marketing materials that this consideration to pass was an amount of money and, of course, the development of the community building. And that was costed in the planning application, by the way, at £940,000. Uh, we entered then into a development and transfer agreement with Papworth Trust uh, in order to transfer the building to us. And Annex B of that agreement uh, is the building specification, and Annex C is the draft transfer. Those two annexes then became Schedule 6 and 7 of the Section 106, which was in turn granted on the 21st of October 2014. Now, the application before you today proposes, from Alia's point of view, a reduction in the time allowed for Alia to fit out uh, the community building once we're offered it, and it amends the specification for, um, for the building. Now, this new application appears to supersede the application which was 2020098S106A. That is what it says in the application, yet and in fact, it was signed on the 18th of March this year. In that application, certificate A says that there's nobody else involved in this, uh, who's affected by this um, application. And of course, I hope it's clear from what I've just outlined, Ari is very much impacted by this application because we are a party to the planning, but we haven't been consulted. So in, all the, in answer to one of your earlier questions from your panel, no, we haven't been consulted. There are one or two statements in the, on the uh, web portal, which are very misleading. One says that Alia approves the reduction in the fit out time. We do not. And another says we approve the changes to the specification for this community building. We do not. The reason why we need the time, which is the same reason as was set in 2014, is because we need time for a consultation with the community as to what the now uses of that building might, might be. Because of course, since then, a microbrewery has set up in Papworth uh, a, a, um, the, the hospital has closed, the new food and beverage offerings have, have been come established. So until we know when we're going to get the building, we, we can't really specify what its community use will be. And therefore we can't get the contract, we can't get planning consents, we can't uh, do the fit out, we can't open it and so on. So there's a whole string of work which we need to do. And we're a charity, we can't Tim, have that you time past your three minutes, if you can have your concluding <laughs> sentence. Okay, thanks, Chairman. So the, the, the concluding part, of course, is on the community building specification. The changes to that either encumber or make delays in the, in the procurement of the building and do not shorten the time in any way at all. The proposition that it's a betterment is, I'm afraid, is entirely moot. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Jones? Mm. None listed. Ah, yes, Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair, through you. Uh, Mr Jones, thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, you kind of, yeah, I was concerned potentially that um, 
you know, what you said was the case. I'm presuming that uh, you probably made uh, active approaches to flagship to try and resolve this issue. Uh, yes, yes, we have, uh, and we have been unable to to find a resolution. In fact, we weren't consulted on this application coming in at all. Mm, OK, thanks for that. Thank you, Chair, no follow-up. Thank you. I see we have no more questions. Is that right, Vice Chair? No more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Jones. And we'll Thank now you. move to invite Nikki Fonseca, who's the agent for the applicant. You can turn your camera off, Councillor Hawkins. I keep forgetting, I'm sorry, Chair. Uh, morning and um, afternoon. I feel like I've been here all day. I have oh, been we have too. Everyone's <laughs> probably a bit fatigued now, I aren't can't we? see you um, for some reason. Um, uh, I can hear you. My camera is on, so okay. I'm not sure why but i suspect everyone is probably more than happy not to see my okay. face of so step. do you want to introduce yourself nikki before we start the three minutes yeah of course um thank you chair um can i just say for clarity this application is for the reduction to 18 months i know there's a lot of debate about that so just to be clear it's for the reduction to the 18 months in line with the officer's report um, my name is Nikki Fonseca. I'm a planning lawyer acting predominantly for local authorities and I'm instructed to speak on behalf of Flagship today, who, as we know, is a charity and a registered housing provider. Thank you. We'll start your three minutes now. Thank you. Uh, there's a long history relating to the community building on this site. Flagship has explained the backgrounds and reasons for the delay, and I do not propose restating these now, partly for timing reasons, but also because they are not part of the legal test under Section 106A relevant to this determination. These are, does the obligation still serve a useful purpose? And if it does, does it serve that purpose equally well if it has effect subject to the modifications? When assessing whether an obligation serves its purpose equally well, this should be based on the policy that justified it. The relevant policy is H4 of the local plan, which requires development proposals in the area to include a mix of community employment and housing development. The provision of a community building is therefore the aim of this obligation. The timings of delivery are not relevant to this question, which has no basis in policy. But even if they were, the time it will take to complete the building is the same, regardless of whether the application is approved. The revised obligation would continue to secure the provision of the building at a point in the development which is enforceable and effective. What is relevant is whether the obligation achieves the same aim, which it does. And in fact, it now goes beyond this. Flagship have offered to reduce the time scale, give an additional contribution and enhanced specification and further legal restrictions agreed with the council's senior planning lawyer making the variation more beneficial and more robust than the existing obligation. In my professional view, there is no doubt that the tests have been met and there are no valid reasons I can see that would justify a refusal of this application. This view is also supported by the officer's report, which confirms the legal tests have been met. I note the various concerns raised in the comments made today. In particular, the approval of the specification and timescale available, available to ALIA for delivery of the building and discussions have been ongoing with them and they are aware of these uh, changes. None of these are valid reasons for refusal, however, and flagship consider the timescales and specification are reasonable and ALIA has had sufficient time to consider these. Should members wish to allow further time for delivery, we are content for the application to be approved subject to a variation to remove the amendment to the 24 month period. Delegated authority to approve reasonable to the spec sorry, reasonable changes to the specification within the scope of the original agreement or revert to the original specification as members see fit to enable determination, which in our view does not require reconsultation. A refusal or a deferral would be of no benefit to anyone and would only serve to cause further delays and challenges to the delivery of the building and the deliverability of a scheme ultimately intended to fund affordable housing provision. 
I think it's also relevant to say that flagship was not a party to the original obligation and is a housing provider, not a commercial developer. I am available for questions, as are my, my clients, if you wish. No questions as yet, Chair. Sorry, I, I did. Councillor Hawkins. OK, Councillor Hawkins. Say clarification, please, for flagship. Um, thank you for your presentation, um, Nikki. Um, I know you say that your client is a charity, not a developer, but your client took on this land with full knowledge of the condition. Is that correct? Yes, certainly when the um, site was acquired, the planning obligation would have been in place, albeit okay. my client wouldn't have been fully aware of the extent of any works required to the building or that the pandemic was around the corner. Um, OK, fair enough. But then that was clear in the intent of that obligation. So I know, you know, we, we need to focus on the issues, which is does the obligation still serve a useful purpose? Um, it served the purpose to provide a building, a community building. Um, but as Elia has said, uh, Representative has, or is it Mr. Jones? Um, the, the issue is the building needs to be the type of building that the community requires. And this has gone on for such a long time, as he said, it's not quite, you know, they need to know what it is that the community wants now. So I am, uh, do you think that that still applies in your case, that it still serves a useful purpose? Bearing in mind the purpose has changed somewhat. The question is whether a planning obligation still serves a useful purpose is, is the first test. I should this obligation be retained? Does it still serve a useful purpose? If you were therefore to say to me, this no longer serves a useful purpose, then the application would be to discharge the obligation, which it obviously most certainly isn't. Um, so I think the question as to whether it serves a useful purpose is absolutely yes. We can all see that a community building in this location is in line with policy and is a great benefit to the wider area. So I, I don't think that's an issue. What is an issue is whether um, the, the revised obligations still secure that building. And I, I think what I'm seeing here, there's obviously a lot of history. There are a lot of questions and concerns of the delays, but we are now where we are. And regardless of what now happens, it cannot be constructed any more quickly and whilst I understand there's huge frustration about that we, we can't go back in time and okay and what why penalize the potential purchases and also affect the delivery by impacting on the viability of the scheme and I mean I no, thank you I think you've answered thank, yeah, question. Sorry, yeah. thank you very much and I think um, I think you can understand the sorry the follow-up I think you can understand the frustrations of, of the community in that we're now proposing going from uh pre uh, uh what's the phrase sorry chair um you know before anyone moves into any of the in, into any houses yeah uh to now uh 68 percent of the development will be occupied before the building actually is finished. That is a big jump. I think you will agree. And therefore, uh, the community doesn't feel that the the obligations still serve the purpose. So, Councillor Hawkins, I think that's for debate. So I think that's a good comment for our debate, but not necessarily a question yep, to the to the agent for clarification. Then you have Councillor Nicholas Wright. Yep. Thank you, Chairman, for letting me speak. Uh, my question to Nikki is, did you hear Tim Jones of Alia speak? Because he said that they have not been consulted quite clearly on this amendment at all. Uh, yes, I did hear um, 
Mr Jones speak and obviously there does seem to be some confusion there as so far as I'm concerned and certainly as far as my clients are concerned they have been aware of this process discussions have been ongoing obviously they they were aware when the original the previous application was submitted and made comments about that application. We've now submitted a revised application in consultation with officers. Um, I, I, don't, I, I think there is clearly some confusion is all I would say over that because certainly they are aware they have been able to write a full objection and response i think i think there's a difference i think what councillor wright's coming to be to be, being aware of something and and being actively consulted on it i think that's what you're driving i think you have your answer councillor Wright. yeah could i ask another point yes. too you know that you know muddle and confusion are just so apt with dealing with your your um, your uh, clients on this flagship because they you know so many of the delays have been through their own making. It is not, you know, it is nobody else to blame. And now they've reached the point where they can't, they finish the houses, but they can't be occupied because they have not started this community building. And the frustration. So Councillor Rat, I think again, these are ones, I think a bit like Councillor Hawkins, that's a debate one where you can give your event, your sort of opinion on this. I think um, you're affirming something rather than asking a question there, if you agree with me. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I see no other questions. Thank present. you. I'd like to invite then from the Parish Council, Councillor Chris Howlett. Thank you very much, Nikki, for, for speaking with us. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, Nikki, can you... My camera doesn't seem to want to turn on. Oh, what? it perhaps has now. Not yet, but if you want to just introduce yourself as it's warming Sorry, up, maybe. It's now frozen. <laughs> there we are, we can see you. Right. OK. Um, can I first ask you if you have full authority of the Parish Council to represent them? I do. I'm chairman of the Parish Council Planning Committee and have been approved to speak. Thank on you. This matter. Yeah. And so can we start with your three minutes now, Chris? Yeah. Okay? Thank you. Uh, fundamentally, if approved, this application puts in jeopardy the viability and deliverability of the community building required under policy H4 of the local plan and secured by way of the current form of the 106 agreement. Approval would also uh, go against the very assurances given the Parish Council uh, by SEDC when the application was approved. The preoccupation trigger clause and the related subsequent deadlines tied to this trigger were the subject of considered and extensive negotiations between the parties and deliberately included in the 106 agreement to ensure the timely delivery of the community building in accordance with the policy. The need for this was flagged uh, by the original applicant at the very outset of the development. Indeed, it was the legal assurance of the preoccupation trigger clause uh, and the related subsequent deadlines tied to the trigger that satisfied the concerns of both the Planning Committee of South Cambridgeshire District Council and the Parish Council to enable each to change their recommendation from refuse to approve at the time of the original application. The applicant, uh, talking about the impact on uh, viability and deliverability, the applicant seeks to relax the pre-application trigger until there is occupation 40 of the 53 dwellings, i.e. so that 75% of the dwellings will have been built before they need to have completed the uh, community building. In alleged mitigation of this extended time period, the applicant seeks to squeeze the uh, 
subsequent defined deadlines for fitting out the building, which affects Alia, not the applicant. Uh, and as we know, the timelines were introduced from uh, 24 months to 18 months. In addition, the applicant applied for a fundamental change uh, in the ownership structure of the community building if Alia should fail to follow the strictly defined and squeezed timeline. Uh, contrary to principles and provisions previously agreed and reflected in the current Section 106 agreement, um, and this is discussed later on, this has not been withdrawn in writing and remains part of the application file. Of note is that there are no legal consequences on the applicant for non-delivery of the community building. In fact, to the contrary, in such a situation, the applicant could, uh, the building and the land would then could revert to the applicant without obligation. And we'll come to the end of your three minutes, Chris. Right, okay. Um, I will conclude by uh, saying that it is our view that there is enough, there are enough uh, reasons quite apart from the uh, the 18 or 24 months question um, to uh, to refuse this application. If you don't refuse it, we would prefer it were deferred because it is a mess. We've had numerous um, different uh, inputs from the uh, applicant at different mm -hmm. times, changing different aspects yeah. of it. And uh, thank you. It, it needs to be clarified and then reconsulted. Thank you very much for your time. Is there any questions for clarification from uh, Councillor Toomey Hawkins, please? Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you, I'll be very brief. Um, Mr. Howlett, did um, flagship ever tell you how they came about the sixty thousand pounds calculation? Uh, I think it was just a figure uh, um, that that um, the applicant put in because they thought it would sweeten some of the other um, uh, changes they were making. Right. OK, thank you for your explanation. <laughs> thank you, Chair. That's fine. Can, Vice Chair? Councillor Bradnam, but Aaron Coe would like to speak. You may want to take that first. Yes, we'll take that first, if you, if you don't mind, Councillor Bradnam. Just in response to Councillor Hawkins' question that was raised earlier about the £60,000, I've um, done some digging and found the answer was um, a quantity surveyor put the information together as a, as a costing exercise for the the service core, the toilets and the kitchenette for the additional um, facilities in, in the community building to be provided. OK, thank you very much. Did we know that was out of what? Was it just those things, or was that out of a, out of all of the things that needed to be done? That, that's on top of the uh, the flooring and the and the other works as well. Thank you, Councillor Bradnam. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Howlett. So, do we understand you to say that you would actually prefer this application to be refused or deferred in order that it can be tidied up? Yes. Thank you. And to anybody else? Councillor Nick Wright. Thank you, Councillor Nick Wright. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to ask Councillor Howlett, you know, to, to the Parish Council and the community, to me, this is not about 60,000. This is about delivery of the project. Yeah, that is that is our, yeah. It, it's not just getting the shell of the building done, which is down to the applicant. It's completing the whole thing and making sure it's delivered. And we do have severe concerns about um, suspending or changing the uh, preoccupation clause to a much later date. Because by the time you sold 75% of the houses, there's very little incentive you know there would be very little of incentive to get the to get the community building finished and what you know what what leverage do you have there with a 
uh, an applicant if who, who, who then doesn't do it when you've got so little value left in the in the site. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Councillor Wright. OK, thank you very much, Councillor Howlett. Thank you for joining us and being so clear as well. Thank you. Um, and in terms of local member, Councillor Nick Wright, would you like to speak now or at the end of the debate? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm happy to say a few words now and then speak mm -hmm. at the end, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, my sort of thoughts on this are very simple. Um, you know, what we've heard, you know, is muddle confusion and a lot of legalese. This is simply, you know, if you take it back to strip it down to its bare, bare minimum, this is about the council set a trigger point on the number of houses that uh, no house could be completed and sold till the community building was built. You know, we do this and we expect developers and house builders to deliver on that. And I think in the uh, application on Bourne Airfield, a trigger point like this was set at 500 dwellings, you know, very recently. And if we don't stick to that, what value do we have, you know, with Bourne Airfield and others like this? There's no point doing 106 is if the council does not enforce it when it, the trigger point is read, it is met. So, you know, my thought to the planning committee is that this should be refused. Um, the muddle that's being created around it is of flagship's own making. And you just, you know, it makes the, the lack of consultation, you know, it, it just makes you feel they've been delaying the delivery of this community building and no one else. So I don't accept those excuses. You know, Patworth wants its community building and let's stick to the agreement, please. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. That's all right. We then have Councillor Toomey Hawkins followed by Councillor Heather Williams. Good, and I think what, what we do have here, members, is sort of say, okay, about we have to balance now. What are we being asked to balance? It's about reasonableness and whether or not the tests have been made around obligation, but also balanced with the original intention and the incentive um, that's there, where, you know, given the changes to that in the moment. So reasonableness given the current situation, but also what incentives are contained within this. Are we convinced that they're sufficient in terms of a trigger to make sure that the community does get the building? And we've also heard and we've also had a see that's kind of a lot of changes only just within a few days that we've received information about. So sort of the clarity issue is obviously key within there. Thank you very much. So I have also I can see we have. Vice Chair, do we have any other inputs that should come to this before I have members speak in the debate? Uh, forgive me, I don't have that information on From other Stephen things. Reed. If I may. Yes, yes I think David, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Wright has referred to the um, sticking to the original deal. In order for that to happen, the District Council would need to apply to the High Court for an injunction to prevent occupations taking place. So you're talking about enforcement. So the past is the trigger has been surpassed, as the case officer said. So the South Council now would have to um, so, so the, enforce the, through an injunction. So the, the trigger hasn't been passed because there haven't been any occupations. Okay. But we're, we're mindful that um, houses are ready to be occupied and therefore there is the prospect that the trigger would be passed. The, the critical point I want to explain to members is that in order to apply for an injunction, that what's called an equitable remedy. And what that means is 
that the the court will look at arguments on both sides to say whether uh, an injunction should be granted to prevent occupations taking place. Under the terms of the original agreement, um, if flagship were in breach, they could nevertheless allow plot purchasers to go into occupation uh, and then the district council would need to obtain the injunction to prevent that continuing to happen. Under the form of the revised planning obligation, flagship have accepted occupation restrictions which would bite upon owner occupiers. The importance of that is that any solicitor acting for a plot purchaser would be in breach of their professional rules were they to apply for mortgage monies <laughs> um, and such as to draw down a, a, an occupation in breach of the restriction. The other point is that there isn't a, a single trigger at 75%. There are a series of triggers up to the 75%, which will provide the certainty that at 75%, um, the building is ready to, to for handover. And again, that's absolutely critical in terms of ensuring that the occupation restriction or restrictions will bite at each of those um, revised triggers. So I can say to you that in terms of a robust planning obligation, what is on the table from flagship offers very significantly enhanced protection to both the district council and the parish council to ensure delivery of the community building. We've heard from the solicitor for flagship that the building will not be delivered any earlier. So the question is, uh, should some people be allowed to occupy dwellings which are built and ready for occupation, or should they be penalised because um, matters have moved on and the building can no longer be delivered um, unless the occupation restriction remains clicked in. So what's on offer is a compromise, but with very significant protections for the district council as to delivery. Thank you. Chair, I don't know whether Chris Carter wants to add to that. Aunt Thank Carter. you, Chair. Um, albeit in a different way, Stephen has uh, said what I was largely going to say. So I just wanted to refer members in particular to page 314 of the report pack, uh, paragraph 23, and the proposed clauses there that Stephen has summarised. Um, there are a series of clauses at different points in time, so it isn't a single trigger, as Stephen said, and it's just important to highlight those for members' attention. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we've got staged triggers throughout. I think as the case officer put forward. Thank you. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Thank you. Right, well, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm getting thoroughly confused about this, and I just wanted to clarify. We've, as I understood it, we've had a request from the Parish Council for deferral refusal, but we've been advised by le our legal advisor and by Chris Carter that what is being proposed by flagship is that would deliver a secure delivery of this building, albeit perhaps not as soon as we might have wished, but it would secure delivery of the building, whereas I presume if we refused or deferred, that might be less secure. Can can somebody confirm if my understanding is correct? Uh, 
Chair, through you, um, it's not that it would be less secure, the existing obligation would remain, but what it would do is restrict any occupations taking place uh, in dwellings which are now built and ready to be occupied. So what the amendment proposes is to, is to introduce some flexibility which would allow some occupations um, uh, at, you know, as and when the houses are ready and you wouldn't be left with the houses sitting there empty pending the community building. With your indulgence, Chair, can I just ask a follow up? Um, I will word this carefully. Is it your impression, Mr Carter, that the, 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 we might have a, an improper perception that um, sticking to the original might give a faster delivery, whereas in fact, sorry, what I mean is, do we would we lose the, the strength of incentive for the developer if we if we were to agree the amendment? In my opinion, no, there's still a, a strong incentive set out in the revised clauses for the developer to deliver. Thank that's that's so what we've got in the officer's report. It's now before members, obviously, um, to, to, to look at that and say how we could be convinced by that. Next, we have Councillor Heather Williams, Chair. Thank you, Chairman. I believe Councillor Hawkins might have been before me, but but I'll carry on unless I'm unless I'm shouted down. Uh, but um, but yeah, so it is very difficult and it's a complex one, isn't it? It's very technical. Um, but um, the fact that there are empty houses is the developer has developed them, they've known the obligations. This isn't exactly a surprise. You know, it's been there all along. Um, there is there is an agreement and an obligation in place that all parties have signed up to and, and happy with. To change that now, I mean, it, it's just um, creeping, isn't it? We go from pre, pre-commencement to pre-occupation. We go from pre-occupation to occupying some. I do think it does lose an incentive and I think part of the looking at the case part of the aspirations of this was it be here early it be here at, at the start it'd be here to welcome people as they moved into those houses with it not complete until up to I appreciate there are other triggers but essentially up to you know 70 percent then it has lost its original intent it's completely driven a horse and cart through it to be quite frank um, and on reasonableness, I think it's highly reasonable for residents to expect us to honour and stand up for them. And, you know, that's what we're here to do, isn't it? Stand up for residents. Um, and there is an obligation in place. The residents completely, you know, understand where they're coming from. If it does change in time, I think we have to refuse it. And if they want to come back with, for 24 months, then that's their that's their choice, but we cannot vote on something that's not been consulted on. Um, and I think it's time for the for the developer to honour their original agreement. It's no surprise. It's been there for. Thanks very much. Business. Thank you. The next speaker is me, unless, as Councillor Williams says, Councillor Toomey Hawkins wanted to speak again. Yes, I do. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I thank you, Chair, through you. I, I didn't think I'd see the day when I'd be agreeing with um, um, Councillor Heather Williams in total, almost. Um, but there we go, these things happen. Um, I am not happy that the obligation is being changed in this way. And I think the, the incentive, even though it is there, and I appreciate the work that has been done to try and get this um, sort of stepped, uh, you know, stepped, um, a proposal, I still think it completely misses the original intention um, and purpose of the uh, initial obligation. So I would, I'm not happy uh, okay, to vote thank for you. this. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm now um, given our time. So as you speak, members, um, if there's anything additional to say from what we've heard from Councillor Heather Williams and Councillor Toomey Hawkins, taking into consideration what Stephen Reid and Chris Carter have both said, um, then, then please speak. But not necessarily a re repetition of what the things that we've just heard. Chairman, we now have a number of uh, officers wanting to speak again. Aaron Coe, 
uh, Stephen Reed, and I think also Chris. No, we've confused. Um, perhaps you clarify <laughs> whether Aaron Carter. Stephen Reed and Chris Carter have both spoken. Both spoken. Yes. Um, we've had Anna Bradnam, and we've had um, Councillor Timmy Hawkins. It's yourself now, Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, Chair, I suggest we look at this both in terms of what's happened in the past and look ahead to the future. In terms of the past, Flagship, who are a charity, took this on from another developer. And there are genuine reasons which have been outlined to us why there has been a delay in refurbishing the, uh, the, the print house. Um, they maintain that there has been consultation with Alia along that during that period that may be determined later, but it's not a matter for us really. Now we have to look to the future. And the question I think has to be what purpose would be served in refusing this application? Would that result in the converted community facilities being made available sooner? Might it even threaten uh, the funding of those co converted facilities being made available at all. Uh, we're told that if we were to refuse this, then those intending to move into the houses which have now been completed might in theory be prevented from doing so. I'm not sure I see any purpose in that and it would might well, as Mr Reid has explained, depend on further legal action on behalf of the council. So the question is, is this community building likely to be delivered sooner if we agree to this application uh, than if we were to refuse it. My view is that uh, taking account of assurances from officers, it would probably make no difference. Uh, the community building would be delivered at the time scale which is now feasible, regardless of whether we agree to this application or not. So I'm inclined to say we should now take the officer's advice and agree to this application. Thank you, Councillor Fain. Um, and I see that we have, you'll go back into vice chair and just to help you, I see that we have Councillor Judith Rippeth and then I'll leave it up in your hands again. Thank, to let thank you, Chair. Um, I was about to suggest we go to a vote, but maybe there's more people who want to speak. I see that Councillor Wright wanted to speak again. I have, there's one question from Councillor Martin Khan. Martin, would this, um, before we then leave um, Councillor Wright to give his concluding comments to local member. Yep, there's a simple but I, I wanted to ask a legal advice. <clears throat> Normally with a planning application, the uh, the uh, application is independent of the applicant as it goes with the land. Here we're talking about a, what, Section 106 uh, agreement. Are we allowed to consider the behaviour of the applicant in a situation dealing with an agreement in a way that we probably wouldn't be without planning permission or do we still have to just consider the land as it is? It's, it's a query that the uh, perhaps we can get advice from the Mr. Reid or Mr. Uh, Carter. Chris Carter. Can Sorry, you... Chair. Yes, uh, through you. I, I'm not sure I quite understand the point, but um, uh, I, I certainly that the behaviour of an applicant, I, I would advise not taking into account. We need to consider the merits, uh, the planning merits of this proposal only uh, to vary the Section 106 agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Um, Councillor Nick Wright, if you want to give us some concluding comments and then we'll go to a vote on this one. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, behalf of uh, my community and Parish Council and my residents, I'd like to ask that the Planning Committee refuses this application. Um, there is a lack of trust that flagship, putting it back, they're actually going to deliver this at all. And We've just been told, Councillor Wright, that we can't consider Okay. But so yeah. if you just well, I, I think you can look at the triggers, can't you? Yes. Yeah. The triggers are there, but the triggers are there at the moment, and those have not been met. Um, flagship, you will have picked up the comment that, you know, they'd like to move on the uh, houses and let them be occupied, passing on the responsibility to the residents for they would pick up the responsibility for. Uh, delivering this community building in the end. Now, to me, that rings real alarm bells and it should to the rest of the committee. 
the, the useful purpose of this 106 as it stands is that a community building still has to be delivered. And at the moment, we have some leverage over flagship in that they cannot occupy the buildings till they get on and deliver it. They've had plenty of time to do that and they need to get on and deliver it. And, you know, as a local planning authority, we have to stick to our 106s. We can't keep shifting ground. Otherwise, what's the point of making them at all if you're going to give all the way through? Because people, people and developers will not pay attention to us. They'll just say, we'll get there and then we'll let it slip and we'll deal with it at the time. So that's the points that I wish to make and I would urge the committee to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll go to a vote now. Um, so, and Chair, I Stephen Reid wanted to advise on the legal aspects of that again. Chair, if, if I may, I just want to reiterate that uh, the planning obligation that is before members uh, is robust, does provide certainty, it does not put any obligation on homeowners to deliver the community building, which is a concern of councillor right. What it does do is it means through mortgage monies, it provides certainty that occupations shall not take place above each of the new triggers. And I would urge members to have regard to that improved position. Thank you. And before we go to the vote, obviously we need to clarify the reasons for refusal. Um, Chris? Yes, Chair. Um, I have got uh, a reason that officers have prepared. If I just read this out, uh, the proposed variation to the legal agreement would fail to secure the delivery of the community building in a timely manner, resulting in up to 40 dwellings being occupied without adequate community provision. Consequently, the proposal would be contrary to policy H4 of the South Cambridgeshire District Local Plan 2018, which requires redevelopment of Papworth Everard West Central, to secure a mix of community employment and housing uses and policies SC4 and SC6 which require all housing developments to contribute towards the provision of indoor community facilities to meet the need generated by the development. Thank you. I think that captures perfectly what's, what the concerns that are there which is whether or not not only whether it's timely but also if it's there as part of the placemaking which are parts of our policies that you know as residents go into those dwellings. Um, and we've also heard from the other side that this is seen by those who have negotiated this um, as being a very robust way of being able to enforce and ensure that that does happen, but at a time when we're looking at 75% occupancy. So members, that's the balance that we have before us. We'll go to the vote and this is about, this is on approval of the um, changes that are being put forward here in front of us. The recommendation is approval, so please answer for, against or abstain. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Uh, Henry's not here. Oh gosh, sorry. Thank you. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Which leaves that one to me, sorry. Um, I think I'm going to vote um, for the secure yeah. conditions. So for this application. Councillor Martin Kahn. I feel a bit like uh, Anna, uh, yes, four. <laughs> Councillor Fain. Four. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Against. Councillor Judith Ripeth. Against. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Against. Councillor Heather Ruth Williams. Against. Um, Councillor Nick Wright. Against. And myself against. Six to three. Six to three against. Um, that's a refusal on that application. It's now 5.35. I'm going to suggest that we have a 10 minute break. I see that Councillor Dr Richard Williams has been able to rejoin us. Thank you, Jay. Yes, I'm back. Thank you. And we'll come back um, again, members, for the remaining items on the agenda. Thank you, everybody. Ten minutes, please turn your camera and microphone off. 
Has anyone got a way of contacting uh, Henry Batchelor? He may want him to resume the vice chair. Yes, I'll give him a call if you like. Chair. Thank you. I haven't got his number handy. Okay. Please, microphone and camera off. Thank you. Coming back at, at 5.45.
Hi, Liam. Hi. So we are live, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're still live. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everybody. This is the South Cab. Oh, hello, Chris. I'm, I'm so sorry for interrupting. Um, just with regard to the further extension of the meeting, um, Rebecca Dobson, uh, Democratic Services Manager, should just be about to join us to explain uh, the standing orders in that regard. Thank so you very much. Just a second. No, thanks very much for checking up on that. I'll do a roll call meanwhile. Um, Councillor Henry Batchelor. Yeah, I'm back, Chair. You're back and you're now Vice Chair again. Thank you very much. Good to be back. Thank you. Councillor Nebradnam. Present. Councillor Dr Martin Khan. Present. Peter Fain. Present. Thank you for your help. <laughs> Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. Present. Councillor Judith Ripeth. Present. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Here. Councillor Heather Williams. Present Chairman. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Anybody know? Anybody any of those? Councillor Nick Wright. Present. So we're just, um, I've asked for clarification about um, standing orders regarding extension of time of the meeting. So we had, after four hours, we all agreed to continue. Um, so we can still do that while we're waiting to see if we can, somebody can contact the Councillor Ditch. Dr. Richard Williams. Sorry, I am here, Chair. Oh, sorry. Hi there. Thank you. Thanks sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Great. It's my fault. Thanks. Rebecca Dobson from Democratic Services. Have you joined us yet? Is she still trying to get in, Chris? Is that? Given up the will to live, probably, Chairman. I'm just checking, Chair, bear with me, sorry. Hi, Chair, there's nobody in the lobby at the moment. Uh, it's Liam, just to let you know there's no Hi. one in the lobby. I think Rebecca is just about to join us, <laughs> so sorry. Chris, we may have it to extend the meeting to find out if we can extend the meeting. Yes, I do apologise. I'm not quite <laughs> sure what the delay is. Oh, there we go. Hello, Rebecca. Welcome. Hello, Chair. Hello, Councillor Halings. Thank you. So the question, Rebecca, is um, we extended the meeting once after four hours, and I just wanted yes. to understand what, what situation we're in now. Yes, I mean, I think um, in correspondence with um, Chris Carter, I was wondering whether um, on principles of ensuring everyone's um, well-being, um, it would be better to take a second vote. But on then checking um, the motions without notice, they are quite specific. Um, so the one in relation to continuing beyond four hours in duration simply states that. Um, so the provision is there to move that the meeting continue beyond four hours in duration. I understand that you've already done that. Yes. Um, it doesn't say to do that again after a further four hours. Um, so it's I was, unlimited after that? I would think so. And I have, um, in my experience, encountered longer meetings. So I think that that would probably be the guiding factor. OK. OK. Thank you very much. And thank you for thank caring you. for everybody's health and wellness. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. OK, thank you very much. So uh, members, you know, um, I hope you're with us. We did agree to continue and I think we will try and finish the agenda if possible. We will take um, a rain check if that's taking us far too um, much into the evening hours. We are now on agenda item 11, page 321 of your agenda pack. That's application S stroke 3215 stroke 19 DC, Long Stand and the Retreat of Pews Lane. Um, the proposal, it's the discharge 
of condition four of foul water drainage and condition five surface water drainage of planning permission S stroke 2937 stroke 16 FL application applicant is Mr. Jerry Cadu from Landbrook Homes. Key material considerations for foul water drainage, surface water drainage and flood risk. It's not a departure application. Um, original decision due by 11th of December 2019. And why is it before us at committee? Um, because at our January meeting, we did approve the discharge of these conditions four and five. But um, the planning committee meeting does require further assessment and clarification from officers and the offer recommendation. And we'll now hear from the officer about those issues, which has meant that this is coming before us again today. Um, officer recommendation is that we discharge the conditions. Um, we're looking at this afresh. The presenting officer is Lewis Tomlinson. Lewis, do you want to give us a little bit of a summary of, of why it's before us again um, and what we need to consider as committee members now? Thank you, Chair. I'll just share my screen just so you can see the relevant information in front of you. Great, thank you, Chair. So members will recall considering the application to discharge condition four, foul water drainage, and condition five, service water drainage, planning permission S slash 2937 slash 16 slash FL at the 13th of January 2021 planning committee meeting. The committee resolved to discharge conditions. At the January meeting, officers advised members that sustainable drainage systems, non-statutory technical standards only applies to development of 10 homes or more or major commercial development and therefore was not relevant to the application to discharge conditions given that it was only for one dwelling, aka a minor application. Officers have sought council advice on this matter following a post committee representation from Fuse Lane Consortium. Despite the non-statutory technical standards guidance itself being framed only to apply to 10 plus homes or major developments, as, as set out in the accompanying ministerial statement of December 2014, the Council's adopted policy CC-8, the 2018 local plan, which refers to the standards at criterion A, does not specify a development threshold for compliance with the standards. Therefore, in light of this, officers considered that the standards, standards guidance is relevant for the purposes of assessing submission against the requirements of CC8. Stantec, the council's appointed independent drainage consultant, has provided a further supplementary technical note dated the 5th of February 2021, which provides a further assessment against the non-statutory technical standards. That was Appendix 1 of the report. It concludes that all principles of the standards are passed apart from peak flow control. However, it advises that a proportionate approach is taken to the proposal given limitations of a single dwelling in achieving the necessary controls on peak flow. Officers accept this advice and consider the proposal does comply with the principles of the non-statutory technical standards as far as reasonable practical given the minor nature of the proposal and that a refusal to discharge condition against CC8 on this point of conflict with the technical standards would not be justified in the circumstances of this case. So I'll just quickly run through the site and the proposal just to remind members. So as stated, there's two conditions. Condition four is to do a foul water drainage. Condition five is service water drainage. This is the site. So the site is within the development framework boundary of Lonstanton Village. It falls outside the conservation area and sits to the rear of the retreat. This is just an aerial site view of the site. So the site in question is here. These are the approved plans of the dwelling. And this is the approved site plan. So just to kind of summarise the conditions and what's been submitted. So the foul water, discharge of foul drainage into an existing foul sewer infused lane. And for the service water drainage, 
uh, discharge of service water to attenuation tank located within the rear garden of the dwelling. A hydro break flow control chamber is shown at the eighth outfall to the proposed storage attenuation tank, which discharges to the existing watercourse ditch to the north. And the drive driveway serving the dwelling is proposed as a gravel driveway operating as an infiltration filter fil feature. Sorry. Um, so the officer recommendation is to discharge both conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Lewis. Do we have, have any clarification questions for the case officer? Nothing at the moment, Chair. Thank you very much. So we'll move forward now to the public speakers. Um, and Mr Fulton is, I see already, ready? That's right. Um, thank you, Mr Fulton. Um, and if you want to introduce yourself, although I think most people know you, but introduce yourself and then we'll be able to start with your three minutes. Um, I think everyone here knows me fairly well, so I'll just get started in the interest of trying to hurry this up. Um, so the starting point in the consideration of an application to discharge a planning condition is to have regard to the terms of the relevant planning permission, including any conditions attached and any approved plans identified in any condition. In this case, the approved plan includes a large double driveway, parking area, and turning area uh, of approximately 110 square meters, uh, which is specifically identified and approved and labeled in English as being hard paved. The plan submitted for this charge of condition application, however, do not comply with the approved plans and change it to a gravel driveway. The local planning authority simply has no power to amend uh, a planning permission using the discharge of conditions process. Even if the LPA consider the change to be non-material, an application must be submitted under Section 96A of the 1990 Act in order for the LPA to have any lawful uh, power to amend the extam permission. Furthermore, when construing a planning condition, quote, a planning condition is to be constru construed in conjunction with its reasons for imposition so that its purpose and meaning can be properly understood. In this case, the inspector's decision notice reads as follows, quote, in particular conditions relating to foul and surface water drainage are necessary to prevent flooding and the need to take effect prior to commencement to ensure an orderly sequence of, of works. A condition requiring adherence to the approved plan is needed in the interest of certainty. However, a specific condition controlling runoff from the new dwelling driveway is unnecessary as this can be controlled by the condition that I have imposed relating to surface water drainage. In the case of this application, there is no way around it. The officer's report fails to correctly apprehend the nature of the permission, um, the meaning of the condition, um, and I'll stop there. Um, this is one of about five major problems. Um, I did write to Mr. Kelly last week and told him this should not go back to the committee and I asked him to meet with me. Uh, he did not have time to do so uh, and no other officers contacted me to offer to meet. So I regret that the committee's time has been wasted again. Um, uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have any questions for clarification from Mr. Fulton? No one's indicated yet, Chair. Um, sorry, I tell a lie, Deborah Roberts. Councillor Roberts. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Fulton. Um, haven't we all had a long day? Um, Mr. Fulton, can you just tell me, given what you've just said about it, um, I presume that what you're saying is that we can't do um, what we are charged to do this afternoon and that this has to be actually a new, new planning application? Um, no, um, the local planning authority has a discretionary power to uh, consider amendments. The application is free. I mean, the applicant is free to put in a amendment if he wishes to do so, and it's within the discretion of local of the local authority whether to entertain it. I suspect that officers in this case will be willing to entertain another um, amendment because they've done so in the past. But they haven't done so at this moment in time. No. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Any other questions for clarification? No one's indicated yet, Chair. OK, thank you very much, Mr Fulton. Thank you. And we now ha hear from, I'd like to invite Mr Cadu, Jerry Cadu, who is the applicant. Yes, good evening all. Um, I've got no comment to make on this application, uh, but I would like to speak on the... The next one. Item 12 on the agenda, yep. please. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we don't have any representation from the, the Parish Council, from Longstanton Parish Council. Um, and I haven't had a request from any of the local members to speak to this item. So we can move directly to the debate members. Anybody like to speak? First up is Councillor Roberts. Councillor Roberts. Oh dear me. Um, we always seem to be in trouble, don't we, um, with these particular application or um, ones that um, Fusely and Consortium pick up. Um, and, you know, I'm glad that they do pick them up because we have to do things right. Um, so I think really mine is a question at this moment to officers. You heard what Mr Fulton has just said about amendments. I'm disappointed when I hear a rate paying resident who's paying officers' salaries and members' allowances. Councillor Roberts, um, I, can no, you no, just no. go directly to the... Yeah, to the I am saying, yeah, but this is part of the thing. When well, I mean, that's says, just democracy in general, so can you... Yeah, the, the when general... somebody says that they've asked officers to contact them and, and have a talk to them and that they're willing to do so, I think it's very disappointing to hear that nobody has been in touch with Mr Fulton uh, because maybe it could have been resolved. And so I want to know really from officers, what... What are they intending to do now? Are they intending to ask this applicant to put in an amendment? Thank you, Chairman. Um, Lewis or Chris? Sorry, Chair, through you. Um, I, I personally wasn't aware that uh, Mr Fulton had written to Mr Kelly. Um, I don't know if Stephen Reid can perhaps advise on the legal point that Mr Fulton is raising on this occasion. Which is about the section 96A. And whether or not that's uh, it's necessary for an amendment application to be made. I suppose the question is whether the plans shown in the condition are within the, the reasonable scope of the permission, Stephen. Chair, Chair if, I, if I may, uh, the application that is before members is for discharge of conditions four and five. The point that Mr. Mr. Fulton has made re relate to a drawing uh, which, in my view, does not affect discharge of those conditions. Right. Members, um, this came before us in January. It, it's come back. Um, the, the case officer has explained the reasons it came back. It's before us again. Uh, Mr Fulton has raised concerns relating to section 96A um, around that drawing that Mr Reid has just referred to. We've just heard from our legal advisor that that doesn't impact this decision on condition discharging conditions four and five. Um, and the officer recommends that um, there is no reason, in fact, there's not grounds for us not to um, follow his advice, which is recommended in, in the papers. I see that nobody is asking to speak and therefore I think we could move to the vote. Is that right? No. Councillor Heather Williams is just... Councillor Heather Williams. Um, I find I find this a bit worrying and a bit of element of deja vu and I imagine some other members are, are feeling the same um, in relation to this uh, amendment. I don't know if it's so there's a, been a drawing that's been changed and um, Stephen's advice is that we don't need to take that as an as not an amendment or is it not material amendment? Um, Sorry. My, my advice is that you can discharge conditions four and five um, 
notwithstanding that there is an old drawing which shows a paved area. Can somebody clarify the issue of the amendment? Um, because what I'd understood is, I don't, you know, Chris, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. So uh, as I heard it, Mr Fulton is raising the issue of the original permission showing a paved driveway area and this condition showing that that would be a gravel area to act as an infiltration feature and those two things being different. The advice from Mr Reid, which I agree with, is that uh, these conditions can be dealt with today any amendment to that original permission uh, could come under section 96A, as Mr Fulton uh, commented, uh, could come following the discharge of these conditions, I believe. There's no reason uh, why that couldn't happen. So I believe that these conditions can be discharged today, should the committee agree. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you for that, um, that advice. Yeah, thank so you. So we have Councillor Hawkins next, Chair. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think my, my point is the, the reason this has come back um, was because of the non statutory technical standard, mm -hmm. whatever it is, which mm -hmm. we talked about before, mm -hmm. uh, applying to a single building when, yeah. um, you know, so, and as we have heard from uh, Stantec, um, this is acceptable. Uh, it is good to go. And that really is the consideration of this current application. Yeah. So I move that we vote on this, please. Yeah, thank you. We just have one more speaker, Chair, which is Councillor Ripper. Councillor Ripper, do you mind if we move to a vote? I am happy to second that. Yes, OK, do. good. Thank you very much. Um, I will do a roll call, members. And what we are voting on is the recommendation by the officer in this report that um, there's approval for the discharge of conditions four and five. So please answer four, against or abstain. Councillor Henry Batchelor? Four. Councillor Anna Bradnam? Councillor Anna Bradnam? I said it very firmly before, but I was muted. Sorry, four. Councillor Martin Khan. Four. Councillor Peter Fain. Four. Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Four. Councillor Judith Ripeth. Four. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Abstain. I don't know enough about it. It's too much of a muddle. Councillor Heather Williams. Abstain. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Uh, four. Councillor Nick Wright. Four. And myself, four. I have nine, four, two and two abstentions. That's been approved. Thank you, everybody. We'll move to agenda item 12. Page 349 in your agenda pack. Stephen Reid, could you please turn off your camera? Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, this is the retreat Fuse Lane Long Stanton, application 20 stroke 02453 stroke S73. And the proposal is for the variation of condition seven of the traffic management plan pursuant to planning permission S stroke 0277 stroke 19 FL to reflect the proposals in the traffic management plan to substitute the current wording in condition seven with the development hereby permitted shall be carried out in accordance with the traffic management plan prepared by SLR consulting version final one and dated December 2019 which is a resubmission. The applicant is Mr Jerry Cadu, Landbrook Homes our key material considerations are highway safety, including the safety of all users of the adopted and unadopted highways in the vicinity of the site. It's not a departure. Decision due by 16th of July, July 2020 and the application brought to committee. This was before us at January planning committee um, and members gave an earlier endorsement to approve the S73 submission. 
Um, this required a further assessment and clarification from officers, and that's what we'll receive today from Lewis Tomlinson. The officer recommendation remains to approve the S73. Lewis, thank you very much. If you want to give us any update um, and present the issues that we should take into consideration. Thank you, Chair. I'll just share my screen. Thank you, Chair. So members will recall considering this application at the 13th of January 2021 planning committee meeting. Um, <clears throat> the committee resolved to approve the application subject to the revision of paragraph 3.24 of the traffic management plan to state during the construction stage, delivery vehicles shall not park on any street within the village of Longstanton. The addition of an informative urging the establishment of a liaison mechanism between residents, the site manager and Longstanton Parish Council to monitor compliance with the traffic management plan and to resolve any disputes and the conditions and informative set out in the report. At the planning committee meeting, in a response to a point raised at the meeting by Mr Fulton on behalf of Fuse Lane Consortium, officers advised that Article 15 of the Town and Country Planning Development Management Procedure Order 2015, which is the publicity requirements for planning applications, did not apply to the Section 73 application because it was not an application for planning permission, but an application to vary the wording of a condition. This was an error because a Section 73 application is still an application for planning permission. However, the context within which this point was raised at the committee related to whether the application had been advertised as affecting a public right of way, as Fuse Lane is a public right of way. Officers confirmed that in fact the application was advertised as affecting a public right of way and Article 15 has been satisfied in this case. Um, a copy of this advert is attached as Appendix 1 to the report. Representation had been sent to Democratic Services from 6 Mitchcroft Road on the evening of the 12th of January, the day before planning committee. Due to human error, this representation was not passed on to planning officers and therefore was not reported to members. This representation can be summarised as follows. It objected on highway safety grounds, recommended conditions regarding the lane to be widened to five metres, insertion of a two by two meter pedestrian visibility splay and the maintenance of such splays. The conditions were not imposed on the original planning consent, nor did the highway authority request such conditions on the current application. Officers do not consider it reasonable to apply such conditions now. Fuse Lane Consortium raised concerns that this representation went to the heart of the key matters in the committee's decision and therefore it would be likely that the committee's decision would not have been the same if the representation had been taken into account. Officers disagree with this particular point for the reasons already stated. This also should be taken into account that this late representation also does not raise any new material considerations and as such would not change the officer recommendation. So I'll just run through the site and the proposal. So site location plan is in front of you. And this relates to the front of the site, so the retreat around here. Again, you've already seen an aerial view of the site, but just to clarify, it's this part of the site. That's the approved site plan. Approved elevations, approved floor plans, approved street elevation. I've got a number of photos, so I'll, I'll go through these quite quickly as you've seen them previously. So this is a photo up Fuse Lane from the access off the High Street. This is a view along the High Street. This is another view along the High Street. A further one. This is the entrance looking towards the north. Looking towards the south from the entrance. This is looking down Fuse Lane again. Uh, another one looking down. This is the informal turning head opposite the retreat. 
Um, access onto views lane from the public right of way to home farm. So just why the applicant um, submitted this section 73. Um, the applicant claims that the submitted traffic management plan is informed by lessons learned during the construction 2018. The traffic management plan includes details of the arrangement of delivery of materials, turn and movement, enclosure of the site, contractor parking, as well as detailed areas for material storage. The site, in this case, the site and the size of the development plot itself, however, means that the space for parking within the site is limited. Therefore, the applicant has submitted this section 73 to amend the wording of the traffic management plan to allow off-site contractor parking. So the um, recommendation is approval subject to what was outlined at the beginning, but just to go over it, it's subject to the revision of paragraph 3.24 of the traffic management plan to state that during the construction stage, delivery vehicles shall not park on any street within the village of Von Stanton. The addition of an informative to ensure that there is um, a discussion set up between residents, site manager and Lon Stanton Parish Council to monitor compliance with traffic management plan, but also to resolve any disputes. And it's also subject to the conditions and informative set out in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Lewis. Members, do you have any clarification questions for the case officer? No one's indicated, Chair. Thank you. You're already there, Mr. Fulton. I'm just about to invite you as public speakers to come into the room. Thank you very much, Mr. Yes, Fulton. Yes, I'm ready. Yes, OK. Um, so um, at the January meeting, uh, Councillor Wright, uh, who I very much respect and with whom I usually almost always agree, uh, said that members had to trust the advice they were being given by officers. Um, I just like to reflect on these scorecards so far of, of the council on the last application um, for the discharge of conditions. The first decision was quashed by the High Court and the second and third decisions, the council sought outside legal advice from council who advised officers not to grant approval and to remit for redetermination. So I think we see a clear trend there um, and uh, following blindly the advice of officers that is plainly um, questionable I do not think is going to be a successful strategy for the council going forward. On this particular application, the officer's report was published on the 1st of April. Um, the members of the consortium are all ratepayers of the district. Based on the council's statement of community involvement, we have a legitimate expectation that material consultation responses received by the council will be taken into account. On 14 December, the consortium submitted material representations to the case officer on conditions 11 and 12. These representations are not mentioned, summarized, or there's no reference made to them in the officer's report, and the officer's report uh, does not even allude to addressing these conditions. On March the 1st, representations were made by the Fuse Lane Consortium. These have been published on the council's website since March 1st. Um, these representations said the, develop, the division of the development site and smaller parcels of individual dwellings that if considered outside their spatial context would provide a means to circumvent the requirements for infrastructure set forth in the development plan. Very material consideration to this and many other applications the committee's heard today. On the 14th of March, the consortium submitted representations online again these representations have been published on the council's website since the 14th of March. Um, these alley, these uh, representations allege that the local planning authority has failed to apply its mind to the evaluation of the reasonability of the local highway authority's history of, statu history of statutory consultation responses, which are clearly contradictory um, and simply do not add up. Um, even if the council were to read out all of these representations today, um, that is still materially unfair to the consortium. Um, the proper sequence would have been for the officer to consider our representations at the design he was formulating his recommendation. Uh, the officer's report should have been published five clear days in advance. And if we disagreed with the officer's conclusions, we would have had five 
uh, clear days to lobby committee members. Um, this has not taken place. Um, I'll just stop here. I could go on for longer, uh, but I mean, at some point the committee is going to have to realize that we have to find a new solution. We can't keep wasting committee time on this um, and wasting the court's time. So thank you for your consideration. Um, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. Any clarification questions for Mr. Fulton? We have the case officer Lewis would like to come back. Thank you, Chair. It's not a question for Mr. Fulton. It's sorry, I forgot to mention that there's an update report that um, was issued in response to a representation received from Hughes Lane Consortium, which members have seen. Thank you. The update report that was mentioned by Mr. Lewis did not contain any of the representations or allusions to the representations that I mentioned. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Fulton. I see there are there any questions, Mr. Fulton? Yeah, there was one from Councillor Roberts. Yeah. Hello there, Mr. Fulton. Can you can you tell me, um, do you feel that you are being ignored by South Cambridge District Council? Do you feel that's uh, deliberate or not? And is this one also going to end up in the High Court? Um, the Council's current strategy to engaging with me and the consortium is to have no engagement at all. This is why we keep having to go to the court. Um, if we could sit down and work, I know Mr. Kelly and Ms. Brown are reasonable people, as is Mr. Carter. I think if we could sit down over Zoom or over Teams, I think we can make significant progress closely. To date, the Council has not been willing to do this, so we've been forced to take the only recourse we can which is through the legal system. And it's very unfortunate. Uh, and I continue to try to engage with officers um, almost on a weekly basis. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, no matter what time of day this is, uh, absolutely, um, we're not going to deal with individuals or people who have disparaging comments. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. I think you've asked that clarification question. Any other questions for Mr. Fulton? There is one from Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you, Chair. Th thank you, Mr. Fulton. Um, just just so I can get it sort of clear in my mind in terms of weighing up the different arguments. So what would be the nub of your case as to why the committee should should turn this down? I, I think I'd find a, a summary. Oh, of I, I don't useful. I don't think the committee can refuse it today because the committee hasn't even been given a summary of the material considerations. I think a refusal today would be just as unfair as an approval because basic, I mean, officers' reports are to be read benevolent, benevolently and keeping in mind that they're written for um, a, a, a trained counselor to have local knowledge. But in this case, there are just so many representations missing. I just don't see any way the officer's report could be deemed to be acceptable within the standards that have been set in, in case law. Okay, so thank you. That, that, that's useful to clarify your, um, your argument for me. Great, thanks. Thank you. Um, and I just wonder before we go into, uh, well, we'll hear now from the, thank you very much, Mr. Fulton. Um, Miss, oh, do yeah. we have one more question? Is there one from uh, Councillor Hawkins? Uh, not for Mr. Fulton, thank you. Uh, thank you. We, we, thank you very much, Mr. Fulton. We now have the applicant, uh, Mr. Kadu. Jerry, you said you would want to speak to this one. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jerry Kadu, I'm the applicant for this site. Um, this is the fifth application in respect of a traffic management plan for this site of two dwellings. The first application was made on the 18th of July 2019, some 20 months ago. The current traffic management plan has been produced as a result of extensive consultation with highways. We have already confirmed they have no objections to the proposal. It should be noted that in regards to the single plot to the rear of the proposed site, the planning inspector in considering the appeal for that site concluded the development would have no adverse effect on highway safety and that conditions relating to traffic management or road improvements were completely unjustified. I understand that the Parish Council have raised concerns in respect of highway safety <clears throat> and in response to those concerns, I have already met with the district councillor 
the parish council chair and the parish clerk at Pews Lane, and I have given them my personal assurance that I will continue to work with them before and during the construction phase in site to ensure that safeguarding users of Hughes Lane is our number one priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. Are there uh, um, any questions for Mr. Kadu? Not that I can see, Chair. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, so the late one is Councillor Bradnam. Sorry, I'm so slow off the mark. I do apologise. Um, so I just wanted to clarify <sighs> with Mr. Kadu, uh, through you, Chair, if I may, um, that I, I've slightly lost track and I just wanted to clarify, did Mr. Kadu agree with the approval of the Section 73 or is he disagreeing with it? Sorry, I don't really understand the question. <clears throat> My question is, um, we, we um, following the earlier endorsement at the previous meeting, the reason this application has come back is because there was a question about the Section 73 application. And I just wanted to clarify, we've been recommended in the report to approve that to continue to approve that section 73 application and I just wanted to clarify with you if you are content with that or not. Um, yes I'm content with it. Okay thank you. <coughs> thank you. No um, we don't have there. sorry. No one Thank you. We don't have any representation from the parish council um, nor from local members, so we'll move directly into the debate members over this. Do we have anybody who would like to speak? I think Councillor Toomey Hawkins has to speak. Yes, and she has Councilor a good Braden, so. Thank you. Can you take your camera off? Okay. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think this is back before us um, for the reason that has been explained, which is whether or not um, the uh, the application was publicised in the right way, which in is the right, public way. right of way with Section 73. Yeah. Exactly. And that was done. Yep, that was questioned and it's it was done. Yes, and it's been confirmed here. So, um, I don't see really what the problem is if we have the answer, because we considered this before. Um, we resolved to grant permission. The question raised has now been answered. Yes, it was advertised in the right way. So, I think that's our answer. And I would move that we um, <laughs> we go to the vote, Chair. So, um. There's a move to go to the vote. Is there anybody who would like to speak before we move to the vote? Yes, me please, Chairman. Yep, Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. And um, when Mr. Fulton said he basically was very disappointed and wanted an opportunity to speak and, and to engage with officers, I said, yes, don't we all? And I wasn't being disparaging. What I was meaning was that I think a lot of this could be avoided um this backwards and forwards thing and i think it is a question of um the two sides speaking to each other i do fear that we we are now uh, behaving with views consortium as though it, almost as though that they are the enemy um rather than actually accept that they've got every right to pull us up about things make comments about things explain where they believe things are wrong so um, I'm saying, Chairman, um, let's please talk um, to these people, please, officers. OK, um, it may it may have given you a lot of work and extra work, but actually that's your fault. Um, but let's start talking to Pugh Lane Consortium and we maybe won't be having uh, visits up to the High Court or planning meetings going on till half past six at night. 
Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. I think we hardly blame the meeting going on this long on to Fuse Day because we've only just come on to this one. Councillor Tim Hawkins, can you turn your camera off unless you want to speak again? Um, the the next two speakers are Councillors Bradham and Ripith. Councillor Bradham and, and Ripith, do you have you got something that will help us in terms of the, no, the vote? I, I just wanted to suggest that I think we should go to the vote. Yes, thank you. Happy to second. And Stephen Reid, um, will this help us within the voting? Yeah. No, it won't help you help you with the voting, but I just wanted to correct Mr. Fulton saying there's been no engagement uh, with the council. I'm I engage by email with Mr. Fulton, um, if not on a weekly basis, then certainly um, more than once a month. So there there is engagement. Thank but you. not face to face, maybe, Chairman. I, th I think we've also got challenges, haven't we? Um, Mr Fulton was talking about a Zoom meeting. Um, I was copied in on correspondence between Mr Fulton and Mr Kelly prior to uh, about this particular agenda item over the last week. Um, members, we're going to move to the vote and the recommendation on page 351 is the same as the recommendation that we had in front of us in the January committee, but we're coming to this afresh. Chris Carter, yes, sorry. Sorry, Chair. Um, I regret to interject, um, but it would appear that the two representations Mr Fulton has suggested were submitted have been submitted uh, and may not have been taken into account by officers, I'm afraid. Uh, on that basis, I would have to recommend that we do defer this item further uh, for those representations to be considered to see whether or not they do raise any additional points over and above those that have already be, been considered. I do oh apologise. Thank, thank you, Councillor Roberts. I think I think we all hope that, that there won't be both applicant members, committee and um, objector, that, that we don't sort of continue to meet um, errors like like this. So um, members, I'll put it to you that we defer on the basis of that advice from Chris Carter that by affirmation we vote to defer this application. Agreed. Um, I would be against Agreed. Agreed. Anybody? Yeah, can I? Agreed. I oppose. Wait a minute, does anybody not agree? Me? Against. against. So I've got, to, uh, I will now do a roll call. Sorry, I'll go and do a roll call. Chairman, do we not need to debate the motion of deferral? Yes. I thought I could do by affirmation, but obviously, yes. So we can um, debate that motion for deferral. Um, so I'm happy to move the motion for deferral. Is there anybody who would like to second that? I'll second it, Chairman. Thank you. Um, and now freedom to speak. I think I have Councillor Dr. Tuma Hawkins and Councillor Judith Ripper, perhaps that would like to speak to that. Uh, yes, please, Chair, um, if I may. Yeah. Um, I think what I, what I wanted to say was we can, can we not still resolve to grant this subject to a review of those um, comments? Uh, and if they didn't have any bearing, um, to grant the permission instead of coming back to committee. Can we Perhaps not do we can, that? We could put that to Chris Carter. I'm assuming that he's considered that before giving us that advice. Um, Chris, do you want to answer that? Chair, in, in the circumstances I haven't, but um, I think if the committee was so minded, uh, they could delegate authority to uh, the Director of Planning uh, to consider the additional representations and whether or not they raise any issues which have not already been considered in front of you. Um, I think that is something the committee could decide to do if it wished. OK, thank you. Thank you. I will move that then. Um, so what we'll do, I think we've got two motions. One is to defer, but one is um, the other motion is to not defer, but to go ahead with the vote um, and giving delegated authority that if it's the vote um, shows that this is approved, then there's delegated authority for the director of planning in consideration with, I assume, with chair and vice chair to make sure um, to verify whether or not 
those representations provide any changes that would need to be taken into account? And on, is that Chairman, correctly represented? Chairman. Chairman. Chairman, Wait I hate to interrupt, but I do get to, I seconded the motion. I do normally get to speak. Yes, yeah, so I'm just clarifying if that's the alternative motion, if that's OK, Heather. Um, Chairman, can I just suggest that we deal with one motion yes. at a time? No, no, I'm just trying thank to you. understand. Okay. So we, yes, that's thank fine. you. So before we vote on the one, I think it's understanding what the alternative is. But has that been correctly represented? Councilor yes, Chair. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So um, knowing that, let's hear now from the person, Councillor Williams, who is seconding the motion to defer. Thank you, Chairman. I, I think we need to take officers' advice on it. It is regrettable. No one regrets it more than more than I right now because you know we're all councillors. We've had a long day, and we we give up personal sacrifices actually to do this do this job so i think we're all equally frustrated that this is going to result in a deferral but if we were to do as has been suggested um we can look at that as an option but to make a decision and then potentially have it come back anyway and then actually whether it's influential or not whether it's material or not we are then delegating that to to officers and given the complexity of this of this case, you know, for, for whatever reason, um, I don't think that's fair. I think this has come to committee. Councillors, one way or another, have to decide on this. It's not right to, to put officers in that position, and they will then be doing making a delegated decision as to whether the new submission is material or not. I think it's frustrating. Um, you know. I'm going to miss my daughter's bedtime tonight. I cannot tell you how frustrating that is, but it is the right thing to do. And the right thing to do is to defer it because this isn't fair on anybody at all. Um, so I think in terms of fairness, uh, we and I'm the one who's moved it, but we have um, an, an error in not um, publishing the representations. And um, do we have other speakers to this motion? Uh, I think yeah. Councillor Wright and then Fane. And Roberts. Roberts. And if you really feel we need to speak or we just go to the vote, because I think we've got strong, the strong opinions on this and they could be shown through the vote. <laughs> but yes. No, Chairman, I'm, I'm You'd like asking. To speak. That's fine. Councillor Wright. Thank you. And I would urge the committee to defer this. Uh, uh, not to uh, do a delegated decision because I think this is one that should absolutely be done in the open and be transparent. So uh, let's defer it and get this sorted out and let it come back again. OK. Who do we and have next? Councillor Roberts. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. We, we have to be open about this. Um, We've made a little mistake again. Um, however, um, it's got to be shown to the public that when we do, we're big enough to put our hands up and say um, we need we need to uh, hold this back for a while. Um, we've got to get the public's confidence in us, not just Fuel Lanes Consortium, but the public's um, confidence in us as, as a planning authority. And we'll only do that by being open. The minute you start saying, oh, no, there's no need to do that tonight. When, you know, when officers have said in their professional opinion, we need to do it. And I, I don't want it going back to the high court again. Please, let's try to avoid any more aggravation with this. And I think a deferment is is a very sensible and I'm glad Good. the officers. Thank you. And, and as we know, so a material consideration isn't the threat of something going to the High Court, but I think um, we've heard the reasons there as to why this might go to deferral. So I'll now take it to the vote on this, this motion, which is whether or not it goes to deferral. The motion is that this is deferred. So it's for, against or abstain on that motion. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Against. Against. Councillor Anna Bradnam.
four. Councillor Martin Khan. Okay. Sorry. Against. Councillor Peter Fain. Against. Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Against. Councillor Judith Ripeth. Against. Councillor Deborah Roberts. For. Councillor Heather Williams. For. For, because you seconded it. Um, Councillor Richard Williams. For. Councillor Nick Wright. For. And myself, for. I presented the motion. So that's six. Um, five for deferral, so the that means that the item is deferred, which means, if I understand correctly, that we wouldn't move to the second motion because a decision has already been made for deferral. Is that correct? I'd agree with that. Yeah, that's all right. Yes, please, so, Chair. Thank Chair you, Chris. May I say, Chairman, with your permission, I just wanted to say that I wanted to... Um, point out that I think this committee is being the very fairest it can be and I object to people alleging that it's not being fair because I think we can are. I, I, thank you Councillor Brednam. I think we'll we'll do that through actions I think. Um, members we move to item number 13 Camborne, the proposed diversion of a public footpath, pages 373 in your agenda pack. And So this is um, to report on the proposed diversion of Camborne public footpath number seven in the parish of Camborne. Um, this is from James Stringer, the Asset Information Definitive Map Officer. Do we have Mr Stringer with us? Good evening. Hello James. How are you? Good, well done for staying on. <laughs> I haven't been here the whole time. Yeah, Whoa. I'd be unsurprised hey. here, but yes. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want us to run, run us through this? Yeah, I'll keep this very short. Um, an application has been received by Cambridge County Council acting on behalf of South Cambridgeshire District Council under Section 257 of the Town and Country Planning Act. Um, the application asks South Cambridgeshire as the local planning authority to make and confirm if unopposed a public path order to divert a public footpath to enable the delivery of the consented Camborne West Phase 1 strategic landscaping under permission S slash 41618 slash 19 slash RM. Um, a background and overview of the proposal is detailed in sections 1, 2 and 3 of the enclosed report on pages 373 in the agenda pack. Public footpaths recorded on the legal highway record known as the definitive map and statement can only be altered by legal order. Whilst the majority of those powers rest with the local highway authority, provision is made within the 1990 Town and Country Planning Act to alter the public highway in respect to footpaths, bridleways and restricted byways where the local planning authority is satisfied that it is necessary to do so to enable a consented development to be delivered. This is subject to the alternative route in the case of diversions being to an acceptable standard to the local highway authority or that there all being a clause within any public path order to allow for improvements to be made to an alternative highway. The full legislation can be found in section four of the report. Cambridgeshire County Council as local highway authority confirmed on the 16th of March that it was happy with the proposal and that it was in line with the its non-motorised user policy and rights of way improvement plan and that's detailed in section five of the report. Consultations were undertaken and no objections were received. The grounds for this diversion are detailed in sections seven and eight. The application before the committee relates solely to whether a public path order should be made and confirmed if unopposed to divert Camborne public footpath number seven. The application does not provide the committee with an opportunity to revisit the merits of the enabling permission. In this case, 
the reserve matters application for the phase one um, landscaping. My recommendation is set out in section 10, and that is that the diversion is necessary and that an order should be made. Thank you. Thank you for lovely <laughs> clarity. Um, any clarification questions there? No one's indicated, Chair. Um, thank you. And we don't have any speakers. Can I move um, to a vote on this, members? Agreed. 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 And the, the recommendation here, as has just expressed by James Stringer, is that we move to approve the proposed diversion of Camborne Public Footpath number seven. Can I take that by affirmation? Agreed. Yes. Agreed. 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 Anybody against? Any abstentions? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, agenda item 14 members is the enforcement report on page four and five. Do we have Alistair with us? Good evening. Hello, good evening. Surely not that time. <laughs> uh, I've got one small um, update um, mm -hmm. with regard to Elmwood House. Um, they have done some part work there partially complying with the notice, uh, so we'll look to see if we get any further work done. <laughs> um, I was also uh, looking to introduce you to uh, my replacement. This will be the last uh, committee that I'll be reporting to. Um, will Holloway, if you'd like to show your face. Yes, hello, good evening, everybody. We can't see your face. Can't see him. <laughs> uh, I'm showing on my camera. <laughs> it might just take a bit of time to before. While we're waiting for your face to appear, perhaps what we can do is also show our appreciation to Alistair for all you've done, Alistair. And what's it, you know, we know critical job and it's critical to um, the reputation and critical to making things fair for everybody who goes through the planning system in terms of enforcement. And thank you very much for everything that you've you've done for us. Well, thank you very much uh, for saying that, Chair. Um, yeah, yeah. You're you're the first and only part of the council to actually thank me. <laughs> but uh, if you have got any uh, inquiries, Will is your man. So. Um, he will be uh, dealing with everything in future and I'll be resuming my role as uh, a senior enforcement officer. Thank you. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, happy to try and answer them. Um, we still haven't got a face for you, Will, but I'm sure that we can put a face to the name in future meetings. Yeah, yes, definitely. Sorry, Chair, I keep coming in and coming back out of my camera. Um, I'm still not sure for some reason. Okay, no, OK, thank you um, for that. And then Agenda item 15, which are appeals oh, against planning. Sorry. I think oh, we, we have request speech. Yeah, there are some speakers, Chair. Um, three, in fact, starting with Councillor Ripper. Yeah. Um, thank you, Alistair. I've just got one question before you go. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask about Fen Road and Milton and the enforcement of that field with, um, I know Tony Wallace has been working on this, um, with getting it um, not looking like a motocross track anymore. You still there, Alistair? I think you should be saying Will. <laughs> yeah, Will. <laughs> Sorry, Alistair, yes, if you want to reply. I, I think, Alistair's camera looked as if it had frozen. Yeah, oh, sorry, I, I didn't. Um, Did you not hear it? I didn't hear your question. Oh, my question was about Fen Road in Milton and the field there, which is still looking like a motocross track. I know that Tony Wallace has been working hard on this. Um, just wondered if there were an update. I'm sorry, I'm just going to tell my husband to shut that door because it's quite noisy. No, Tony. No, Tony's still uh, uh, consulting with uh, the owner uh, to try and get a result on this, um, and we've had no instruction to proceed to prosecution at this stage. 
Okay, any sort of time span in your mind? Difficult to say. I, I, I can't say. All, uh, I mean, at the moment, it's not being used. So the, uh, the noise problem, which was the main issue, mm. is no longer with us. I suppose we're concerned about, you know, will there be a 2021 season? Well, if that happens, yeah. then I'm sure we will move straight to prosecution. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Heather Williams is next. Thank you. Through yourself, Chairman, um, just to echo the thanks to Alistair for all he's done and the reports he's given to us. Um, it's always been a, a welcome end to our meetings when we see your face pop up. We, we know the end is near of the meeting um, and welcome to Will and you've got very big but very big boots to fill um, and uh, there are a few applications that Councillor Wright will need you to um, get up to speed on. I'm sure Alistair will help you with that. He does have his favourite application. Um, but thank you, Alistair, from all of us. Thank you very much, Councillor Williams. I do appreciate it. It's not been easy. It's been a difficult time for everybody with the pandemic and losing a, a valued member of staff very suddenly and a personal friend was very difficult. We do understand that, Alistair, and thank you very much for stepping up. And we have a question from Councillor Bradnam as well. Thank you. I, I wanted to express my thanks to Alistair as well, because as he said, it's not been an easy year uh, in all sorts of ways. And I think we're very glad that you'll be carrying on as a senior uh, and, and that your experience will be with us as we go forward because what one thing we do know about enforcement is that you need a long memory <laughs> and uh, of sites so I'm, I'm very glad that you're staying with us Alistair and thank you for everything you've done. Thank you very much Councillor. Yeah, yeah. And Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you Chair, just to say a um, big thank you to Alistair for stepping up. Um, as you say, not been easy, and I know what it's been like <laughs> um, behind the scenes. So, big thanks, and you're still here with us. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And as you say, I think just makes us reflect. We started this morning with reflection um, on the death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip. I think you've also made us reflect on just ordinary people and this pandemic and the year and the people that we've lost, who are very valued. Um, and we may not have a moment's reflection, but they do. We do think of them. So thank you very much for that. Um, we move on to agenda item 15, which are about appeals against planning decisions. Um, Chris. Thank you, Chair. I, I'm not going to update on any specific cases. You'll be pleased to hear uh, one matter just to inform the committee of. Uh, you'll recall uh, a decision on Strawberry Farm, Little Abington some months ago. Uh, the committee resolved to grant permission subject to uh, a number of conditions. Uh, you'll also uh, be aware that uh, that permission was issued in error without those conditions. Um, it, it, it has now been quashed by the High Court and will be reissued with the same conditions agreed by the committee very shortly. I just wanted to inform the committee of that. Oh, so that's a very different one. So it's actually, you know, it's enabled it to come back with the conditions. So that's, that's good. Any questions for Chris? No one's shown, Chair. And I declare at 6.53. I, I did have a question. It's, I don't know if it's uploaded oh, to the chat. Yeah, <laughs> Councillor Heather Williams has come in with a late one. It, it wasn't. I think it was a bit of a delay, my fair, to be fair. Um, it was just around page 429. Um, have we had chance, have, do we know, Yvonne, the two applications in Salston that we've had any new evidence submitted or have we had chance to look at that yet? As we've now got dates, which I'm pleased to see we've finally got dates. Thank you, uh, Councillor Williams, through you, Chair. Um, I understand the, the dates may be subject to change. Uh, obviously, the Council has recently published its uh, new um, housing uh, deliveries statement, I think it's called, uh, which obviously sets out the, the five year supply situation. The applicant uh, should be given an opportunity to respond to that, given it's the most update position, updated position. Um, I understand that uh, they're in the process of doing that at the moment. So once we receive that, obviously it will be a public document as part of the appeal proceedings. 
Um, and that may mean that the date of the hearing is changed. That's being discussed with the inspectorate at the moment. I was Thank so grateful when I saw a date. <laughs> Everything's movable. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. Um, I think we heard a, a building being described as monolithic. I think this meeting was rather monolithic. Um, thank you for all for your patience and for sticking with it. And thank you yeah, for the decisions taken. And if I may, Chair, thank you for your chairing. Um, you got us through this <laughs> with a lot of patience. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to all the officers as well. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Chairman. Liam, can you confirm that the feed is cut? Hi there.